Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark. And like the devil, we went down to Georgia this week and also to Alabama uh, because the primaries are coming up. And we think those races are going to tell us at least a little something about where the Republican Party is headed. So Trump has endorsed David Perdue for governor, who looks like he is on track to lose. And his Senate candidate in Alabama, Mo Brooks, was polling so badly that Trump unendorsed him. And some use cases like this to argue that Trump is losing his grip on the GOP. This is a sort of piece of conventional wisdom that I rail against, that I am totally skeptical of. I had a piece uh, in the New York Times a couple weeks ago arguing there is no moving past Trump right now. And the reason that I think that is because of all of these focus groups, because I listen to these voters. And look, these voters, they want their party to be Trumpy. And our regularly scheduled guest had to cancel. It was somebody with whom I could really have this fight. But since he is not going to be here, the Bulwark family is stepping up. My buddy Tim Miller is joining me. Unfortunately, I think Tim and I are going to be a little bit more on the same page about where the GOP is headed. Uh, But that's okay. Tim, thanks for being here, bud. I am so happy to be with you. Should I do like my AEI voice where I pretend like the party is ready to move on from Trump? Or should I just be myself? (laughs) You know, I think you should be yourself. But I mean, you know, these focus groups, Georgia and Alabama, Trump voters, broadly speaking, these are not a group of voters that sound eager to move beyond Trump, even if they're not all for his preferred candidates. And I think this is just generally, this is a thing I think pundits are getting wrong. It's like a weird thing where they're like, okay, they got this magnifying glass out and they're looking at every single one of Trump's endorsements and they're saying, oh, well, if he endorses David Perdue and Brian Kemp wins, clearly Donald Trump is losing his grip on the Republican Party. And I just think that's the most asinine thing in the world. Like, well, first of all, that's one race out of, you know, Trump's endorsed, like, I don't know, 200 people or something. Um, So he's going to get a lot of wins on the board doing that. But like these candidates, they're just Trumpy as far as the eye can see. Um, Even when he doesn't endorse the candidates, the candidates still endorse him, even somebody like Brian Kemp. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, look, the focus group voters, I think, are very revealing. But just the candidates' behavior should be enough to demonstrate where this party really is. You know, So even if you are sitting cloistered in your K Street bubble, you should just be able to watch the ads that these candidates are running and know that there is no moving on from Trump. I, you know, we're going to get into this Alabama Senate primary, uh, you know, where Trump unendorsed Mo Brooks, who, despite speaking at the insurrection, was, I guess, not quite fervent enough for Trump's taste and his insurrectionism. And even these like supposedly normal, more mainstream candidates, uh, Katie Britt, who worked for Richard Shelby, they are going on Steve Bannon's podcast and running ads talking about how the election was stolen and how we need a forensic audit of you know, an election that Trump won in Alabama by a, a million points. <laughs> uh, the governor, the sweet old governor, Kay Ivey, in Alabama was so worried about a primary from her right that she cut an ad talking about how the Democrats stole the election from Donald Trump. So overall, you just listen to the candidates themselves speak, and you can see how much of a hold Trump has on all these people that they all have to kind of continue to live in this fantasy world where where almost everyone to a person knows better, knows that the election was not fraudulent, but they are still going along with the sham because they know that Donald Trump controls the party. And then when you try to figure out, well, why are they doing that? Well, these focus groups are the answer to that question. That's because that's what the voters want them to do. 100%. You know, one of the great things about having you on is you won't pull any punches about this, but like what I can tell is happening. I get these calls from reporters all the time. And they always want to create this tension between the establishment wing and the Trump wing, right? As though the establishment wing is really pushing back. And that's why every story, it's like unnamed Republicans secretly pushing back. Is this just like a Josh Holmes, uh, former chief of staff to Mitch McConnell? Like, does he just like concoct this with the background of the media? Like, no, we're going to win. And they're like clearly hanging their hat on this, this opportunity for Kemp to win. But like listening to these voters, it's just like, it's an embarrassing analysis as far as I'm concerned to suggest that Donald Trump hasn't dragged the entire party significantly in his direction. 
it's a psychodrama inside the Republican beltway of all of the privately concerned Republicans who are legion and have been legion for five years now who still want to be able to go to their country club and not feel like they are racist conspiracists. So they concoct this uh, story in their head. I get into the psychology of these Republicans in my new book, Why We Did It, coming out in June. <laughs> go pre-order it on, you know, whatever, Amazon, Politics and Pros, if you don't like Jeff Bezos. But the short of it is this, right? In order to kind of justify their actions, none of these Republicans in Washington, none of these consultants, you know, Jeff Rowe, who worked for Ted Cruz and Glenn Youngkin, or all of these big Republican ad consultants, Brad Todd, who wrote the book with Selena Zito, Josh Holmes, who you mentioned, who's Mitch McConnell's guy. All of these guys know all these reporters and talk to them. All of the the reporters know that they know that there wasn't an election fraud because they're election and campaign experts. So they need to have a story that they can tell reporters so they can go to happy hours and lunch with them in good conscience. And the story that they tell is that there are people like David McCormick in Pennsylvania and Britt in Alabama and like Brian Kemp who are talking about the drive through ballots. You know, this is election fraud light, right? That there were some rules that were broken and they try to do this dance where they don't have to go along with the crazy crack in QAnon stuff and they have to demonstrate that there are candidates that are reasonable and that that they can still do what they're doing in good conscience without going full election fraud mania, but it's all nonsense. And you can just look at it based on the evidence of how the even normal Republicans, with a few exceptions, but everyone else, if you look at these Senate races, is going along with the big lie to varying degrees. And this imaginary establishment mega fight like, only exists in the heads of these consultants and these reporters in D.C. who need to kind of create a narrative that makes themselves comfortable to sleep at night. Well, speaking of strange bedfellows, one of the things that uh, I'm going to play some sound here, you know, so we're going deep with these voters and asking them how they feel about the Republican Party. (laughs) And like, I got to say, it does give me some weird joy to hear them talk about how much they hate the establishment in the Republican Party, which is replete through all of these groups. But if there is one phrase that I had to say gets said over and over again in focus groups, it is lesser of two evils. So let's listen. I don't feel like the Republican Party is much better than the Democrats, whereas the Democrats, to me, are, I feel like they're pure evil. I mean, just the stuff that they're pushing. But then on the other side, I don't know if there's any of them that have the you-know-what's enough to stand up to them. There's a couple of them. There's DeSantis. There's Cruz. There's a couple of them that I think can stand up to them and do what's right. But the rest of them, I think they're all so darn establishment and they've been around so darn long, you know, that we're not much better off with them than we are with the Democrats. She said it pretty well. Um, You know, she feels that the Democratic Party is pure evil. And there is so much special interest and agenda things that occur in the Democratic Party that I just absolutely cannot get on board with and never will. I became a Democrat and I just now, oh, I don't know what happened. You know, it's the complete opposite. They are the people that I I can't stand now. They remind me of my family and (laughs) that they just want to run everybody over. And if you're not them, you you can just move, just go away. You might as well not even exist. Okay, so these are answers in response to us being like, is there something you like about Republicans or is it just that you dislike Democrats? And it was like a strong negative partisanship answer, right? It was because Democrats are evil, but the Republicans also suck, but they just like suck a little less. It's negative partisanship all the way down. Negative I mean, partisanship you know, all the way it's down. like Democrats remind me of my niece with the blue hair and the nose ring. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Uh, You know, this is where sometimes listening to these focus groups can get you down because it's like, what planet are these people living on? Like, there's no difference between the two parties. There's never been a more ideologically sorted two parties in American history than the two parties right now. You know, they they don't think the Republicans are fighting enough. One of the candidates in the Senate race, Mo Brooks, like literally tried to steal the election from Joe Biden and like spurred on a mob to storm the Capitol. I mean, what more do you people want? And I think that the, using DeSantis as the example and using Cruz as the example really demonstrates what they want, which is just lib owning, right? Like that is what these people are looking for. 
there is not, with a specific exception of COVID, there is not actual policies that they want. Like they want a, particularly in these Senate races, they want somebody that is going to make them feel good by shit posting about the libs. And that is what they liked about Donald Trump. And it's a revealed preference when you listen to these focus groups. And, you know, this like imaginary establishment uh, boogeyman on the Republican side, like just doesn't exist. It's a, it's a complete figment of Steve Bannon's podcast and Tucker Carlson's show, you know, that they have to like create this imaginary enemy in the establishment when the establishment is part and parcel with MAGA. I mean, Ron DeSantis consultant is Phil Cox, who's like the biggest establishment consultant in the world. And like, there's no difference between Donald Trump really and the so-called establishment anymore. But that fiction has to be maintained, you know, in conservative media to keep these folks angry. And that's why they want more and more angry, more and more performative candidates. And that's why those are the ones that they're aligning with in these primaries. Yeah, that's right. And also, Donald Trump has been telling them, like, Donald Trump runs against the Republican Party, right? He ran as the outsider. And like, that is still very much with them. And it's interesting, you know, when you say um, the thing about the policies, Democrats in the focus groups talk about policies a lot. Republicans almost never talk about policies. They talk about values. And so when they talk about Democrats and they say evil, right, it's because they have bad values. And sometimes people will be like, well, I like Trump's policies. And I'll be like, what policies? And they'll be like, America first. And that's not really like, it's not a coherent set of policies. Uh, And you say something that I I repeat now because I think it's a really good way of talking about people, which is it's all vibe. America first is a vibe. They're on board with it. The lib owning is a is a vibe. And it's because they think they're bad people who have bad values, who want to do weird stuff. And they hate them. Yeah. You know, they bring up DeSantis specifically because it's the vibes, right? I mean, like, there's nothing that DeSantis is doing that is actively different than what the median Republican in the House or the Senate would do, right? DeSantis is of that world, but he he has just been able to, with an assist from the media and from the fact that Trump hasn't started attacking him yet, you know, been able to project a more aggressive anti-Democrat, anti-elite posture that resonates with these folks. There's a connection there with what they're looking for. I mean, people bring up DeSantis all the time in the Trump focus groups. Words that come up all the time are like weak and strong, right? Like rhinos are weak. Trump was strong. DeSantis is strong. You know, somebody just said that, you know, we want them to have the you know what's. They want the balls. They crave the combative style. And it, what he's doing is things like attacking Disney and things that are are sort of performative that make the media hate him. And so he's got all the right enemies. And so it looks like he's fighting. And that's what they want. They want the strength. They want the fight. So let's go to this second, just because I brought up the word rhino. Uh, Word rhino comes up a lot in these groups when you push these Trump voters on what they think about the Republican Party. And let's listen to what they said. My feeling is there's no real Republicans anymore. There's no Reagan Republicans like there used to be. They're all rhinos, you know. Uh, none of them have the backbone to do what's right for this country. They talk one thing and then they'll vote the opposite way. I think that, like I said, we have a uniparty in Washington. There are a few that are fighting for us, but it's not the majority. They're supporting a lot of the Democrat agenda and bills, and they're really not stepping up and fighting against it. Marjorie Taylor Green, I think, is a little over the top. I do think she has got our best interests at heart, just like Matt Gates from Florida. But I think they can be a little over the top. But, you know, is that really a bad thing? There's so many representatives and senators now I can't that I don't even know. You don't hear from them. I mean, I cannot name probably over 30 because I think they just show up and vote and that's it. I know a lot of people want to criticize her for being outspoken and whatever, but I mean, she goes against the grain. She's not politically correct. She's not smooth with her delivery. I don't care. Again, I'm tired of being lied to. Okay, so I just have to say this this last two comments about Marjorie Taylor Greene was in response to a question that we were asking, which was, is there anybody in the Republican Party that you think is kind of extreme? And mostly the answers were Mitt Romney. <laughs> Like, (laughs) Mitch McConnell and Mitt Romney were too extreme for them. But this woman did start to be like, she was like, well, maybe Marjorie Taylor Greene. Sometimes she says things that are a little crazy. But then she, like, completely talks herself out of it. Like, you know, then she's like, but actually, it's great. 
I love that line of what do they do? Just show up and vote. That's it. I don't oh know God. what it's that is their job in Washington actually is to like vote on legislation. But the point, and this is goes to the question of like, what do voters want? It's like, oh no, I want the people who are yelling and screaming. I want Matt Gates. I want Marjorie yeah. Taylor Greene. I want the people who are acting like crazy people. Yeah, this was the most interesting thing for me. So in that last batch, you know, I mentioned about how the two parties are are not even close to it each other and how the voter and the first focus group that that was voter in Alabama who said that you know the parties are basically the same as far as I'm concerned and then in this last match someone in Georgia says the same thing we have a uniparty in Washington so like this completely false notion that the parties are indistinguishable that was like maybe a fair criticism in 1996 and isn't like true at all is so pervasive that, that different voters volunteered it in different states and different focus groups. She, she goes on to say they're supporting a lot of the Democratic agenda and bills. What are you talking about? The Republicans have supported nothing. They supported the infrastructure bill. That's it. One thing. Something that Donald Trump wanted. But they have to maintain this fiction in the Trump world and in the MAGA media and in the conservative media to keep these folks riled up. And that's why they like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Ted Cruz and Ron DeSantis and Matt Gates, because all they see from those folks are the performative anti-democratic attacks. That's what they want. They don't want somebody who just goes there and votes party line with Republicans. That's not what they want. They specifically say, we don't want that. I guess they just show up and vote. That's it. So a person could represent them who all they do is go to work every day, do their job, vote conservative down the line. They're not interested in that. They want the performative stuff. Yeah. And one of the things I keep trying to explain to reporters is like, you listen to the voters and it is so clear how much they crave the performative side, how much they crave the combative side. And that is what people like Marjorie Taylor Greene honestly figured out. And it's what Trump figured out, that people want this. They want the performance. They're there for it. And I can see the lens through which Democrats and the media look at Marjorie Taylor Greene and think, well, clearly everyone thinks she's insane. <laughs> like, this is a crazy person. And I'm like, they do not think she's insane. Like, they might think she's a little bit outspoken or whatever, but she is familiar to them. And she is speaking for them. She is representative of the voters in her district. Like, that is just a fact. The media criticizing them is evidence that the person actually does represent their values, right? Because they've been so conditioned now to believe that the media is evil and that the media is the enemy, that the best thing that ever happened to Ron DeSantis was the media attacking him, right? And so when they say like, oh, this person just shows up and votes, what they're saying is, I don't actually believe that you're fighting for me if the media isn't attacking you and me the media isn't calling you extreme or insane because they're the enemy and we need to be fighting with that and that's your job. There's like this perverse anti-incentive, right? Where, you know, the New York Times does a big investigative piece. That's the best evidence that they're good yeah. in the minds of these voters. Speaking of people who are outside the normal channels of politics, uh, Herschel Walker, who you've written about in the Georgia Senate race, he's this beloved figure. He was a University of Georgia football star, which everybody knows. Walker got Trump's endorsement. Um, one of my favorite comments, this wasn't in this group, but it was in a previous Georgia group where I had sort of been like, okay, this aged football player, like this is your best play. This seems ridiculous. And then I did a focus group with Georgia voters and I was asking them about Herschel Walker and not only did they love him, but when I brought up the fact that he had played Russian roulette with himself, that this is yeah. like a thing he'd said he'd done with loaded bullets. They were like, well, guess Herschel keeps winning. It just like, it was so illustrative to me. You know, and there was a period of time where it looked like Mitch McConnell wasn't going to endorse him and that they were going to try to field somebody to beat him. That was when I realized that was wishful thinking. I mean, listen to how these voters talk about Herschel. I think where I feel the problem lies is you have these rhinos who have been in office for so long, they've already been bought out. And that's why I'm for the candidate who has a, never run for office before, like Herschel Walker. Because again, they're tr they have a desire to really want to help and make changes. Um, and that's one reason why I voted for Trump, because I, I'm tired of the slick talking, you know, I'm just going to tell you what you want to hear kind of rhetoric. Did Trump say stuff? Absolutely. Did I care? Not really. I mean, I'd rather have it straight and honest than sit there and somebody lied straight to my face. Somebody different like Herschel, I saw his name the other day and I thought, oh yeah, my gosh, he's running. You know, am I going to vote for him? I need to really research him. 
if it were between Herschel Walker and Mitch McConnell, I'd probably vote for Herschel Walker. So for me, Herschel Walker is actually a pretty decent pick because he's got the name. A name carries votes no matter what. It will always carry votes. But not to bring this into conversation, but he's also African-American. And I think if I think of Warnock, um, when he ran, you know, I think a lot of the vote went to him. And I think with Herschel Walker, he can pull some of them. I think that makes him a very interesting candidate for November, to be honest. Before we even get into what what we think, we brought up the Russian roulette, the spousal abuse, and listen <laughs> listen to how they receive that. That wouldn't sway me one way or another. I think there's always going to be a list of things I have to review. I, I trust my mom's research a lot. So from what I've heard, he would do some great things and he's backed by Trump and, and so on and so on. How do we know how many people in Washington, in Congress, in Senate, in, dare I say, the presidential seat, don't have some form of mental illness? They dug really deep to try and find something to (laughs) smear her with, and that's the only thing they came up with. My understanding is that he has a very good character, that he is a patriot, he is for our Constitution, and heard good things about him. So well, that's the only thing you came up with, Sarah. You know, he just menaced his wife with a gun and has multiple personality disorder and has advanced all kinds of conspiracy theories that are not true. And, you know, little little minor spousal abuse. That's all. That's it. That's all you came up with. I don't think anybody had to dig. It's like he tells you in his book. I think he did most <laughs> of the oppo for people. But this is actually, I got to say, a place where I will kind of admit the low cunning sort of lizard brain genius of Trump. This thing with the celebrities, it befuddles normal political prognosticators like me who has a really good sense of politics but doesn't know that much about why this Georgia football player would be qualified for sainthood in Georgia. Like I would listen to him talk and say, well, this person's not qualified for the Senate. Uh, And then you listen to a bunch of Georgia voters and they tell you why he is uh, just a miracle to them. And so Trump's idea of sort of these celebrities that already have sort of a built-in reason for support, which was obviously something that Trump had, that, you know, this was one of the things that I just could not see in 2016. I'd never watched his dumb show, but everybody else had. And in the focus groups, when I started doing them, it was the first thing. Why'd you vote for Trump? Oh, he's a great businessman. I loved his show because he like, you know, he fired Gilbert Gottfried in the boardroom, you know, and so he was, uh, he was a decider. Yeah, he's a very decisive businessman. And Herschel's the same way. They don't care about all this other stuff. No, they don't. So I, when I wrote the Herschel Walker article that kind of ran through all these conspiracies and how uh, he had gone along with the voter election fraud and been very a big supporter of the Stop the Steal stuff and then all of his personal life issues with his wife, his first wife, it was March 2021. I wrote it very early because there's a lot of buzz about Walker running. And so at that time, they were still not quite sure about like where things were going to go on this whole stop the steal thing. And that, I think that's why it's just important to circle back to how complicit the so-called Republican establishment that all these people hate are with the MAGA establishment. Because there was a moment where they were kind of acting like they were going to fight it and confront it. And, and I think that they were unsure and sort of waiting to see how, how things played out. And two things happened. One, the voters were completely with Trump and that they were going to be with people like Herschel Walker and that they did not care about his conspiracy mongering or that he was part of the insurrection. They kind of liked it, obviously, because of his, you know, celebrity, don't care about the issues in his personal life. And so, you know, McConnell starts to think, okay, well, that's where the voters are going to go. Why fight it? And then you have all these other kind of candidates come up. You got Greitens and Mastriano and Barnett. And, you know, you can just go all the way down the line of all these extreme, insane Republicans with skeletons in their closet. And if you're Mitch McConnell, you're going, it's like whack-a-mole. Like, I can't take on this fight. Like, Herschel Walker is like middle of the bell curve, right? When I, when I wrote that in March, everybody's like, wow, the Republicans might have a crazy nominee in Georgia. That would be pretty out there. But Herschel Walker is just smack dab in the middle of all the the nominees that Republicans are going to have in these states. So they had no choice but to go along with it. So, I I mean, I think that is all, you know, emblematic of this bottom up desire that the voters want this and the cowards in Washington and the Republican so-called establishment, like aren't going to do anything to push back on it anymore. Yeah. So the number one data point that people who find us annoying because we won't buy into 
there's this fight going on narrative. And we're like, no, the whole thing's Trumpy. Everybody's Trump. And I don't know what you're talking about. The one thing they really hang their hat on is this governor's race in Georgia, right? So we've got Brian Kemp, who is the incumbent. And then we've got David Perdue, who you will remember lost in the runoff. Trump is mad at Brian Kemp because Brian Kemp, like terrible person he is, he certified the election for Joe Biden. That was his big sin. And so Trump resurrects David Perdue and says, I assume, go run for governor and I'll back you. And uh, you run on a stop the steal platform. You just say the election was stolen and Kemp didn't do enough for me. And that's going to get you over the edge. And then that's just not happening. Like all the polling shows Purdue is cratering. Kemp is doing just fine. And our focus groups kind of back this up. Let's listen to them talk about why they like Kemp. I like what Brian Kemp has done. I liked how he handled COVID. The state seems to be running smoothly to me. Um, Yeah, we've got issues big time, but we've got crime and different things like everybody else. I'm just not sure yet. I'm kind of tossed up. I like that Trump has endorsed Purdue. But then again, the fact that Kemp is way ahead in the polls, even though he doesn't have Donald Trump's endorsement, tells you something, I guess. And just remember the last election. I'm David Purdue and I approve this message. Like, that's all I hear in my head. (laughs) But for Kim, I haven't been displeased. You know, he got my children back in school. He opened up the state, first state to open during the whole COVID stuff. So right now I'm leaning towards Kemp. But, you know, hearing that Trump is behind Purdue makes me want to do more research. Yeah, I don't know anything about Purdue. My mom is, again, she does a lot of research. And I don't know if it's just because of the Trump endorsement. Because I personally agree with everyone with Kemp. I 100%. I'm supportive of how he handled COVID. I traveled a lot during COVID and it was insane to see how I felt like I was in other countries compared to Georgia. So just having that firsthand approach, I was very pleased with the way he handled COVID. So there's a couple people in this group that are leading Purdue that do care about Trump's endorsement. But for the most part, like what is happening here is that Kemp is fine. They think he did a good job on COVID. I've had other groups where people talk about, yeah, Kemp certified the election, but he also passed that election integrity bill. And so they're just fine with Kemp. And I think what people miss when they talk about Trump's endorsement is if you ask, does Trump's endorsement matter? The answer is, of course it matters. Then the question is like, can Trump's endorsement overcome absolutely any political reality? And the answer is no. No, it can't overcome absolutely every political reality. Trump isn't magic. Got it. (laughs) But that doesn't like change whether or not he overall holds sway on the Republican Party and whether he's pushing them in his direction. So here's the thing. To your point about how he can't overcome any political reality, the Trump endorsement matters a lot in a vacuum. There is a difference, particularly in governor's races, specifically when it comes to people who are known quantities. Like people do know their governor and it is a little different than these Senate races, which are all about the vibes as we were talking about earlier. And governors have actual responsibilities. And while Republican voters don't really care that much about policies, as we've discussed, you know, the one big one recently that was a policy slash culture war issue was COVID. And so you heard these voters in the Georgia focus group repeatedly mention COVID. Kemp, like DeSantis to less national fanfare, opened up early, got people back in schools, you know, wasn't a big masker, right? Like that is what, you know, Republican voters wanted because it was tied into this culture war. In addition to that, again, policies isn't the top of thing, but look, I pulled up this from Eric Erickson, you know, who lives in Georgia and has a talk radio show there. So has a good feeling about what is happening in the state. He, uh, he points out that during the last year, Kemp signed tax cuts into law, signed permitless gun carry for the Second Amendment crowd, transgender sports regulations, um, mask mandate bans in schools, right? Like all of these culture war issues that combine with vaguely with policy, Kemp jumped on all of them and people saw that. Where a Senate race is far away and, you know, like you hear from the Telegus Group voters, what are they doing besides voting? I don't. What has the Senate done the past two years? Governors had an actual ability to tie into the culture war in a way that impacts people's lives. Kemp did that. And then finally, he passed the 
so-called election integrity bill and got this big boost going back to my earlier point when the media all attacked him and called him racist and said it was Jim Crow, right? So this Georgia race you know, is not a repudiation of Trump. It is evidence that, you know, if you are a Republican governor and you tap in to these culture war issues that Trump taps into, voters are going to respond to that. And so uh, to me, that is what is happening. And David Perdue also is a total phony. Like, nobody believes that he's really MAGA, right? Like, you can imagine a different race, right, in a state where a Kathy Barnett type, like, super authentic MAGA is running against a Republican governor who got a little squishy on COVID and Trump endorses the authentic MAGA. You can imagine that playing out a lot differently than what happened here in Georgia. I think that this is really just more evidence of Kemp being an astute politician, you know, who's able to ride these culture war waves than it says, you know, anything about Trump. Yeah, I mean, it's not like this guy's an anti-Trump candidate. Right. Like this is this is where I like can't understand the analysis. I think that what Brad Raffensperger did in Georgia in 2020 was extremely important. And the Secretary of State race, you know, Trump did the same thing that he's doing to Kemp, where he sort of reached down and he grabbed a congressman, Jody Heiss and said, go run against him because he wouldn't find me my 11,000 votes, which Jody Heiss dutifully did. But Jody Heiss has also kind of struggled. And Raffensperger got big national profile for a secretary of state. And he, you know, he released the tapes of Trump trying to shake him down for those votes. And so I sort of thought Raffensperger was that there was just no way he could win. When you asked, what do you think of Jody Heiss? Everyone was like, I don't know who she is. Like everybody <laughs> uh, just like assumed it was a woman. And there were a couple people who were still holding it against Brad and maybe would just vote for the other person who's not Brad. But there's been public polling that has shown that Raffensperger is a little bit ahead of Heist and that then there's this big chunk of undecided. And I was just interested if you think, despite everything, I mean, I thought Raffensperger was toast, but, but because Trump has stayed out of the state, he hasn't been reminding people relentlessly about who Brad Raffensperger is and what he did. And so do you think that Raffensperger has a shot? Yeah. I mean, Kemp has provided a lot of cover, I think, as well for Raffensperger, right? Yeah. Could have imagined a different situation, right, where Raffensperger gets totally demonized by, you know, a governor of the state. So as much as I'm not a Brian Kemp fan, credit to him on that front. I still sort of suspect that it breaks late for Heiss. I think this is a really important election, though. I hope not. Again, I think that Georgia is a special situation, both because of just the effective in the minds of Republican voters, conservative governance that Kemp has overseen in the state. But then in addition to that, it's not like, you know, some of these other states, you know, as far as just the electorate makeup, like the Atlanta sprawl plays such a big role in the state that there still is a good percentage in Georgia of these sort of older, you know, more traditional kind of business oriented upper middle class Republican types. And they have stuck with Kemp and Raffensperger. I I think that would be a lot tougher to do if we move over when we get to the Alabama primary next, right? Like Georgia is in Alabama. So I I think that he has a chance um, for those reasons, a a, a kind of a a unique set of circumstances in Georgia is working out in his favor. But boy, I don't know, a lot of undecideds. And you just think of that this focus group, the people who thought Jody Heiss was a woman, presuming they're learning about it before they turn out, you would think that there would be a break for Heiss um, among the undecideds uh, in a close race. Hope not, but but that's where my instinct is. Yeah. I'm giving Raffensperger maybe a, a one in four Yeah, shot. that sounds right. Punch your chance. Betting markets have him at 40%, though, which is very high for him. Way better than I thought he'd be doing. So one of our few pro-democracy candidates still out there running. All right, but let's talk about Alabama um, because the Alabama Senate race is pretty interesting, too. As we were talking about, Mo Brooks started the race with Trump's endorsement and a, and a pretty big lead. He'd spoken at the January 6th rally just before the attack on the Capitol. I quote it sometimes because he stood there and he said, today is the day American patriots start kicking ass. But he just like tanked in the polls over the last year. And then Trump unendorsed him. But it wasn't because he got too woke about anything, although that was the claim. It was because he was running third behind the other two candidates, Katie Britt and Mike Durant. It, one of the sad things for old Mo was that the word was coming to him that Trump was going to unendorse him and he was trying to hang on. This is the ad that he put up on TV. America does not need any more weakling, cowering, wimpy Republican congressmen and senators. On January 6th, I proudly stood with President Trump in the fight against voter fraud. 
I'm running for the Senate because I'm tired of debt junkie, weak need, open border rhinos who sell out our conservative values. That's why Mitch McConnell opposes me and supports KD Britt. I'm Mo Brooks, and you better believe I approve this message. Well, that ad failed to save him, and Trump went ahead, unendorsed him. And actually, let's listen to what the group had to say about Brooks getting unendorsed. That makes me think that that might be personal and not political. I will definitely look into why. I like when he endorses someone, but his endorsing and unendorsing does not have much weight with me because he has done that so much. It's part of his wishy-washy kind of personality. You know, when you did something that really pissed me off, I'm going to take away my endorsement, you know? Yeah. Um, Mr. Trump endorses winners. He likes to endorse the person he feels like is going to win the race. When the polls came out that Mike Durant was in the lead, that's when he pulled his endorsement of Mo Brooks. There's going to be a runoff, I'm sure. But Mr. Trump pulled his endorsement because he was afraid that he was going to pick a loser. And can I just say, in this group, it was the most people saying nice things about Mo Brooks that I've ever heard. They actually were kind of favorable to him. And I guess that was surprising because he's been tanking so badly. They all thought that Mo Brooks was a true conservative who'd done a good job as a congressman. And they liked him just fine. Yeah, again, this is uh, different from Kemp because it's not actual results uh, in the governor's office. But Brooks has been doing what these people want, right? As far as attacking the left, doing the performative Fox stuff, going along with the stop the steal. So, you know, he had some existing, you know, well of credibility with certain people in the Alabama electorate. So that isn't that surprising to me that the groups weren't totally, you know, going to flip on him just because Trump did. Yeah, groups are funny. Just just like this one where all the polls show that Brooks is is falling behind, but the group is still feels warmly toward him. That was similar in Ohio where the person they were most warm about was Jane Timken. <laughs> that was the person that they liked and she came in dead last. So I think that might be happening here too, where he's got some goodwill, but for whatever reason, voters just aren't into it right now. And so as soon as Trump unendorsed Mo Brooks, there's this guy, Mike Durant, who was the one who was running in the front. And he's a former pilot whose experiences were the subject of the movie Black Hawk Down. And I had heard kind of behind the scenes, like he was kind of the establishment pick. People liked him. You know, in his heart, he said that Biden had won or wh- whatever. People believed he was going to be a good candidate. But of course, as soon as Trump unendorsed Brooks, Durant came out and said Biden didn't win the election legitimately. And, you know, <laughs> the election integrity is the number one issue for for Alabamans. Uh, and these these voters kind of like like Durant up until there was a little bit of a turning point. So let's let's listen to them talk about Durant. I feel like he's going to stand up for what try. Right. And I believe, you know, he was a POW for 11 days. I mean, he survived that. So, I mean, (laughs) he can pretty much survive anything. And, um, yeah, I just have a lot of respect for him and his position and things that he's accomplished and and gotten through in his life. Just echoing a lot of what the other folks said, you know, he's a hostage, you know, Black Hawk Down, that's your guy. And I guess the one thing that, that sort of strikes me is when I've seen him, you know, public speaking, he's not much of an orator. I think he needs to work on his delivery just a little bit more, you know, and I think he's there. I started out liking him okay, but as times that has went on, I don't like him. Mm -hmm. I saw a video yesterday of a radio host that was trying to ask him a question, and it was about the Lincoln Project. Mike Durant will not condemn the Lincoln Project. Mr. Durant, are you against the Lincoln Project? Man never opens his mouth. And I mean, this is a lot to me. I mean, who can't condemn the Lincoln Project? So this, I actually had thought this was going to be a little bit of a mini scandal and not something that breaks through, but it is totally broken through. So Mike Durant went from number one, like he was leading the polls. And now it is Britt 37, Katie Britt, who we're going to get to in a minute, Durant 31 and Brooks 21. And that's from May 9th. And so the thing that has been killing Durant has been that somebody has come out and said that he is 
uh, maybe like shares a donor with the Lincoln Project, but they have managed to attach the Lincoln Project to him and it has totally cratered his numbers. Have you seen this? I have seen it. And it's a little bit of like kind of weird Kremlinology and there there's some foul play here. Like they got he got a postcard from somebody who was pretending to be Rick Wilson. I, it's hard for me to kind of follow all the details, but the relevant part that started all this is that this is a big super PAC race. Club for Growth, all these big conservative super PACs are in. But there's a center-right super PAC called More Perfect Union, I think is the broader group, but they have a specific Alabama group that has been supporting Durant that is funded by mostly like Democrats and, uh, you know, never Trump or some of them had funded the Lincoln Project, which I think is where this initial connection came in. They're coming in for Durant and it's hurting them. I, all the evidence seems to be that these super PACs isn't actually helping. And this is why, you know, the people here and the big center and donors and center right never Trumpers need to listen to us and listen to the focus group. Everything that has happened to hurt Durant here uh, with these voters is a result of people just not living in reality. They think that we can create this guy from whole cloth, you know, who has this story as a pilot and behind closed doors, the same groups supporting David McCormick, to, you know, go to New York and raise money from the big donors and be like, well, you know, just between us, like I wouldn't vote to overturn the election. You could count on me. But then publicly they go out and say all the same exact things that the crazy candidates say. And voters can sniff this out. The Republican voters are not looking for this. The whole farce of the Glenn Youngkin model like, is continuing to get exposed in these primaries and the fact that it only worked because of a unique situation. You know, we'll see there ends up being a runoff here. Trump could save him. A Trump endorsement would overwhelm this sort of Lincoln Project smear. But then again, once again, it would prove that, that, that it only works to push someone through if they go whole hog with Trump. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting. I wonder if Trump will endorse. I think we get a runoff here, probably, right? So yeah, you, I think you're going to end up with a Durant Brit runoff, which is when Trump could certainly make an endorsement. But I just want to say it's funny because of the establishment candidates. There's a true establishment candidate, even though she's running on like a build the wall platform, and that's Katie Britt. Katie Britt's been surging ever since this Lincoln Project Association came out for Durant. But man, this focus group did not like her. Uh, let's listen to the, what they said about Katie Britt. I try not to pay attention to because I think her personality, just the way she comes off and the way she speaks, I, I feel like it's she's more like a, a high school cheerleader. And it just it's very off-putting for me. And it's hard for me to look at her in, in, in a certain light. She's too small, perky, and peppy. I think she's going to be a pushover. Uh, I've known Katie since she was a teenager. She was a casual friend of my daughter's. Katie likes to win stuff. She liked to win stuff as a kid. She liked to win stuff as a teenager. She liked to win stuff as a young adult. So to me, I look at her like she's just trying to accomplish something personally. She's not going to be tough at all. She's a very sweet girl. These voters could just sniff these people out, can't they? <laughs> this, this is like a small state, a uh, small world. And of course, somebody knows her personally. And the idea that she was this like ambitious girl who liked to win is somehow a, a knock on her. I did not care for that. Anybody who's ever listened to me talk knows that I'm not a cheerleader uh, or the type that endorses cheerleading really as a concept. But I did sort of take umbrage. I don't know. I felt defensive on her behalf. I felt like they were going in a lot of different ways to say, like, she's a girl, <laughs> and and that's why I don't like her. Yeah. But what was interesting to me is that listening to them talk about Brett didn't like her, but she's running first in the race. Kind of mixed reviews on Durant. He's running second. The person they like the most is Mo Brooks. And so if I was just listening to focus groups, I would say, I don't know. I think Brooks is going to do better than people think. But that's sure not what the polling's saying. I think he could. These voters needed to learn about the other candidates, right? And they can sniff out what is real MAGA and what isn't. And Katie Britt, I, so I, there is definitely some sexism in there. Okay, no doubt. All right. But compare her to Kay Ivey, the governor. You know, kind of gives us this like hard scrabble Alabama grandma kind of vibe, like tough Alabama grandma. She talks and I, it, it almost feels like it might be a fake accent. <laughs> and so it's so Southern, right? And she has these two ads out recently to prove how tough she is about going after illegal immigrants and about how the election was stolen from Trump, uh, you know, because she's got this primary coming from the right. Contrast that with Brit, who really does 
kind of give off this Striver vibe of a type of an Alabama college graduate, went to D.C., went to work for Richard Shelby. And when you watch Katie Britt in her ads and, and debates and stuff, I, I know Katie Britt, right? There are a lot of these kind of Southern Republican striving women you know, who came to D.C. and sort of have that mien about them. And and that is like this establishment mien that all these voters don't like, right? Um, you know, they, she reminds them of the other type of establishment Republican types that they feel like have been too weak or whatever. And, and I think that is the difference with Brooks. So who knows? Trump is said to you know how Trump loves central casting. You know, he loves people who look the part. Britt's husband is a uh, Alabama football player grad, boo Alabama. And he gives off much more of kind of a tough guy vibe. They're running ads where he's like, she's the real tough one in the family, which says to me that they've seen these same kind of comments in the polls that she seems too bubbly or whatever. So they're hoping that he can use his manliness or whatever to pass that off on her. Maybe that works, but I, I don't know. Listening to these groups, looking at the polls, this looks to me like a race that if Trump put his thumb on the scale, that would have a J.D. Vance level result. And the first round here is coming up. That'll probably be a runoff if nobody gets to 50. So there's plenty of time for that. Yeah, I mean, I could be totally off base here, but there's this part of me that wonders if he had just not unendorsed Mo Brooks and that Mo Brooks had just kept plugging away, if just he'd sat back and let Katie Britt and Mike Durant tear each other to shreds, I'm not sure he couldn't have kind of repopped as the person that everybody was like, yeah, he's fine. Better than these other two. Yeah. Well, it is so rare, almost never happens, that you hear in a very Trumpy group and a very Dem group where you hear people say the same thing and agree on something with the same type of emphasis. But in this group of Republicans, when we brought up Mitch McConnell, they could have been a group of Democrats. So let's end with your moment of zen. Listening to how some <laughs> Alabama voters think about Mitch McConnell. I don't like him at all. He's a weasel. He's low life. He won't stand up for the party. He will not do what he's supposed to do. He cannot keep his delegation together. He's weak. He he needs to retire. I think he's selfish and conceited. He's in it for Mitch Mm -hmm. and not the country. No party loyalty at all. I don't think very much of Robert McConnell. When I think about how much I loathe Chuck Schumer and Nancy oh. Pelosi, I think, I guess Mitch McConnell will do. But I mean, that's not a that doesn't speak much for Mitch McConnell. So, you know, I, th- I think we can do a lot better. I don't know. Is it one thing that all Americans can agree on? Yeah, Mitch McConnell. If you look at polls of what is the least most popular person in all of politics, Mitch is the winner. So kudos. Great work. Hey, Mitch, this is your prize. I just every time I hear them just railing on Mitch McConnell, I think, This is what you get for doing all that blocking and tackling for Trump, giving him those wins that he could never could have figured out himself during his administration. You get the loathing and scorn of the Republican electorate. (laughs) Uh, I'm just going to let those guys speak for themselves. Yeah. Tim, thanks so much for jumping in at the last minute here. I really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for joining us for another episode of The Focus Group. As always, I would love it if you would go leave a rating on Apple or anywhere you listen to your podcast. Tell your friends about The Focus Group. And we will see you next week to do it all again. Bye. Everybody. Welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and I have a special episode for you today. We are going to do Pundit Accountability Day, and I have my buddy from The Bulwark, Will Salatan, here with me. Will, are you ready to do a Focus Group free <laughs> Pundit Accountability Podcast? Oh, Sarah, I am terrified of accountability. All pundits are terrified of accountability. <laughs> Here's the thing. I got to tell you guys, I get the producer keeps telling me to back away from the mic. I'm like too jazzed up. But Georgia was just a real boon to the soul for those of us who are deeply concerned about democracy. And, you know, now that we've actually been through 
a bunch of races, right? We've got Pennsylvania behind us. We've got Ohio behind us. We've got uh, now Georgia behind us. A lot of big ones. And one of the things I like to do is I like to re-listen to the focus group podcast after the election happens. I would actually encourage you guys to go check out the Pennsylvania episode or the Georgia episode now that you know the results or the Ohio episode. It's fascinating because I got to tell you, it's not like I got a crystal ball, but the people do tell you a lot of the answers. There's a lot of that comes out of these groups that really does point the way to kind of what's going to happen. And so I wanted to just take some time without actually doing episodes of the focus group, but kind of look at back at these races, talk about them, talk about how things evolved and draw on what we learned from the focus groups that I think was very clear in the groups that not necessarily was predictive of the outcome, but was certainly giving us a lot of signs toward the outcome. So everyone's talking about the results of Georgia, or maybe just I'm the one talking about the results of Georgia because I can't get enough of it. My boy, Brad Raffensperger, pulled it out, got 52% of the vote, cleared the runoff threshold. He beat Congressman Jody Heiss, uh, who, who was a, a handpicked Donald Trump stooge uh, meant to to be in the, in the vote counting business um, in the next election. Well, what do you think? Is there anything better than Brad Raffensperger, who was public enemy number one of Donald Trump winning in Georgia? Yeah. So this race is interesting to me for two reasons. One is that Trump got it stuck to him, right? That he lost this race. The other one is this could serve as a really interesting deterrent to future opportunists. I mean, Jody Heiss to sort of leave his seat and go run for this race thinking that he had it in the bag because of Trump and then just get smoked that may discourage some others who who are thinking of following Trump and doing the similar thing. Okay, but let me ask you this, because I agree with you. Did you think Brad was going to win? No. So I, for, first of all, outright, no way. The question was, was he going to hold Heiss under 50? But it was totally the opposite. Nobody saw Raffensperger winning this outright on the first shot. Um, What polling were you looking at? The pre-primary polls. Okay. I'll just tell you a quick story about Raffensperger race. And full disclosure, in my other capacity as a strategist and somebody who who does politics, I was involved in this race. One of the reasons I was involved uh, is that I saw some public polling, maybe like three weeks ago, I can't remember which one either, that showed Raff and Heiss neck and neck, like way closer. And so I will tell you, if you go back and listen to any of my commentary about Raffensperger, I definitely viewed him as kind of DOA. Part of it was because I had been doing focus groups in Georgia and they were very pro Marjorie Taylor Greene and they were very anti Brad Raffensperger. And, but a lot of those were, you know, a year ago. And the assumption was that Donald Trump was going to be in the state hammering Kemp and Raffensperger just relentlessly. But the big thing that happened, the big change, was that because Purdue like flamed out early and it was going to be a big blemish and an embarrassment, right? We could all see it coming from a mile away that Kemp was going to win. Uh, Purdue was like having pathetic events. No one was showing up. Uh, he wasn't raising any money. He wasn't putting in his own money, which meant that he, because he's a, you know, he's a millionaire, uh, which meant that he didn't have a whole lot of confidence in himself. And so Trump just like isn't showing up to the state. He's too embarrassed. And as a result, he is not hammering, hammering, hammering people with the reminder of how Brad Braffensberger didn't find him as 11,000 votes. And I think that created this opening. So when the few weeks out, there's public polling showing Heiss, Raffensperger, neck and neck, and a bunch of undecideds. And so the pack that I'm affiliated with and um, uh, some other groups, we, we, did a, we did a poll ourselves. And it showed that over 30% undecided. And that was when we decided, okay, it is worth engaging in this. And so um, there were a number of groups who in the last 10 days came in put a bunch of money behind Raffensperger. And a lot of it was just positive branding. And one of the groups that I know has gone on the record talking about what they did is um, a group called Country First, which is an Adam Kinzinger aligned pack that put a bunch of, I think, like 1.4 million into the race. So there's two things that happened. One, Kemp's coattails were really long. I mean, I don't think everyone knew he was going to win, but like it was just such a blowout. Um, Raffensperger was the incumbent. And so he just had more name ID. And one of the things that came up in the focus groups, and I tweeted about it at the time, and it was another reason that we thought it really made sense that the race was within reach, was because nobody knew who Jody Heiss was. And when you asked voters, Republican voters, uh, what do you think of Jody Heiss? Their answer was, never heard of her. 
<laughs> and so here's my question. Do you think misogyny played a role in Brad Raffensperger winning? Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's possible. That's possible. That's that. I love that story. I know you and Tim talked about that. Uh, the who is she thing as one of the unaccountable pundits. I saw the same public numbers you did. And I assumed Republican voters, they'll go with the Trump person. And obviously that didn't happen. Your explanation is starting to give me an answer as to why that didn't happen. But I got to tell you, Sarah, I'm kind of shocked because of the This is one of the polls that I looked at. April poll, I cannot remember. This might have been University of Georgia. It might have been somebody else. But the Kemp versus Raffensperger, there was a big gap, okay? Among Republican primary voters, Kemp's approval numbers were like 55-25. Raffensperger was the reverse, right? It was 25-55. In fact, Raffensperger was doing better in terms of his job approval with Democrats than he was with Republicans. It's fascinating to me that the dynamic that you're describing where Kemp, although he did better than Raffensperger among Republican voters, he essentially sort of ran cover for Raffensperger in terms of keeping Trump out of the state. Yeah, although you bring up another key feature of this race. Um, and I got to tell you, I am, um, when I say I'm, I'm coming off, it's just I'm feeling really excited and good. Um, part of it is that <laughs> my great hope for this country is that there is sort of a, a big, broad pro-democracy coalition that can come together. And that is sort of what happened. There were at least right now, according to Kyle Kondik, there were 40,000 Dems that cast early primary ballots. Okay. 40,000 Democrats pulled a Republican ballot in Georgia so that they could vote in this primary. And they voted for Kemp and Raffensperger. So Raffensperger was 27,000 votes ahead of the 50% cutoff. And so 40,000 votes from Democrats in this race made a huge difference for Brad Raffensperger. I'm so heartened by that. Yeah. And actually, so I saw, you can tell me whether these numbers are realistic or not, but the Washington Post did an analysis where they estimated that there were 77,000 voters who voted in the Republican primary in Georgia this year who had voted in the Democratic primary in 2020. So they can't prove that these are all Democrats who crossed over, but like that would even add to your your argument. Yeah. I think people are still kind of sifting through and trying to figure out, but there's just no doubt there was a relatively uncontested Democratic primary. Stacey Abrams was running uncontested. And so I just want to do a shout out to all the Democrats who were thoughtful enough to say, I'm going to pull a Republican ballot and I'm going to make my voice heard. Because, you know, it's not like Democrats love Brad Raffensperger. He does lots of things that I'm sure they don't like. And here's the thing. Brad Raffensperger is probably going to be harder to beat in a general election than Jody Heiss would have been. And so... I think that that was like a genuinely pro-democracy, vaguely self-sacrificing move from those Democrats. And I just think it's exactly what we need in this moment. Do you have something to add to that? Usually I think of this in terms of Republicans, right? I'm thinking you Republican voters need to decide that democracy is more important than all the other issues that you're looking at. I know you're concerned about inflation, you're concerned about the border, you're concerned about crime, but the number one thing you need to look at which candidate will defend democracy and will not promote election lies and will not talk about overthrowing future elections. And I'm thinking about them crossing over and voting for the Democrat. You're talking here about a really interesting reversal. Will Democrats cross over and vote for a Republican for exactly the same reason, that standing for democracy is more important than all the other issues on the table. Yep. It's the best. But what do you think? Do you think that just the blowout from Kemp and then even Raffensperger clearing, does that portend a diminishing grip on the party by Trump? Well, yes. I mean, over time, Trump's grip, unless Trump gets reelected president, will continue to diminish. The sort of question to me is how big is it at this point? First of all, it's declining. But also, you know, as you've seen in the primaries, it varies enormously from race to race how much of an effect he had. And a lot of it is how much other information was there about the respective candidates. If all you know is that Trump endorsed candidate A over candidate B, then that was a significant factor. But I looked at polling basically in four states, in uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, in Georgia, and North Carolina. And what I saw was, in general, Trump's endorsement made a much bigger impact where voters didn't already know the candidates well. Like Trump endorsing against an incumbent was generally a failure, right? That was just not very effective. But Trump endorsing, you know, among a couple of challengers nobody knew about was a big deal. 
Also, who else was endorsing in the race? You know, in Pennsylvania, Trump's endorsing Oz, but you got a bunch of other Republican luminaries coming in for McCormick. And so that kind of counterbalanced Trump's effect. And the other thing I would say, Sarah, is on the hard numbers, if you ask people, um, does it make you much more likely or much less likely to vote for candidate A that because Trump, it, it, that actually was almost a wash in a lot of places, like four points, two points, really small margins. So it made a difference. But if one candidate for other reasons had like a five point lead or a, more, then Trump's endorsement was not enough to overcome that. So that's interesting. And, and I got to say, we ask in every focus group whether or not Trump's endorsement matters to people. And they usually kind of say no. I remember asking this in the Ohio group, which is a super interesting episode to go back and listen to because we asked this question. They were all like, no, you know, I'm going to make up my own mind, whatever. Except that something that was really clear in the group is that they had all belatedly just realized that they like J.D. Vance. Uh, <laughs> I think if you ask people to sort of say whether or not Trump's endorsement really matters, like people want to be independent minded. And especially if they're saying it out loud to a group or like to a pollster. But I think that there's just no doubt in the open primaries where I think in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, where everybody's watching these guys just like nuke each other and they're kind of looking for something to help them decide. I think that's where Trump's endorsement can really help. And look, going into that Ohio primary, you know, Tony Fabrizio, who was Trump's pollster, who was working for Vance, had put together this whole like detailed polling analysis on like, hey, if you endorse Vance, he's going to shoot to first place. And that's exactly what happened in that primary. And so I do think it has a lot to do too with these like open primaries versus in Georgia. Like, and this is one of the things I keep saying to people where they're like, well, what is it about Georgia voters that is so different from all of these others that they were totally resistant to Trump doing this. And I was like, you know, it's not that exactly. It's incumbency is an incredibly potent force. These voters actively like Brian Kemp. They think he did a good job on COVID. They thought that he got their kids back in school, which a lot of people said in the focus groups. They said things like he has an actual impact on my life, which is one of the reasons, you know, I think he outran Raffensperger so much is that he's been able to really strike a brand for himself that is affirmative. Here's all the stuff I do for you. And he passed that election integrity bill, election integrity in quotation marks. He was able to blunt the criticism that he didn't do enough. Anyway, I think that Trump's endorsement matters. I don't think it is like a magic thing that can overcome normal political gravity stuff like incumbency, which is huge. State races and national races are totally different. I think voters are much more willing to give the finger to sort of national candidates in a way that the state level candidates actually have impact on their lives. And so it can't all just be culture war all the way down. Yeah. So one of the interesting things to me about the Trump endorsement as a phenomenon is, first of all, what is it about, right? It's it's not really about anything other than personal loyalty to Donald Trump, right? And so as you're pointing out in the Kemp case, if you as a Republican officeholder have a solid conservative record in, other, in all other respects, like you're the first governor to reopen during COVID, that kind of thing, and the schools are open and people are happy about that, and you are pretty well insulated against this because a lot of these voters are like, okay, so Trump's endorsing the other person, but like, why would I go against Kemp? Like all the reasons why I like Trump are reasons why I like Kemp. Right. And so I think, I think that protects a lot of, a lot of uh, these candidates. The other thing is Trump's endorsement is so driven by his obsession with election fraud and relitigating 2020. And the polling should generally shows that although Republican primary voters agree with Trump about the sort of gospel of like Joe Biden was illegitimately elected, yada, yada. They don't want to relitigate this. They don't want to go back and talk about 2020. And when they were asked about that directly in a couple of states, they said, yeah, no, no, I want to move on, right? They don't want to like jail everybody who was involved in January 6th, but for the same reason, they don't want to go argue endlessly about the 2020 election. And so to the extent that Trump's endorsements were about relitigating 2020 rather than about conservatism. A lot of Republican voters said, we're going to go with the conservative, not with the relitigator. You know, I only half agree with that. Let me tell you why. So let's just take Pennsylvania for one second. So in Pennsylvania, Doug Mastriano, he's a cute, curious lunatic who sent buses to January 6th. He belatedly, uh, when it was clear he was going to win, earned Trump's endorsement. And he himself, this QAnon bus January 6th crazy person, endorsed another January 6th crazy person, Kathy Barnett. And then Donald Trump, though, he endorsed 
Dr. Oz. So there was like the person that Trump put his hands on and said, this is my guy, Oz, who, by the way, the focus groups absolutely (laughs) hated. And it's why Dr. Oz actually did pretty well in these like rural areas because the Trump endorsement matters. Okay. And it looks like Oz is going to eke it out. But if you add up the Oz vote and the Kathy Barnett vote, assuming that one is the person Trump actually touched and the other one is the true MAGA candidate, that equals over 50% of voters in Pennsylvania. And so I guess the thing that I keep wanting people to not miss, and the reason I don't like these Trump is grip is slipping analyses, is that even though McCormick who had the lowest negatives in the group that we had. Like, I tweeted after the Pennsylvania group that I thought that McCormick was going to edge it out by a smidge just because they hated him a little bit less. And it looks like that's not going to be the case, but it is within hundreds of votes. But it's the way that Trump has transformed the party. And so when people obsess about just the man Trump and just the endorsement Trump, they're not thinking about the fact that he has radically altered the state of the party changed it in his image to the point where every nominee in these primaries, Trump can't endorse all of them, but they all endorse him with the exception of Matt Dolan in Ohio. These guys are all in for him, you know, whether it's the Alabama primary, the Pennsylvania primary, and even in Georgia. It's not like Kemp ran as an anti-Trump candidate. Like you just said this, and I think it's exactly right. He is viewed by the voters as perfectly in line with the combative America first agenda that Trump embodies. No? Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, first of all, in in Ohio, for example, I think that goes to your point about like all the candidates in Ohio sort of went Trumpy except Dolan, right? And I think one of the reasons why Vance got a big boost was if you're a Republican voter in Ohio and you're looking at these guys, you know, Mandel and Vance and the others, and you're like, how do I choose among them? that Trump coming in and saying Vance is the guy. At that point, there's it's hard for you to distinguish among them. Whereas I think in a race where there's an incumbent who has a record with somebody who has other factors involved, like I think the, the endorsement has less of an effect there. So I think that goes to your point. The thing in Georgia is kind of interesting because Kemp's record on say, uh, you know, signing the the Georgia election reform bill. That was a big deal. And some of the polling that I saw indicated that a lot of Republican primary voters in Georgia, something like 60% of them said that they were, they felt much more confident about election integrity more than in other states. They trusted that elections would be right. So what Kemp was able to do with this bill was basically to appease these voters, to reassure them. And they didn't have to go with sort of election denial. They didn't have to go with Purdue. They could get in Kemp, a guy who was conservative and who had signed an election reform bill and thereby addressed their concerns about that. So that's exactly right. And I think people forget that that election bill, like he ended up in a fight with Coca-Cola and Major League Baseball who pitched a fit about that bill. And a lot of people really got upset about that bill. And so he got to look like the DeSantis with Disney, you know, the guy standing up to the woke corporations in favor of, you know, election integrity. And people, I think, just don't realize how much that kind of wiped the anti-Trump stink off of him. The other thing that you said earlier that I just want to really highlight because it's so true, whether or not voters really know who Trump's endorsing, everybody like kind of in D.C. assumes that voters all have the same perfect information and they're pouring over the endorsement list. I can't tell you how often in a focus group, we say, well, Trump has endorsed so-and-so. And people are like, oh, I didn't I didn't know he'd endorsed him. It, and they, they usually know with the big Senate candidates, but on governors or any lower office, nobody knew that Trump had endorsed Jody Heiss. I mean, they didn't know who Jody Heiss was. <laughs> so uh, it is, uh, you know, taking some of those things into consideration is important that Donald Trump is just, he's obviously, he has a presence, but they're not like tracking his endorsements. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. I mean, Trump, you know, back when Trump had his Twitter account, everybody would sort of know right away what Trump had said. I, I want to say one thing, though, about back to your point about Kemp and the Georgia elections bill and how many people he pissed off with that bill. One of the strangest things to me about that story is that bill, that, that law that he signed in Georgia was way, way overplayed. Totally. And the liberals sort of portrayed it as like he's like suppressing the vote. If you actually read the details of the bill, like it was fine. He got the DeSantis effect because liberals went nuts over the bill and portrayed it as Jim Crow. I think Kemp got a lot of credit on the right for people who like Jim Crow. And they want Jim Crow, right? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. That's right. And but even though the bill itself didn't warrant that. 
Exactly right. I, I saw a quote from myself in Newsweek and I like had forgotten I'd given this interview and it was about DeSantis. And I had said the the left's rage is the spinach that he eats to make him stronger every day. <laughs> and like it's just true with these governors, you know, um, and, and you're right. I mean, the worst thing in that election bill was they demoted Brad Raffensperger. Like there was like a punitive action against him and what he could do in his role. Then, And that was like one of the worst things. So much of it was ephemera and was just reinstating some things that had been changed during COVID. And I do think this has been one of the limitations of people who are working on voting rights is the ability to, to distinguish between really bad bills and because I, I do think there was some stuff in this bill that that was bad, but it was nothing like the Texas bill or some of the other ones that have come out that are really horrible. Here we're talking about the large question of sort of where is America at this point? And there's sort of a good and bad in the Georgia story. The good is the bill itself in Georgia was not nearly as radical as it was portrayed. I mean, it looked like it had been written by somebody who like wanted to sort of have reasonable reforms, but wanted to look like they were appeasing the red meat base. Right. And so, and, and I agree with you. I think we're probably in agreement that the part about like what happens after an election where they're like messing with the, the, the role of the secretary of state, that's the scary stuff. But on the other hand, it worries me a little bit that despite the bill being sensible by and large, the Republicans felt the need to sort of play to the negative partisanship of whatever the other side is for, we're against. I think that's a fundamentally dangerous and large corrosive force in this country right now. So it worries me. I mean, they did, what was it, that they had a signing ceremony and there were no Democrats and one, I think it was a legislator, a black woman wants to get in and they keep her out. So it they make it look like a racial thing. They make it look like a partisan thing when it didn't need to be. So I'm glad that in fact the bill wasn't, but it worries me that they wanted to portray it that way. It's so funny. I mean, I think that there's something about the narrative right now when people are like, the establishment comes back. And I'm like, okay, seven years ago, the way that that Kemp conducts himself would have been seen as a very extreme Republican. And this is, oh, it's like Katie Britt. Okay. We should, at some point we should talk about Alabama. I love this race. But Katie Britt is seen as the establishment candidate. She, too, has flirted with election denialism. She ran on, like, building the wall. That was, like, her big thing. And this is where I just sort of have to laugh, at, to, to, to use a phrase, the Overton window on uh, establishment has moved 11 paces Trumpward, and it has lost the meaning of establishment. And And to your point, like... Kemp is a perfect culture warrior in his state who is fighting against Stacey Abrams. I mean, that was the one other thing I just should point out that Kemp really had going for him. And even Raffensperger, you know, it wasn't like anybody ran a campaign that they were the pro-democracy, you know, Republican. I call them pro-democracy. And I got it, actually took a bunch of crap for this on Twitter for calling them pro-democracy. But what I mean is we know they won't overturn elections because they've demonstrated that they won't. And uh, now I'm really talking about Kemp because I think Raffensperger was a totally different category. Like this is a guy who went toe to toe with Trump, re released the conversation of Donald Trump telling him to find 11,000 votes, like really fought with him and really was a sort of a, a warrior for democracy. But they all ran as, you know, against Stacey Abrams and sort of the liberals. And uh, it wasn't like they anybody was trying to run as the pro-democracy Republican. Yeah. What I had hoped as a reasonable person, and I'm sure what you had hoped too, was that basically that there would be a, an emerging Republican position that was sort of anti-Trump or at least anti-election lies, right? We're not going to lie about the election. We're going to admit that Joe Biden was legitimately elected, that all these claims of election fraud didn't pan out in court, nothing checked out. What's actually happened is that people who don't want to take the craziest Trump position that the election was stolen have sort of finessed it. I mean, Lindsey Graham's term for this, there were a lot of shenanigans in it. And the shenanigans doesn't have to mean fraud. The shenanigans means they changed the rules about absentee ballots. Well, of course, because a pandemic came in during the year, right? But um, that is somehow supposed to appease the base and is supposed to appease Trump in a way without actually saying that the election was fraudulent. Talking about the primaries with Bulwark's Will Salatan. Can we talk about the Alabama race for just one second? Sure. Because what I love about this race, and this is going back to sort of pundit accountability and the the episode we did, it was Georgia and Alabama we did at the same time. It was interesting in the focus group because the, the group really hated Katie Britt. Like somebody knew her, somebody like, <laughs> this is like Alabama, somebody's daughter went to high school with her. And the rap on Britt was that she was kind of a striver. 
you know, she's a cheerleader and she always wanted to win. And boy, it was just, they really seemed to hate that about her. But I would say the group was pretty middle-aged to older, but Katie Britt came out on top. But the thing that I took away from the group Like my big takeaway was that, you know what, I think Mo Brooks is more in this than people think because they all really liked Mo Brooks. Many of them had sort of taken a dance with Durant, but this like Lincoln Project connection that was really just about having sort of some of the same donors going into a pack supporting Durant that had also gone to the Lincoln Project, you know, they were able to just sort of tag him with the Lincoln Project and it cratered him because after Trump unendorsed Mo Brooks because he was running third and called him woke. Durant immediately grabbed the mantle and said, oh, no, I am the one who is going to make sure that, you know, when I'm elected, we're going to deal with the number one issue concerning Alabamans, which is that stolen election from 2020. And so voters had all taken a spin with him and then decided no thanks. And so people had kind of come back to Brooks in the focus group. And, you know, ultimately, Katie Britt kind of ran away with it. I mean, she got almost 45 percent, but Brooks got nearly 30 percent. And Durant is sort of at the bottom with his sad 23%. Are you surprised, Mo Brooks, uh, after living at the bottom, kind of had a resurgence? I can't believe it, Sarah, that I I ended up cheering for Mo Brooks. <laughs> I mean, here's a guy who was at the January 6th rally wearing what, like a, a bulletproof vest or something? I forget what it was. The guy's nuts from my point of view. Um, I think objectively nuts. And just the fact that Trump unendorsed him, <laughs> that just like, all right, all right, that makes him not a never Trumper, but a not not always Trumper. <laughs> uh, so I ended up cheering for this guy. I'm I'm happy for 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 that. Um, but uh, it's mostly I think this really sticks it to the sort of lie about the Trump endorsement, which is Donald Trump, a person who cares about other people, would endorse candidates based on what they would do in office, right? And Trump is not interested in that. Trump is interested in padding his own record, right? He wants to be the guy with the perfect endorsement record. And one of the ways that you would do that is you unendorse people who are losing, not because they're not you know, sufficiently loyal to you, but they're going to lose and you don't want that to be on your record, right? So he betrays this guy. So the, to me, the fact that Brooks comes back is sort of an illustration that very often Donald Trump's endorsement is a trailing indicator, right? He's not looking at it and saying, <laughs> who, who can I help to win? He's saying, who's going to win? So if I endorse them, that adds to my record. This is just like a tactical mistake. If he'd endorsed Katie Britt, because everybody went down to Mar-a-Lago, including Katie Britt, and she's got some like football player husband. And so for a while, there was some sense that maybe Trump would switch his endorsement to her because they looked, quote unquote, straight out of central casting. And he loves people straight out of central casting. And so him not endorsing her, to the extent that this is a parlor game now, had he placed his bets a little better, she could have avoided the runoff. But now she's going to be in a runoff with Mo Brooks. And Durant also endorsed Brooks. Right. Which I think is funny because, you know, he was supposed to be, according to the chatter on the back end, the like fake never Trump candidate. Like the reason that the Lincoln Project stuff stuck, I think, is that there was the sense that he was running fake MAGA. When it came down to it, he would do the right thing. But I don't know, man, maybe it's just because people can smell that phoniness. Oh, okay. So I I wasn't in the focus group that you were in in Alabama. What I, The whiff that I'm getting off of what you're telling me is how much do you think sexism is a factor in this race and will be a factor in the runoff? Well, this was what was sort of almost stunning to me. I, I've been rooting for Brit the whole time. I always thought by rooting, I'm going to just say they're all bad. <laughs> I don't like any of them, but this is Alabama. And so we need to be like, OK, one of these people is going to be in the United States Senate. Who is the least bad person for that? And Katie Britt, who has worked for Shelby for a long time, I think if the environment were different, she might even be somebody that I would have quite liked. She should be the candidate. But then when I was listening to this focus group, talk about me, something making me more on her side, listening to the way that they talked about her made me furious. They were super misogynistic. Like it felt, look, I think I said this on that podcast that um, I'm not one for cheerleaders uh, as a, as a concept, right? Cheerleading. I just like the people who stand on the sidelines and like cheer for the people playing. I've never understood it. Although there is a really great Netflix show called Cheer that did change my opinion on cheerleading just slightly. Amazing athletes, the one who do it like as gymnasts, really incredible. Anyway, the, 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 the knock on her that she was this striver, this cheerleader did to me smack of kind of a, a real 
anti woman trying to win. Like that was the the one woman was being like she's always wanted to win. I was like, oh God forbid. I'm sorry. Isn't <laughs> isn't the whole thing about Donald Trump that he's a winner? Isn't that the whole thing Republican likes people who want to win? My like sisterhood thing kicked in, <laughs> and I was like, yeah. I'm I'm about to intervene on Katie Britt's behalf, which I, is not a thing I was going to do. But I do wonder head to head with Brooks whether or not Britt still makes it. Yeah, I got to say, Sarah, that in in the invisible thesaurus in my head, the way the words are networked, striver or climber or whatever it was that you heard in the focus group is like, that's real, real close to uppity. And and, um, the fact that they hold it against her, that she's sort of, you know, been in politics is part of that. To me, that sort of resonates with the general sort of Trump phenomenon of we want an outsider. But then Mo Brooks has been there forever. So I really don't know how that plays. And also, you know, the thing about runoffs is that participation drops. And and so it really comes down to who turns out in these runoffs. And uh, I'm not sure that the kind of middle-aged to older constituency that still get the warm fuzzies from Brooks because he's just been around, that they don't kind of all come home to him. I'm not sure. But I will carry with me the um, the, the fact that they did not like her. So one other thing about Katie Britt, you were saying before that in another environment, she would be sort of a reasonable, normal Republican. Do you believe that that is in fact what she is and that she's just finessing her way through this Trump stuff and that Donald Trump will fade away from the scene? He will die or disappear or something. And that if she is the senator from Alabama, she'll be fine. I do. In a way that I actually didn't believe of Durant. And part of it, though, is I I know people who know her. I actually know people who know both of them. It's so pathetic what you have to look for in people to kind of like know their their hearts. But I'm familiar with this dance. I used to do it on on gay marriage. You know, like and we all knew that George W. Bush, despite running a horrible wedge effort, um, <laughs> everybody knew that the Bushes were, you know, fine with gay marriage um, and had gay people in their lives. And I, I'll leave it for a different podcast, whether or not that kind of cynicism is actually worse than like a Rick Santorum type who's real about it. But anyway, the point is, is there's this thing that people do where they you can sort of pick up the signals of whether or not somebody really believes the thing or whether they're doing it to get elected. And with the stakes as high as they are and no viable Democrat in Alabama, there is a reason to say, OK, who do we think isn't going to overturn an election? People know at this point what Donald Trump's game is. You come to Mar-a-Lago, you seek his endorsement. He says you got to do two things. You got to say you're not going to vote for Mitch McConnell as leader, and you're going to say the election was stolen. And I think the fact Durant, right after the unendorsement of Mo Brooks, Durant came charging out with the, yep, election was stolen, number one issue for voters. She never did. I mean, she did kind of at one point, she said she'd object to the 2020 results, But I think Trump would have endorsed her if she'd given her commitment to saying that the election was stolen. And instead, she kind of did like the Yunkin McCormick move. You can tell who like the secret ones are who actually hate Trump because they do the move where they won't quite go as far as the election was stolen. And instead, they sort of talk about integrity and, you know, examining the results. And they have this line that you can only see if you know it's there. That is between saying the election was stolen versus, well, you got to look at the results and I would have looked at 2020, you know, that's the tell. Right. I feel like sometimes we're living in sort of a, the story of like an unfolding religion and the religion is sort of, is Trumpism. And, and so one guy, Donald Trump can come out and say something crazy about the, the election being stolen and stick to it. And it's fascinating to watch how that bends the whole force field of everybody trying to find a way to appease this one madman while at the same time, not exactly leaving touch with reality. And that position you just described is it. Yeah. Are there any other states that you have watched where you've been surprised at how Trump's endorsement has played? Well, the ones that have happened so far, it's just, it's varied so much from one to another. You know, there's a difference between how people say the endorsement will affect them and how they actually vote. Some of the returns came in higher or lower than I expected. One of the most interesting polls that I saw was in North Carolina, where they asked people if they wanted a nominee who was similar to Trump. And it was basically like 85% of the Republican primary voters wanted a nominee similar to Trump. But then they sort of broke it down into sort of Trumpy on the issues versus Trumpy in personality, Trump, you know, in, in terms of things like tone and style. And basically they cut it in half. Like there's in the Republican primary electorate, there's like 40% who love 
like Trump, everything about Trump and want candidates who are like him. And then there's another like 45% who sort of, they like populist conservatism. They like what they think of as Trumpism, but they don't want the candidate to behave like Trump. I don't know how to describe them, Sarah. They're anti-Trump in a way, but they're pro-Trumpism. And without them, you can't win a Republican primary. Can I just say, I don't think they're anti-Trump. In the focus groups all the time, I ask this question, all of them, in every group, I ask about 2024. And always about half the group wants Trump to run again outright. But then the other half is like, well, I don't know. I'd like him to be involved, be a kingmaker, but I think we need somebody younger. And they have a bunch of perfectly valid points. Trump is getting older. They'd like to see somebody younger like Ron DeSantis, who, by the way, is basically made in Trump's image and just doesn't quite have Trump's baggage, but is very Trumpy in style. One of the main problems people see for Trump, it comes up all the time, and it's such a smart, obvious point that people don't think about, which is, why would I vote for Trump again who only gets four years when I could have Ron DeSantis who could get eight years? Like, Trump only gets <laughs> one more term. And that's completely right. And a completely pragmatic way to look at Trump and Trumpism is, okay, well, look, there's a bunch of junior Trumps now who can give me eight years of the kind of populist Republican rule and keep out these socialist Dems. And that's what I'm reaching for. I don't think any of it's anti-Trump. Okay. I I won't call it anti-Trump. And actually, Sarah, this conversation is just driving home to me how beaten down I am (laughs) that at this point in America's decline, but it matters a lot to me that the people who are going to elect a senator in Alabama or wherever it is, that Republican primary electorate in those states, that they at least agree we're going to allow votes to be certified for the actual winner of the vote. And people who will do that, people who will say that much, if those voters want to be Trumpy on issues, like, you know, all the polling I saw was like, inflation is the number one issue among Republican primary voters, immigration, border stuff, pretty clearly number two. I don't like that. I don't like the whole anti-immigrant thing going on in the party. I think it's corrosive to America, dangerous in a lot of ways. But it's much more important to me that the voters are going to at least choose somebody who will not literally overturn the will of the people in the two weeks after an election. Oh, I got bad news for you, bro. (laughs) Here's the thing. I am optimistic about people. I do all these groups, and I think that in the Trump groups, as frustrated as I get, so many of the people in them are incredibly lovely people. They're very recognizable to me, and I get so much hate mail if I say something in an op-ed that's like, these are not bad or unintelligent people. Man, nothing generates hate mail like me saying that these Trump voters are neither bad nor unintelligent, but they do not care about democracy, at least not the way you're thinking about it. It's funny. I I do try to cite this whenever I get put in a position to, which is CNN last year did a really good poll. And there's been a couple others about threat to democracy. And who do you think thought that democracy was most under threat? Oh, Republicans. Yeah. But they think it's under threat because the elections are being stolen from them. Exactly. so, So the problem is, is that what you want are like Republicans are like, why won't overturn an election? But actually... Adam Kinzinger said this on one of these episodes where he was like, you know, recognize when the bad guys think they're the good guys. And I'm not saying that these voters are bad guys, but I I will say like they will overturn democracy (laughs) uh, in the name of protecting democracy, if that makes sense. Right. The people who stormed the Capitol think they're the good guys. They think they're the ones protecting democracy from an election that was stolen from them, Mm -hmm. which is why. To me, the great villains of our time, the great people who are just absolutely the threat to democracy are less these voters and much more Tucker Carlson and Josh Hawley. But the people who tell the lies, who prey on people's patriotism and pervert it into a kind of corrosive nationalism and tell them lies about an election being stolen, they're lying to people. And they're the, one, they're the ones generating this, this issue. Yes. And Sarah, you're bringing me back. This was the first piece that I wrote for The Bulwark, which was exactly on this point, that the voters who are a danger to democracy in this country are not anti-democratic. They're pro-democratic. They just they just believe the lies that the Tucker Carlson's and others have told them. So they think they're saving democracy when, in fact, they're trying to overturn the election. When I look forward and ask myself how far this will go and you know how bad will the Trump movement get in terms of 
threatening American democracy. There are some general elections coming up that I'm looking at. As you point out, I confess, yes, Doug Mastriano won going away in the governor's race in Pennsylvania. He's not just an election denier. He was involved in January 6th and the buses and all that. And so number one, he has to go down and I think he will. And that's a race that Republicans might otherwise have won. So that would be a good sign for democracy. We've got different species of election deniers coming up in the Arizona elections. So I think that, you know, Mark Fincham is like an absolute denier and Brnovich is not quite a denier, but sort of in that middle ground that we were talking about. So I'm curious to see how the different positions play out. But yeah, the absolute deniers must lose their general elections or we are in, we are in deep trouble. I could not agree more. Uh, I could not agree more. Will Salatan, thank you so much for coming and uh, doing the the Pundit Accountability Roundup. I just, I really wanted to explore whether or not the focus groups were kind of getting it right. And um, I, I obviously, I'm the one making the case that I feel like whether it was seeing uh, the opening for Raffensperger, whether it was understanding why people liked Kemp, whether, you know, engaging sort of Trump's endorsement, his hold on the party. I just think the focus groups have been, they have not been leading us astray. And so I hope all of you have been enjoying uh, the focus group podcast. We will be back next week uh, with an episode about abortion, talking to suburban women. We've been really looking forward to bringing it to you. Our guest is Rachel Vindman and host of the the Suburban Woman Problem podcast. Uh, But Will, thanks again for joining us. Uh, Thanks, Sarah. And there's just one thing I wanted to say about those focus groups. I love that you do this. And sometimes, being a nerd I am, I think, you know, focus groups are kind of small, small sample size. You can get things wrong with it. But then part of me says... How was the number of people in the focus group more than zero? Because zero is the number of ordinary people most pundits are actually listening to. So even just to get like a dozen people or whatever in a room, real people just broadens the conversation and injects a dose of reality that pundits really need to hear. Well, thanks for saying that, man. I happen to uh, completely agree with that. And, you know, we do we do groups every week. And so I'm not saying that we get a uh, poll, sa- you know, scale. We certainly don't. But we do talk to enough people to get a real sense of the trends. Uh, and, and so but but, you know, thanks for listening and thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. We will see you next time. everyone, and welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and I appreciate all of you joining us today. And if you love this podcast, please go and leave a rating or a comment in iTunes. It will help other political nerds like all of us discover this podcast. Okay, this week we are checking in with suburban women, specifically suburban women who voted for Donald Trump in 2016 and Joe Biden in 2020. We affectionately refer to them as flippers on this podcast. They are in North Carolina, Georgia, and Wisconsin, all swing states. And uh, we're going to cover the basics with this group, how they feel like things are going in the country, how they identify politically these days, but also what they think about the recent leaked uh, Supreme Court opinion overturning Roe v. Wade and how that is impacting their thinking about the 2022 midterms. And I thought, who better to talk about suburban women than Rachel Vindman, who co-hosts the Suburban Women Problem podcast, a podcast I have been on in the past. As she says on her website, she thought she'd be a Republican forever until President Trump called her husband, Alex Vindman, a traitor. Alex Vindman also been a guest on this podcast. But Rachel, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for having me. I am a bit of a super fan of this podcast, so this is quite an honor for me. Yeah, we've got mutual mutual fandom. I do think this is the first time, though, like I've completed a set, a husband and wife pair as guests <laughs> on the show. So that's a real first. Congratulations for that. Thank you. We're very honored. So what is the state of suburban women these days? They are always a coveted demographic in elections and were especially so in 2020. In fact, I focused incredibly hard on them from a focus group perspective. And 
many suburban women, like those in the focus group that you and I just watched, they voted for Trump in 16, but they switched to Biden in 20. Do you think that these women are still leaning more Democratic these days, or did Democrats kind of rent them for one cycle simply because they hated Trump so much? It's quite possible that my colleagues on the Suburban Women Problem podcast wouldn't even agree with me. But what I'm hearing is a lot of people are unsure about President Biden. And their vote for Biden was often, I think, a vote against Trump. And for those people, it is Perhaps they were rent to voters and they don't know where their home is and still trying to figure it out. And they're just not settled. But just because you don't like Trump doesn't mean that they're embracing the Democratic Party. And that really has me concerned as we go into the midterms and obviously the 2024 election, because I don't see them as being card-carrying Democrats. They don't feel like they have a home there. And that's really the sense that I get. So I actually really think that's right. I have done hundreds of these focus groups. Um, I don't know how many I've done since the 2020 election, but a lot. And with a lot of these, you know, swing voters, the flippers, the people Mm -hmm. who at the end of the day went for Biden because God, did they hate Trump and they just could not take Mm -hmm. another term of this guy. But they do not identify as Democrats. And I, I would say this group was um, outliers too strong a term, but they were more willing and open to vote for Democrats in 2022. They were still carrying a lot of that Trump baggage with them. Like mm-hmm, you get definitely. them started on Trump uh, and they were pretty forgiving of Biden. So like, look, let's jump in. Let's listen to this because I, I think, you know, while they were split on kind of how they identify politically these days, the one thing they all had in common was that they really did not like Trump. It was his handling of COVID, his misogyny, his racism, his tweets, his embarrassing the country. Uh, and that's just like not even a comprehensive list of their criticisms. Um, <laughs> but they showed a real generosity to Biden. They praised his handling of COVID, as well as restoring a sense of stability and decency to governance in the Oval Office. And there was a palpable sense of relief that they have been just like waiting to exhale. And Biden gave them that. Let's listen to them. Overall, I feel a lot more positive now. I feel like we're on a good trajectory. And, you know, I, I imagine that what he did probably, you know, put a lot of things into motion that helped that happen. Whereas I don't think if Trump had still been in office, maybe we wouldn't be where we are or God knows where, where we would be right now. I think B, maybe B minus, I guess. I mean, he inherited a lot of problems with COVID. He did an excellent job um, turning that around and, you know, trying to get people to believe that it actually did exist and it might kill you. But I think with Biden, I think he's, if I could say, I feel honesty, even though I don't know if any politician is honest all the time, but I think he is, he has, I see integrity out of him more than I saw definitely out of Trump. Mm. I wouldn't say my views are exactly in line with Biden, but I do think as far as like decent human beings, we have the lesser of two evils in office for sure, because the stuff that's going on with Trump just, that just can't go on. So it's not perfect. I would also give him a B. Um, but I do think that he's he's trying and he cares. The fact that we have a president now who defers to the CDC um, and the people who do spend their work day every day, you know, working on these things. They're the experts. That's who we need to defer to. So he got bees, I think, from everybody. And mm-hmm. having done a lot of groups of swing voters, uh, I would say Biden's his average grade is kind of like a B minus to C plus in those groups. And so this group was kind of giving him higher marks. And I guess I was thinking to myself, you know, like I said, I did a lot of these suburban women groups going into the election. And we would specifically look for women, college educated, who'd voted for Trump, but rated him as doing a very bad job. We viewed that as our persuadable target audience. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately in 2020, a lot of those women did vote for Joe Biden. A lot of men too, though. We all focused on suburban women, but it turned out at the end of the day, suburban men also were like a big driver of 
the Biden vote. But I did wonder if the fact that this group was all women as opposed to the mixed gender groups that we normally do, if they were able to lean into, I don't know, in, into this more. I don't know. Yeah, what, what do you yeah. think? No, I mean, first off, I do like the lesser two evils drink. It's my favorite game when listening to your podcast, because it comes up, as you have pointed out, quite often. But there was a camaraderie, certainly, that they felt like they could really lean in to these issues that are very important to suburban women. And and can I say, we're getting into the row reversal. It was like five days before my husband really understood why I was so upset. So, I mean, he consumes the news. He's on Twitter. He knows what's going on. And yet he was quite tuned out to the leaked opinion and all the ramifications of that. So I just think you will see the waves in this demographic first because other people are not paying attention to it so much. That's my thought. And so I think some of the reaction that we saw was actually tied to this issue with Roe. Along with COVID, that kind of pushed them towards Biden versus Trump. But to keep them there, I do think issues like the economy are going to weigh heavy on women. Women do most of the purchasing in a home. That's just a fact. And 2 million suburban women voted for Biden. It is, as you pointed out, a winnable demographic. But I think President Biden needs to lean in a little bit more and sort of acknowledge a lot of the issues that are facing women in this demographic. And I think they would respond very positively to that. All right, let's put a pin in the road thing out because we're going to talk a lot about that in just a minute. But you're right, right? Like there's other big issues. You know, these women shared how they were concerned about the economy, inflation, gas prices, workforce changes, supply chain problems. But they had a good perspective of it, didn't they? Because they were like, so that shocked me. Well, yeah. I mean, they didn't hold Biden directly responsible. Yeah. And instead, they blamed kind of a host of factors generally related to the pandemic or to the war. So they had this kind of broad uh, perspective here. Actually, let's just look. I haven't heard that. Yeah, let's, let's listen to this part. Okay. See, the August inflation stuff, I think, is all because of COVID. I think it all stems back from that. I mean, it's, you know, you go to restaurants and you can't get good service because there's not enough people working. And I don't know what needs to be done to for that to happen, for more people to get out there and work. The gas, but I know that has to do with the war. The shipping problems. I mean, the fact that people don't want to work or the fact that half the goods in the world are sitting in the middle of the ocean is not necessarily Biden's fault, Um, but it's a new problem. It's something that we've never had before. So I think they're learning how to solve that. I think they will solve the inflation issue because that problem raises its head in the United States, you know, every few years or decades. So I know he's trying So I'm trying to give him some grace. I agree with what everyone's saying. Like my stocks took a hit. My retirement took a hit. I do think if Trump wouldn't have made such a mockery of COVID and he was still president, I think some of that would still be better than it is today. And I do think, yeah, I mean, it's hard right now with the gas prices. We don't have enough people working. So many businesses have closed. But I can't say that's all Biden's fault either, that people don't want to work. So I think he's trying the best that he can. Do I think he's the best president we ever had? No, but still better than Trump. I see like, you know, people were saying on social media, everyone wants to blame Biden for high gas prices. This is not the first time that we've had high gas prices. I remember high gas prices many times before. This is nothing new. Um, To me, that's just drama to blame him for that. Um, And the same thing with the war. I mean, this is not the first time two other countries have been at war. And if anybody was friends with Putin, it certainly wasn't Biden. (laughs) So I don't get how Putin invading the Ukraine is Biden's fault. But if you talk to the Trump supporters, it somehow is. So, yeah, to your point, incredibly forgiving of Biden. I mean, they do not sound like most of the groups of flippers that we talk to. Mm -hmm. Even just like... (laughs) The extent to which these women were like, he's a nice guy. He's a decent guy. Uh, it is is so different from a lot of where they're like, 
I mean, yeah, he's better than Trump, but like clearly uh, he's no longer fit to be the president. That comes up in all the groups. I mean, not, not just the Trump groups, like absolutely the swing voter groups that Biden is weak. But this group of women was, to your point, was just very forgiving of that, which was unusual. Yeah, that's why I kind of was pretty heartened by it, but I still question how widespread those thoughts are. But, you know, I also kind of wondered because of this demographic, I wondered if because of their socioeconomic position, if they've been able to weather it a little bit more and that was what they were going by. I don't know because I just kind of thought it wasn't so typical, but maybe it's also being influenced by some of the other factors that continue to come up. And people clearly see like Joe Biden, maybe not the best president we've ever had, but a good person for this moment compared to what we had before. Yeah. I mean, look, I have a theory about one of the things okay, that I want to hear. Yeah, it. that had kind of been driving this. So up front, when you were listening to the women talk about why they turned on Trump, right? Why they didn't want to vote for him again. I was shocked by how much COVID came up. Me too. And one of them had gotten COVID really badly. One of them's father had died from COVID. And yes. a couple of them at their jobs had like ended because of COVID. Like they'd been forced into early mm-hmm, retirement. Mm-hmm. And I was reminded of how much this particular demographic you know, one of them was taking care of an ailing husband. Um, mm-hmm, they're just mm-hmm. a little more cautious, I think. Hmm. They really hated how Trump handled COVID. Like, that stuck with them more than anything else. And, like, they're still mad about it. Like, they're still yeah. upset that the reason that we're dealing with COVID today, they blame Trump. You can see this in polling, that Biden, people think he's done a much better job on COVID. It's one of the things he gets high marks for. hmm And I just think COVID just seemed to really still loom large in their lives in a way that in most of the other groups, I would say it's very clear the economy has overtaken Mm -hmm. COVID. And of Mm -hmm. course, they're related. But the inflation, the cost of gas, the supply chain issues, they all registered for these voters. But like they maintained that it was COVID related and they blamed Trump for his early handling of COVID. And that's why all this was happening. And that was just very dominant in this group. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think uh, a few weeks ago, I was listening to your episode when Tim was the guest, and people talked about all the issues we're having, but they 100% blamed Biden. So if you juxtapose that with this focus group, and they were like, yeah, things are bad, but they've been bad before. You know, I mean, they were very forgiving in that vein. But that's an interesting theory. It's hard for me to separate it because a lot of the stuff with Trump is so personal that I also have a very visceral reaction to Trump, but for a different reason. And I can't really separate those two things. So it was surprising for me to hear people having such a strong reaction to him like these women did. Okay, let's dive into the Roe v. Wade discussion. Ever since the Alito memo leaked, I have been asked the same question over and over again. If the Supreme Court overturns Roe, will it have a major impact on the midterms by galvanizing women? And I got to say, my contention, much to the annoyance of many, has been no, I don't think so. Which isn't to say that I think it will have no impact. I do think it could help some Democrats in key races, especially some of these governor's races, but I don't think it will fundamentally shift the headwinds that Democrats are facing in 2022. And here's why. We asked these suburban women what their top motivating issues are going into the 2022 elections. And here's what they said. So health care is my biggest issue. After that, the economy and the war. That rounds out my top three. I think my newest necessary thing to vote with is our health care. I have a very sick husband at home right now. And I, I couldn't get him care. Also, I would put out there the economy because, like I said, the workforce is just not what it was. So health care is number one. Economy, uh, our economy. It concerns me how the economy is going to be in the market when she graduates or, you know, in the near future. It just seems like it's getting worse every day. But like, you know, this inflation stuff. I would say health care. Um, when someone is sick either physically or mentally, and they can't get the health they need, then bad stuff starts to happen. But other than that, I I think um, the economy, 
I, I'm, I'm very concerned about Roe v. Wade being overturned. I, I am pro-choice. So the top issues for people, if you just ask them, just, hey, what matters to you right now? Healthcare and the economy were really the dominant issues that basically everybody said. There were, mm-hmm. you know, a scattered reference to crime, to the environment, to the war, to education. And only two women brought up abortion organically. And when they did, it was their second or third issue. It wasn't the top issue for anyone. Mm-hmm. Did that surprise you? It did. I went back and rewatched it a couple of times, actually, to make sure that I wasn't missing anything, both in preparation for speaking with you and just because I thought it was very interesting data points to have. But there'll be a lot of opportunity to muddy the water on this, on the abortion issue. And still people are continuing to buy groceries. They're continuing to buy fuel. They're continuing to have these things in their life on a daily basis. That is not the abortion slash birth control issue that will not be every day. And the healthcare and the economy were the things they mentioned the most. And I, like you, think that is what is going to be the problem in November. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, it felt pretty clear where what is on their minds day to day is not the abortion issue. Mm -hmm. And it is both the problem for Democrats and, as I see it, the opportunity. I've been trying to explain to people that part of the function of the leaked memo, like we still don't know who leaked it or why or what the – but Mm -hmm. one of the practical impacts that it had is that the shock of the idea that Roe v. Wade was going to get overturned was kind of blunted by everybody being like, is this real? Is this true? Wait, Mm -hmm. who leaked it? And so now what we're in is this weird psychological time where everyone's kind of getting used to the idea – that it very likely will be overturned without knowing for sure Mm -hmm. that it will get overturned. And so I think that that spark moment, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, which would have happened if it just had come out, is getting diluted by this moment where everybody is like absorbing the implications, but not in a way that's so certain that people are like in the streets. And so whether or not that was intentional, I do think that's part of what is happening. I want to play this next round of clips because listening to this group clarified something for me, which is that sometimes I think Democrats, they're like, well, this is going to motivate everybody. And and mm-hmm. they don't think that they have to do something to ensure that it motivates people. Yes. And so we ask them the open-ended question, and only two people bring up abortion organically. And it's not their top issue. But when you start asking them about abortion, here's how they sound. I'm very concerned about Roe v. Wade. I'm Catholic. I consider myself pro-life, but I do also agree that there is a time and place where abortions are necessary. And the idea that the Republicans are kind of pushing that shit through just it scares me. Something that's that's been precedent for 50 years or however long it's been, for, and longer than I've been alive. And that just makes me really nervous. And not even necessarily just that, but you know what I've heard about, like how that um, can domino effect into other areas like same sex marriage and things like that. I agree. I think there's a time and a place. I think you shouldn't just have an abortion just because there's got to be a good reason. That's the way I feel about it. I agree. It is a life, but I feel like it's also your choice. I don't think that abortion rights should be a form of birth control, but I think that we're going to go backwards. We're going to go where people are going to go behind a store, behind an alley. People are going to be coat hangers, it. coat hangers. Yeah. I just think that we need to stand up for women's rights. I don't think that anybody should tell us what kind of bra to buy, what kind of panties to buy. It's just that's the same as, um, in my opinion, telling us what we can do to our body and what we can't. And I personally, a baby is at conception. I believe. The minute you find out you're pregnant, you're pregnant. That's a baby. But there are situations where it's not good to bring somebody into this world. It's not the right situation. And those are the decisions that a woman should be able to have that right to choose. I found this so fascinating for a couple reasons. One was, going back to the original point, that there was like an immediate Women should have the right to choose, even from the people who identify themselves as pro-life. 
Like multiple yes. people identified as pro-life, but still thought that it was going too far, too extreme, that there were some mm-hmm. circumstances. I don't actually think it's like telling people what kind of bra or panties they can buy, but her point- <laughs> No, her, I thought that was a bit Yeah, much. but her point was just, you shouldn't be able to tell women what they can do. And I think that's the reaction that I think Democrats are banking on. Yes. And so what did you think specifically about the reaction to the Roe v. Wade question? I don't know if they were trying to be polite and not mention it kind of beforehand, or I couldn't get a sense of that. But when it was specifically asked, the floodgates opened and people had a lot of thoughts, even people who are pro-life, who identify as pro-life. And I sort of really hate these terms, by the way, because I myself have a a really complicated obstetrical history and, you know, having done fertility treatments and seeing the heartbeat at six weeks, I I thought that was a life too. And, you know, that was really important to me. So I can really identify with that while at the same time holding it in my hand. And this is what I heard these women say. It's not the government's decision to make. It is a woman's right. It is her decision and her choice. And One person told a really compelling story about her brother and sister-in-law and a a child that they had that only lived a week. And she also identified as pro-life, but, you know, had this personal experience. So if the Democrats are going to use this issue, they've got to find a way to tell these personal stories and get people talking. Without it, it is not going to be the buffering issue that they really want it to be. That's the point. The takeaway from this is that if you can isolate and elevate this issue, right now it is a low salience issue for people. But if you can make it a high salience issue for people, yes, then you have a chance, I think, with these women. And it's interesting that you bring up the story that the woman told, mm-hmm. um, because I don't normally cry in focus groups, but I did in this one. And other women were crying in the focus Mm -hmm, group. mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, there is something particular about this being a a group of women. There is something where uh, a lot of us have our own stories about, you know, trouble getting pregnant or how badly you wanted a baby or people have, you know, their own trauma with childbirth or I sort of a don't see a woman telling that story Mm -hmm. in a mixed group. And I think this is where Democrats have like already I see them getting this exactly wrong. More people start talking about as the solution, like packing the courts Mm -hmm. or even the show vote that Schumer held recently, where instead of codifying Roe as it exists today with all of the state level laws that have been passed sort of subsequently, they were trying to codify like original Roe, which uh, would have eliminated all those laws, which is, you know, I think too extreme for a lot of people. Like you can hear it in these women, what they're saying, Mm -hmm. like they view themselves as pro-life, but at the same time, like they don't want crazy laws. They don't want crazy restrictions. Yeah, no, they absolutely said that. Everyone said there should be exceptions. And you had a pretty mixed group of people. So that tells you right there where you can really get people is by highlighting the fact there are a lot of Republicans who want zero exceptions. And I, I also cried when I heard the story. Alex and I had a daughter who lived a week. She was born early because she was just born prematurely, but I completely identified with that. I have had multiple miscarriages and ectopic pregnancies. And there are some states that if I had an ectopic pregnancy, my first one, I would probably have died because there will be states that will not allow for surgery to remove an ectopic pregnancy. And I had a true emergency ectopic pregnancy. These are the stories that need to be told. One, so people understand what is actually at stake, because a lot of people aren't understanding that. But also because I do think the personal stories are compelling. And it's a lot of the way that I think this issue can sway some voters, even people who might, you know, see themselves more as pro-life. Yeah, it's just going back to the earlier point you made about this idea that Congress moving to ban all abortions with no exceptions, that sat really poorly with this group. Um, and in fact, mm-hmm. most of these are lifelong Republicans, and they all thought yeah. it was too radical. Let's listen. If most of these people were women that were voting on this, it would be completely different. They're men. That would be my drop head stop. If I think about Donald Trump specifically as a person, 
who was against Roe v. Wade, who wanted to abolish it. But I can't, in good conscience, say to you, he never had somebody get an abortion because he got them pregnant. It just irritates me that if I were raped or my daughter-in-law was, or my daughter-in-law um, was pregnant, but the baby had, at, at two and a half months, they found it had um, absolutely you know, life altering, no, no good life. Would I want my daughter in law and son to have a baby that they couldn't even get health care for? Everything is intertwined. So this was an interesting point to me. You know, she was saying this is a health care issue. This is an issue about women mm-hmm. being able to make these complicated choices. And like, I think that that is just from a common sense thing that women understand what you talk to them about. Mm -hmm. They want to make sure that there are these protections in place for all of these, whether it's the healthcare side of things and people being able to make decisions if there's something that's gone wrong with the pregnancy with their doctors or in the case Mm -hmm. of rape incest, like they brought those up as like, you have to have these, you can't eliminate them. And so it seems to me like that's the place Democrats, they need to prosecute that case in that space. (laughs) I couldn't agree more. Uh, On my podcast, I think I'm a bit of an outlier with my co-host, but I just think this issue is not an issue unless the Democrats really make it an issue. Now, the Republicans are helping with that a little bit because As you know, this focus group acknowledged the more radical they make it, the more of the backlash that we're going to see. So there are states where there will be no exceptions. And that I think is where the Republicans are just going to push too far. But it's only pushing too far if the Democrats highlight it, that they get that message out there that it's happening, because I don't think the Republicans want to broadcast that. And if there's One thing I like to say about suburban women is not only do we know the problems that we have, we also have some pretty good solutions if policymakers would listen to us. You know, one thing I absolutely hate is when I'm sort of venting to my husband and he tells me how to fix my problems. I didn't ask for that. And I feel the same when it comes to policies. Like, we know what we want. We would like health care. Decent health care that's a reasonable price. We need child care. The things that suburban women have specifically asked for that either the Biden administration didn't want to make issues or they couldn't pass them because they lack, you know, a significant majority. Both are kind of true. But these are things that would really make people's lives better. And we have the solutions. So I think as it relates to the Roe issue, You need to amplify what's going to happen, what the consequences will be. And I do think people know what the solution would be. And that would be to make sure that the people for whom they are voting are not in favor of those policies. Yeah, I mean, right. So we asked the open-ended question at the top and abortion Mm -hmm. only comes up twice. Then, though, we talk about it for half an hour with the group. And then so then we asked, okay. So the elections are coming up in 2022, and now that we've talked about it for 30 minutes, we say, you know, could this issue push you to vote for a Democratic candidate in the midterms? And here's what they said. So our elections are tomorrow, and so looking at candidates, you know, it's hard for me to, with that new knowledge, so quickly trying to look at the candidates and say, like, who's going to be able to do something? Because I do consider myself more of a fiscal conservative and more, you know, moderate to left leaning in terms of social issues. I think maybe for the longest time, I've just sort of done the Republican ticket because I kind of had my blinders on and said, well, you know, fiscal conservative, but you know, that's kind of what I feel like the Republicans are more so. But now I think those social issues are becoming more important to me or, or more important for me to consider when I'm voting. Yes, that's going to depend, you know, which candidate I vote for because that's going to come into play as are many other things. You have the right, you know, a living will to be pulled off a plug, you know, you know, if you are on life support or whatever. So why can't that happen at the beginning too? I live in Augusta, Georgia, which is right next to South Carolina. I'm five minutes from South Carolina. 
already there have been a lot of things where people are listing available abortion places in both South Carolina and Georgia just in case. It comes down where you can't get one anymore in Georgia. You can also go to Alabama three hours that way. So it's already being discussed a lot about what's going to happen and what are we going to do. So it's going to be interesting to see in the elections how that comes up. So now that they've talked about it for several minutes, you heard a lot more of them say like, well, yes, this is going to factor into my voting choices. And I think to me, that's just an example of if Democrats can find a way to put this top of mind for Mm -hmm. especially women in ways that are not overreaching, that aren't about anything, anything goes, um, that that ends up feeling too extreme to voters like this. Yeah, even the terminology. I mean, some of this terminology that they insist on using, I mean, it's, I, I even understand why they're doing it and it still bothers me. It's not even words I'm comfortable using. And I think there's a lot of people in that space. And whenever you start going too far, some people stop listening to you. So look, it's a really complicated issue. You have to thread the needle. But if we just talk about it, we talk to real women and they really understand what laws are going to be in place and how that's going to affect them. I mean, come on, Sarah banning IUDs, like, this is ridiculous. But these are some of the things that we have to get out there because otherwise I think there's going to be a lot of people who aren't going to understand it. I think that's right. And I think, you know, your, your point about it is complicated and it's also, you know, it's a deeply personal issue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And one that, as we've kind of referenced, a lot of people have stories about. They certainly know people who have stories that kind of mm-hmm. fit into – this question of, look, I, I had to make like the hardest decision of my life. Yeah. And they understood how complicated that moment was, how horrible it was. Uh, it lives with them forever. And so I think that when this gets politicized the way that it does, you have to find a way to meet the moment in the way that people truly experience it. And in mm-hmm. fact, I thought about this. I was a little surprised that this happened in a focus group just because these people don't know each other. But then I was thinking about how much women sort of instantly kind of felt a kind of kinship, a kind of understanding and immediate, yeah, sense of, of, of seeing each other and themselves. And so one woman told this very personal story. Let's listen. So I actually have in my own family, and this goes back to 2009, but there was a child who did not survive in my family and had my sister-in-law, she did not choose to abort the baby, but had she, it, I can't think of a more perfect example. So um, his name was Colin. He was born on a Friday. He died on a Friday, he lived exactly seven days, just enough time for my brother and his wife to hold him. And um, he was born with something called charge syndrome. I had never heard of it before. He had um, a mix of problems with his senses and his organs. So like in his case, he had Down syndrome. His heart had a hole in it. He had two kidneys, but they were both on the same side of his body. Only one of them was functioning. He was blind. He was deaf. He wasn't going to be able to speak. And this was all new to me. He didn't even have a sense of taste or touch. None of the five senses existed for this child. Um, Thank God the Lord took him after seven days because that is, I mean, you know, and again, I agree. It is not a form of birth control. And there's rape and incest and all kinds of situations where a woman should have a choice Um, but this poor child, I mean, and I certainly wouldn't want that for myself. This child wouldn't even know that he was in the world. And my father and I have had discussions before where not every life is worth living. For instance, burn victims, people who survive maybe a car that caught on fire. I'd rather die than survive that. Um, so not every situation is life, 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 because my father and I both agree we would rather check out <laughs> than live in certain specific situations. So my brother ended up just himself. Obviously, he didn't need any help, but he just carried a tiny little coffin up at the viewing, and, you know, for his baby. But that's really a situation where that should be available to people. You know, the thing about her telling this story, I just it's hard to describe it in the group. People were, you know, people were kind of tearing up, but also there was like a tremendous amount of recognition from other people Mm -hmm. in the story. And some people referenced it that they'd had miscarriages. And like, 
I am very careful to try not to mm-hmm. <clears throat> talk too much personally on some of these podcasts is about like, uh, Zai, I always think it's, it's brave when people do, but just like, I think lots and lots of people have experienced the pain of, of miscarriage or of difficulty getting pregnant or losing a child. And people have very different feelings. Like, I mean, there's a way to listen to this story actually mm-hmm. and interpret it as, well, that's a horrible way that you would have aborted yeah, that child yeah. rather than have seven days mm-hmm. of life. But like, I do think that there's a sense of those are not clear cut, straightforward issues that like reasonable people can have slightly different feelings about them, but still come to it with a tremendous amount of compassion and understanding and awareness for how complicated those situations are. Right? Yes. I mean, I had a, a daughter who lived a week and before she was born, because we knew she was going to be born early, we had to decide, do we resuscitate? Because she was a few days short of like, they would mandatory resuscitate her. But um, based on her gestational age, we made that decision. And then she was born and... um they did a scan of her brain and she had a lot of bleeding on her brain, but probably incompatible with a normal life, but we had made the decision. So had she lived, that probably would have haunted me forever. But you know what Mm -hmm. I had, Sarah, by the way, her name was Sarah. I had two things that a lot of people don't have when they're going to make these decisions about whether to have a child that's going to have severe disabilities or even, perhaps a healthy child. I had a husband with a very stable income, so a spouse with a stable income, and the incredible health care that comes with being a member of the military. And I didn't work. We didn't depend on my salary. So we live in a country where health care costs money. We don't have paid parental leave. And that's a huge burden when you think about having a child with a lot of disabilities who will need extensive medical care. And that's not to mention people who find themselves pregnant and don't know how they're going to provide for a child or even work during a pregnancy. So it's a very complicated issue. And I watched the other women's faces as she told that story. And there was so much recognition of the difficulty of the situation, even for people who might, as you point out, they might not agree with with the decision if, you know, if they had said they were going to abort the child because issues were discovered in utero. But we are in a place where we can talk about these things a lot more than, you know, we maybe have a society previously. So in, in that, so many women have a story to share. And when you share that, people can really, they can identify with it. And not to exploit anyone's stories, But I think in sharing them, we see the cruelty of what the Republicans are trying to do. And I'm not even sure what their point is, but they should have to defend it. And the only way they're going to do that is if the Democrats make them defend these positions. Yeah, I think that's right. Because I think the case for choice for a lot of these women is in the complicating factors, Mm -hmm. right? They Mm -hmm. want that room for people yes. to be able to make decisions mm-hmm. within the fact that this is an incredibly complicated and not easy to just yep. define area. And so I think that if the Democrats can sort of make that space for that discussion, and here's one other point I would make. So when it comes to the 2022 in general, I mean, Democrats have just a terrible environment for all kinds of reasons. Inflation, mm-hmm. life just sucks like 30% less across the board because of COVID and everything else. But the one sort of opportunity they have, it's bad for democracy, but sort of good for Democrats, is that there's a bunch of these insane Republicans in these individual races, like insane candidates, Doug Mastriano, Carrie Lake, Herschel Walker. And so I have long contended that the one opportunity really for Democrats is, you know, candidates still matter. And if you can sort of prosecute a case against these Republicans that they are dangerous and far outside the mainstream, that's how you can pick up. Uh, more of these swing voters who are Mm -hmm. repelled by the kind of Trumpiness of all of them. And it seems to me that this is a a really an an accelerant to that theory, right? Where if you can say like, these are people who want 
to take away your ability to make these complicated healthcare yes. decisions. And because they are so extreme, they're insane, you know, and mm-hmm. they, they wouldn't get vaccinated. They would let everybody die from COVID, but they want to take away your right. I think there is a way to make this case and to make it part of an offense strategy. I just, I just don't know that I've seen Democrats capable of marshalling. No, I agree. I completely this agree. This message, no. like in a, yep. in a defined way. That's my concern is even if it, the opportunity is there, is the will, is the desire. And then you have to get everyone to see it, which means saturating in all the ways you can and then get people talking about it so that they in turn discuss it with their friends and family. Because as you often discuss on this podcast, that we're many times siloed and so our news sources, but the place where you can really reach that is through personal relationships because they will sort of transcend the news silos and in regular conversation. So if you can just throw out a couple things here and there, then it might get people to start looking. I don't know if it will, but it has the best chance in this partisan news age. But it's not going to work if you start talking about it in October or September. It needs to start happening way before that. Rachel Vinman, thank you so much for joining us on the Focus Group podcast. Uh, We're going to keep talking to these suburban women because I am pretty interested in whether or not this group is a bit of an outlier or whether if we talk to more groups like this that we'll actually see something taking shape that is different from how I've been thinking about it. But thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate having you on for the discussion. Hope you'll come back. Thank you for having me. And thanks all of you for joining us for another episode of the Focus Group We will catch you guys again next week. and welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark. This year's midterm elections take place on November 8th, which means the 2024 presidential election starts on November 9th. And I know it sounds insane, but it is possible that we end up rerunning the 2020 election with Joe Biden and Donald Trump as the most likely nominees on each side. But Biden will be 81 and Trump 78 on Election Day 2024. If someone's health doesn't cooperate or if members of their party don't cooperate, it could be wide open. Today, you're going to hear what the last few months of our focus groups think about their 2024 options. My guest today is Josh Crashauer, senior national political columnist at the National Journal and friend of The Bulwark. He was supposed to be our guest for the Alabama-Georgia episode, and also I think my guest on something previous, but both of us got COVID each time. And so belatedly, he is here. And I, you know, one of the reasons I really wanted him on the Georgia episodes is Josh and I have like a little argument going on our DMs <laughs> on Twitter about Trump's grip on the party. Uh, you're one of my favorite people to read on this because we don't agree. So tell me, just give me your take real quick besides thank you for being here, but but tell me your take on post-Georgia. Where do you think we stand with Trump's grip on the GOP? Yeah, well, look, I think there's some nuance to the depth of the hold he has on the Republican Party. I mean, I, I've, I've listened to the Focus Group podcast for the last couple months, and it's clear Republican voters like Donald Trump. Most of them support Donald Trump. The question is, do they endorse these crazy election conspiracy theories, and are they willing to, to go along with whatever he says? And I think there was sort of a, a really refreshing outcome in Georgia. And I would add Alabama to that list as well, even though it's a little less of a Trump test. 
because you had candidates that were running against the Trump endorsed candidates that did not indulge the crazy. Then you had in the secretary of state's race in Georgia with Brad Raffensperger, a candidate who actually spent his time talking to Republican voters and explaining the election wasn't stolen in 2020. And he won with over 50 percent of the vote. So I think it's a mixed bag, and I'd include the Alabama Senate result where the more establishment candidate almost got 50% in that primary as well. I, I think it's a very encouraging sign that the crazy doesn't have more than you know maybe a quarter to a third of, of the Republican electorate right now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I, I stipulate on Raffensperger. That was like an unadulterated good sign. And Kemp, you know my side of this argument, which is it's not like any of these people are running as anti-Trump candidates. I mean, Katie Britt, yeah, she's the quote unquote establishment candidate, but she's also ran on like build the wall, which in Alabama seems funny. And I like Katie Britt. Like Katie Britt is my choice to the extent that I have to have a choice in Alabama. I was glad to see her do well. It'll be interesting how she does head to head with Mo Brooks. But I guess, you know, It is my sort of big picture contention that the whole party has moved sort of 10 steps Trumpward and that to the extent that Trump is sort of picking horses here and doing all his endorsements, he may be only endorsing one candidate, but they're all endorsing him. And I think that that bodes poorly for this idea that there's like a going back to the thing that I signed up for. To the extent that I was invested in a future of the Republican Party, this isn't it. So- That's a really important point, Sarah, because you're right that the bar is moving. Like if if you told me five years ago when Trump was first running for president that this is going to be the future of the Republican Party. But, you know, I do think that there there is a difference between being full MAGA, endorsing election conspiracy theories, which is the real red flag going forward, that you have a secretary of state or a bunch of state legislators that, that try to overturn an election. And that is what Trump is running on. That is what these MAGA candidates are are running on. And at least in Georgia, the track record for those candidates was poor. That Hardly any of them got got to the finish line. And, you know, I do think that we're in a period where there are a lot of Republicans playing MAGA. Katie Britt's a great example where she sounds just like any other Trump ally, Trump conservative in her campaign ads, but she was also the head of like the equivalent of the Chamber of Commerce in Alabama. Mitch McConnell's allies are spending millions to help her candidacy in that primary. Like we know that if she's the senator, she's probably going to be more of a traditional Republican if elected, especially compared to Mo Brooks. So I, yes, the bar has moved and I think you, you almost have to be thankful for, for small victories in, in that sense. But I also don't think you can just swat away David Perdue getting less than 25% of the vote was rejected by three out of four Republicans. I don't think anyone would have imagined that a month ago, right? I don't think anyone would have thought Brad Raffensperger would avoid a runoff and and totally demolish the Trump-endorsed congressman in that race. These are very encouraging signs, and it shows that most Republican voters, and I think this is backed up from a lot of the focus group findings, they want to look forward. They don't want to revisit 2020. They may agree with what Trump says a whole lot of the time, but they want to talk about inflation. They want to talk about immigration. They want to talk about crime. They want a a forward-looking figure that's going to talk about the issues that right now mean the most to them. Okay. Well, we're going to litigate this a little further in the back half when we get to the Republicans, but let's just start right now with the Democrats. So, The Democrats in these focus groups are never too jazzed about the prospect of Biden running again in 2024, and they mainly cite his age. But they also, like, have doubts that his moderate views can appeal to enough of a wide swath of the party, which is always weird to me because I think it's the exact opposite uh, in terms of why Biden got elected. But you do have, obviously, this other progressive wing of the party that feels like he's insufficiently left. And then you've got this other wing, the more moderate wing, that thinks he's running too far left. But let's listen to some voters from Texas and swing states, including Pennsylvania, on whether or not Biden should run again in 2024. I was a geriatric social worker, and I love aging. I mean, that is my milieu. But this is not good for our country to have our nominee be 82 years old. Mm -hmm. But I just think it would be a huge mistake. And I like him, but I, I think it'd be a terrible mistake for the party. I think he was perfect for the opportunity of last election with Trump. And it allowed some people that normally wouldn't have voted, you know, to say, OK, because he's a very good man. You know, it's I mean, not I, the 82. That's the problem. It's the 86. Yeah. yeah. I think it's unrealistic for him to run again. He's going to be 80. 
I mean, he's a great candidate. He's doing a great job now, given what he's got. But I, I think he's, I think he's pretty middle of the ground, but we have more of a likely chance of reelecting a Democrat. If we have someone that isn't maybe, maybe isn't as old as him or is able to cater more towards a larger breadth of the Democratic voting population. Okay, so that sounds like kind of a hard no. And these are from the Democrats who like him. And then just before we talk about it, then I also want to play the flippers, the swing voters, the people who went from Trump to Biden, because these guys are even less interested in seeing Biden run again in 2024. It depends on who the Republican candidate is. I probably wouldn't just because you already see signs of his age and health issues coming through. And I don't think he would actually be doing anything. I think he would be even more of a puppet than he is now if he were to serve another term. When you gave me a choice between Biden, who I just think has done an atrocious job and it's only going to get worse over the next you know, year, possible recession, everything else, that there's got to be someone out there. And even as bad as Trump is, it couldn't get this bad. Josh, that is the rare Trump to Biden to Trump voter that you just heard there. It's funny, you know, mostly people don't regret their 2020 vote, but I'm not sure how well Biden would fare in a rematch against Trump. And my good friend, my best friend, Jonathan Last, might be the only person I know who thinks Biden needs to run again, except maybe Joe Biden himself. What do you think about uh, a Biden 2024 run? Yeah, I'm on the Sarah side of that argument. And look, I, the, these focus groups are, are, are very instructive because – I think voters who aren't paying attention obsessively to politics have a better sense of things than us pundits or or, or folks in Washington, including those at the White House that are trying to game out the 2024 election. The one Democrat, the Texas Democrat, who said, it's not the 82 that's the problem, it's the 86, meaning he would be 86 at the end of a second term. Insane. Like, that's nuts. Like The notion that we, we could have an almost 90-year-old president if we reelected Biden, I don't think this is a partisan issue. I, I think there is, especially if a campaign starts to get underway or if people start talking about whether Biden should run or not, the notion of Biden being in his 80s, already there are questions about whether he's up to the job and has the stamina to do the job effectively. You're dealing with a, a likely weak economy, potentially even heading into the 2024 election. Incumbency is a big benefit, generally speaking. But in this case, in this environment, I just don't see the logic of having Biden run again, other than Biden wanting to run again, which it sounds like he may want to, may at least want to keep that conversation going. But like at least some of the Democrats said, I really like Joe Biden. I don't think it's good for the country to have an 82-year-old running for a second term. The, the swing voters were, were basically like he's done a bad job, that the economy is in the tank, inflation's out of control. We liked him. We voted money that voted for him in 2020. We're not voting for him again. And that's a huge signal that that's the notion that Biden would be a, a more electable candidate than if Democrats simply started from scratch. If I'm the Democrats, I would want to reset get someone outside of Washington in 2024 and recognize that Biden did the deed, got Trump out of office, but they're going to, in all likelihood, need to move on. And I just don't think the age factor is something that they can get get away from. That, and I think people underestimate how important it was for Biden's victory in 2020 that there was a pandemic that basically kept him from traveling. Like, he did not have to go out and speak. He didn't have to run a conventional campaign. You know, Donald Trump was always saying, like, he's running from his basement. And Biden was like, yes, I'm running from my basement. And it's fine, right? Because there's a pandemic. And so he was mostly doing virtual things. But like in 2023 and 24, like if he reannounces at the end of 23, he's got to go campaign constantly. And I think that that seems like it would be genuinely tough for him. And like, I thought Biden was absolutely the best candidate in that field to go up against Donald Trump. I spent a lot of money in my other capacity to help push on swing voters through Republican voters against Trump. But I think it is nuts, nuts to think of Biden running again. And I think all of us always expected him to be a one-term president. He really had one job and he did it and great for him. But I got to tell you, what's hard about the Biden thing is You know, you say, okay, go get a governor from somewhere. But here's the thing. They have this problem, right? So Biden's the incumbent, and then he's got a vice president. And the vice president, Kamala Harris, seems like Biden doesn't like her. I mean, or the White House doesn't use her. One of the things you hear in the focus groups all the time is like, where is Kamala Harris? 
And so I want to play what some of these Democrats said about Kamala because you know they're not that excited about her either. Let's listen. I feel like she has really missed the mark on some things um, and um, hasn't come out and spoken much. I, I know she was just at a meeting um, last week, but I'm just like, that's the first I've heard of her in for so long that she was representing our country. And I was just like, ah, you know, she really, I think she is dynamic. And um, yeah, I'd like to see more of her. In my mind, she's not who I had expected I had higher expectations of her in the beginning, and they're falling a little bit, is what I'm trying to say, pretty much. There are several things that concern me, but number one, had she not dropped out of the 2020 primary, she would have lost her own state. That's why she dropped out. When you can't even win your own state's primary, that is not a good sign for a strong candidate. It's a bad, bad sign. So, for that reason alone, I, I really think if she runs in 2024, she should be primary. So this is totally representative. People kind of have two opinions of Kamala on the Dem side. It's either, well, I think I like her, but I never see her, and so I don't know what she's doing, or she can't win and I'm not wild about her. And so my question for you, and this is a thing I think about a lot, what is the mechanics of how a Democrat would run. I can't think of an example where you have an incumbent who's unpopular, you have a vice president who's unpopular, but that the party would not want to leapfrog. Like, how does a Pete Buttigieg or Amy Klobuchar or some just governor, what do they do? They just announce? So uh, the, the days of when the party decides the nomination, even if they want to put their finger on the scale for any one candidate, is pretty much over. So if Biden decided not to run, This wouldn't be like a Hubert Humphrey 1968 situation where where the establishment, you know, rallied behind one candidate, even if Kamala Harris did get the most endorsements and started out in the front runner position. But there's no denying that if you talk to any Democrats, both in the White House and and even more so on Capitol Hill, bets are off with Harris. There's not a lot of confidence and trust in her political aptitude to win uh, a divided primary. And there would be, I mean, if, if Biden didn't run, Harris started out as a front runner, there would be a whole lot of candidates jumping into the race. But I, I think you want someone outside of Washington. My, my, my read of the political environment, if I had to look at my crystal ball, is that you don't want someone connected to the Biden White House. This is going to be seen as a failure or at least the potential to be a failure. And if you want to start from scratch and you're running against Trump or someone like that, you want to get an outsider who's not tainted by the current administration. Well, so like not to belabor this, the mechanics question that I have is this. So my understanding is that Biden is kind of saying to people, well, if Trump runs again, you know, I run again because I'm the only one that can beat him. And I was at the Institute of Politics in Chicago and Jen Psaki was speaking and she was asked the question of whether Biden was going to run again. And she was like, absolutely. He's absolutely going to run again. And so I guess the question is, is do you agree with me that you probably can't announce against an incumbent president? If Joe Biden is acting like he's going to run again, Whitmer couldn't come out and announce that she's going to primary him, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But then what so, so my Well, I think, I think Biden's going to have to make a decision – earlier rather than later, you know, fall, I guess, 2023 uh, at the latest. Like, I, I think there's going to be a push for Biden to show his cards. And, and, and you know, I, I'm not surprised that people around Biden are saying that he's going to run again. I don't think it's right. sure. good for Biden to be seen as a lame duck. So that doesn't surprise me. But I, but I also think there's going to be a moment when if, if there is this critical mass of people that just don't think an 82 year old should be reelected, you'll know early on. If Biden does decide to run, that's the headline for a few weeks, and then the voters have their say. They'll be sort of the early polling of how Biden would do and how he would fare against other candidates, and then you know the game is on. I don't think Biden would clear the field. I certainly think he would get a progressive primary challenger, at the very least, if he ran for re-election. And I do think that if he was not as vibrant or as energetic as, as what a normal candidate would be on the campaign trail, I think there could end up being a public vote of no confidence that could really crater his chances. Okay, just last question on this. Let's say Trump announces that he's going to run again. Biden says, I'm the only one who can beat Trump. He says he's going to run again. Who wins that matchup? Let me first say, I don't believe the conventional wisdom that Biden is the guy that that can beat Trump. I actually think Trump would be very beatable. But I think that actually would demand someone new. Like, I, I think the only one that could lose to Trump is Biden, to be honest. And if you look at the polling now, it somewhat backs it up that, that in a lot of these swing states and in the national polling, 
Biden is losing to Trump, or at the very least, like tied and may not, you know, be able to put a 270 electoral college majority together. But I think Trump has so much baggage, has so much negatives, even in these more encouraging polls, that if you did have a generic Democrat, they probably could, if they ran a good campaign, at least could defeat Trump. So I do not subscribe to this. Biden is the only guy who could beat Trump. That was the case in 2020. I don't think that'll be the case in 2024. I totally agree with you that Biden is not the only candidate who could beat Trump, although I don't agree that he's the only candidate who could lose to Trump, because I think Kamala would also lose to Trump. I think Biden and Harris would be kind of the two worst picks because they would represent the the incumbent administration. Yeah. So one of the things that happens when you do a lot of these focus groups and you talk to a lot of Trump voters and you talk to a lot of Biden voters about 2024, uh, we'll hear the Republicans sound in a bit, but the Republicans have... Both A, they're still enthusiastic about Trump, uh, at least a portion of them. And then for the ones who aren't, they've got a bunch of other people they're interested in seeing. (laughs) But the Democrats, despite their lack of excitement for Biden and Harris, they tend to not have a lot of other like ideas for people who should run. And if they do, they still think that they have inherent weaknesses. Let's listen. I like Buttigieg a lot. I've seen a couple press conferences of his and he does really well. He's got really strong social likability, um, great husband, kids, like these are great things, but I don't know that if he's on top ticket, I don't know that he'll necessarily win, but I mean, I like him. I think there's a lot of people who are very qualified and, and would do a really good job, but I mean, you mentioned unifiers. None of them are like AOC or Kamala Harris or Pete Buttigieg. Uh, I mean, I think they're, brilliant people and are would be extremely qualified but unifying i think they're just too polarizing just because of who they are i don't look at any of them as being extremists i just don't think america's ready for somebody like any one of them to be president i think it's a likability issue you know like as smart and astute as elizabeth warren is she's you know she's intimidating to a lot of people because she's a well-read educated woman who isn't afraid to like tell you to shut the fuck up and you're stupid. Like, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And you love um, that about her, but it's um, going to terrify yeah. the other side. Like Joe was moderate enough to appeal to the other side, the people that realized Trump was not the right choice that they made in the previous election. We have a lot of future leaders. Like I think AOC is phenomenal. I think there may need to be another four year term yeah. before like the country is ready to get on board with her because she's so young, which I hate to say, but it's really a problem that all of our laws are being made by very old white men. Yeah. So part of what's I don't know, I don't know if it's funny about Democrats, but like they're always trying to be really polite. And they don't want to say certain things quite out loud. But like what I always hear them saying, and occasionally they do it, but you can hear them gaming it out, is like, is America ready for a gay guy to be president? I don't think so. Is America ready for a black woman? I'm not sure. Is America ready for a young firebrand progressive like AOC? I don't think so. You know, so like they have certain people that they kind of like, but they don't think any of them can win. Like Elizabeth Warren, like, can you be a educated woman? Like, I don't know that their analysis is particularly wrong. I'm not positive it's for the reasons they think it is. With the exception of Pete, where I do think I'm not positive if I'm right about this or not, but I, I, I am not sure America is ready for a gay man who's as visibly, like, his husband plays such a role. I do sort of wonder about that. I don't have any anything to back it up exactly, but what do you think? So I think the Democratic candidates, the problem that a lot of them would have, and that's, that, that would include Buttigieg, is – you know, I think the most successful candidates are folks that appeal to the more working class side of the party. And, and that includes a lot of African-American voters and Hispanic voters that have, in, in some cases, become independents or have become swing voters in the last few elections. Buttigieg, if you look at his results in the 2020 primary, was a hit with the ascendant part of the Democratic uh, electorate. A lot of suburban women, suburban voters generally, uh, the more affluent part of, of the electorate, whiter voters, more broadly speaking. And I'm not sure if that's enough to win a a Democratic nomination. I think he's very politically skilled, talented. And it is weird how a lot of these voters actually act as their own 
pundits and they're trying to assess electability. I think a lot of these concerns are overwrought, but a lot of these voters tend to have worries or concerns and, and they end up, you know, using that as a reason not to vote for, you know, uh, an openly gay candidate like, like Pete Buttigieg. But I think you, you will see the next Pete Buttigieg in, in 2024. Like there, there will be another Pete Buttigieg that no one's talking about two years before the election and is going to catch fire because they run a good campaign because they, they're younger. They have a message that resonates with Democratic voters of all stripes. I, I don't know who that... Uh, I was going to say, give me names. Give me names. I mean, I, I, I've been bullish on uh, Jared Polis is, is someone yeah. who I think... Now, I, I also think Polis has the same issues as Buttigieg in many ways, but he's a governor and he's an executive and he has some you know more tangible record of, of success. Uh, being an executive is important. And you know, for the record, Polis has told me he's not at all interested in running for president, but he's the kind of profile I think is, is very compelling, especially when you look at a general election matchup. You know, like Gretchen Whitmer, if she wins a tough election in 2022, she's going to get a lot of attention. I, I think there is going to be a mayor or a governor. There are going to be some people that we're not talking about now that catch fire, and maybe they have a little more momentum to get over the finish line that, compared to where Pete was in 2020. You have more optimism about that than most of the Democrats I talk to. Because I would say most of the Democrats have this like sort of panicky feel about them of like, who's the bench? Like, who is it? And I agree with you. I also like Jared Polis. I don't watch him closely enough to know how he would sort of navigate being a gay candidate. The thing about Pete and Chastin is that Chastin's incredibly visible. And Chastin was like a real asset on one level with exactly the kinds of voters that you're talking about, like white suburban. I mean, Pete's like my candidate. Like I would like to see a Pete Buttigieg and white college educated suburban women find Chastin just adorable. But I don't know with a larger swath of voters, like if that doesn't become like a little bit of a liability, but maybe I'm over indexing too. Well, look, and, and the Democrats are going to have other things to worry about, which is there are going to be a lot of progressives that are going to be running. You have, you know, AOC is being talked about. Bernie has not ruled out another campaign, for crying out loud. You have people on the bench in the House that are getting attention for being super progressive. We're going to see big primary fields, I think, on both sides, especially if Trump doesn't run on the Republican side. But it used to be that you had to sort of pass a certain credibility threshold. It's going to be wide open. The party is not going to be able to play much of a curating role. A lot of it's going to have to do whether Biden decides to run or not. But I, I do think that you can, in these days, with a viral video or a moment that, that can capture the public's attention, can really go from no one to becoming a prominent figure in, in a quick amount of time. So I want to turn to the GOP now, and I think that the voices we're going to hear represent the argument that you and I have been having really well, because there's some sound, I think, that supports your thesis and some sound that supports mine. We, we can pick that conversation back up. So let's start with kind of your people, the Trump voters who don't want him to run again. You know, they kind of like Trump, but let's listen. I thought he was wonderful for the country, but... Maybe it would be better if he wasn't president again sometimes. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a problem with him. I didn't have a, I, I'd love me some mean tweets right now. Someone calmer, I think, to uh, make Democrats not hate us. <laughs> I don't know. That's the only thing I can think of because he was so, and I know it was, you know, media manipulation, but he was so hated by the other side that I think that that's not going to go away. It doesn't matter. And so you need, I almost think you need someone like maybe DeSantis. And I really like Trump a lot. I do. I just, I think that the other side is so, you know, just brainwashed into hating him just for no reason other than everyone says he's a racist. The way that everybody handled themselves or the way they behaved when he was president was absolute garbage. The way the Democratic Party handled themselves, the way that it was, it was a circus with uh, the impeachment, knowing that they had nothing. And it was just, I, I don't know if I want to see be put in that type of spotlight again. Uh, if he runs, I will vote for him, no question about it. But I'll say I'd rather not. And the reason is because then four years later, we got to worry about everything again. The fact that he can only legally run for one more term, I'm not a fan of that because I'd rather have someone in office that I can vote for twice. Okay, so those are your people. They're the ones that were like, yeah, I liked him, but look, we don't need to do this again. And and I don't want to mislead people in my analysis. Like that is absolutely about half of every group. I would say that tends to be that about half the group wants to see Trump run again outright. 
and the other half wants to see just somebody new. And, and the thing is, is that this is where I think you being right is also me being right, which is it's not that they don't like Trump. They're just not sure he can win or maybe, you know, I want a candidate who can have eight years, not just four years. And so what did you make of, of the kind of we need somebody new, but I still like him crowd? Yeah, so it feels like these are the people who were watching The Apprentice season six, where the ratings were not quite as good as the first few seasons of The Apprentice when Trump was fresh and new and president and, and, and shaking things up and getting all the media attention. <laughs> but people still were watching season five and season six. And I think you described it really well, Sarah, that that people will say they really – endorsed Trump's policies. They liked his presidency. They thought there was a little too much chaos, a little too much drama. But if he was the nominee, they'd vote for him without a moment's pause again. But if they're given a choice, and you know, I know you, we'll get into the DeSantis factor in, in a little bit, but if you have someone that's plenty Trumpy, where you know people are just you know, a little, little bit more forward-looking, want to kind of see something new going forward, I think that's where Trump's vulnerability within the Republican Party lies, that he's sort of old news, he's litigating old news, and you may have some alternatives that are more forward-looking, talking about issues that are a little more resonant at this point in time. And there are actually some who are just like flat out, no, like we do not need this guy again. They are not dominant in any way, but like they do pop up. So let's hear some of them. A lot of talk, not a lot of results. I mean, the border wall yammered about that till the cows came home and what, five miles built? It, it was just, I wish you would have concentrated on something that was more important. Like a wall isn't going to keep out fentanyl. A wall isn't going to keep out Mexican illegal aliens or whomever is trying to you know, scurry across the border. A wall isn't going to do that. The policies are going to do that. And he didn't enact in any policies. He didn't work with Congress. He didn't try to get laws passed. It, he built a wall. I don't know if any of you have ever been down there. It's a desert. It's just a desert. I mean, a wall in a desert isn't going to do anything. I mean, he had his opportunity for a second term. He didn't get it. So the risk of putting him up there again to potentially lose versus another Republican that may be a stronger opportunity to win, that to me is the is the better option. Trump started out strong. He did. He lived up to his commitments or his pledges or, or his, his campaign promises. But again, he lost his mind. You know, he showed his true colors. There's no way that that dude can be the face of the Republican Party. He's a madman, unfortunately. He was a one-term president. He, he, he needs to stay where he's at. Love this group. Love this group. They're a, they're a minority, I got to say. The ones who are like, he lost his mind. You know, he never did anything. You don't hear that that often, but they're there. Uh, they're the ones looking for somebody new. Just wanted to make sure nobody thought I was keeping anything from them. There are those voters. But we do hear, uh, again, I would say about half of each group, they want him to finish what he started and just get out on the campaign trail. So let's listen to them. Hopefully he's planning himself to run for president and win for the third time. So imagine where we're going to be by 2024, by the time that rolls around. And so I think that the tolerance of the public for his mean tweets or his brash way of doing things is going to be much higher than it was in 2016. And also uh, the fact that you know, they see how how it is if you elect mm -hmm. the other side and how we've lived that. I think that he stands a better chance of not only getting elected, but also getting more of his agenda items done. I think right. people are going to be far more on board with that this time. Uh, there are several men that are conservative. Ron DeSantis is making waves. But my point being, Trump can handle the fear or he can handle everything they throw at him. I don't know that anybody else would stand up to it like that and then give away their salary. That's the other thing. The man worked for nothing for us and took all of that beating all the time, day after day after day. And I don't know who else will take that. Mike DeSantos. I like, I like Senator Cruz. I, I just don't think that, that they have the wherewithal to get it done. Trump's already proven he can get it done. This man was under mortar fire for his entire four years, every day of his presidency. Yeah. Look what he accomplished for us as a country and for all of us individually being That's under fire. What could he do if 
you know, he didn't have all that to deal with and he could just focus on being president. He runs again and he will have 100 percent of my support if he does. All right. This is the crux of my point, is that when you have roughly half the party that are kind of in the nobody but Trump camp, Trump's the only one that can take the corrupt media. He's the only one that really fights. Like, that is a strong position for him to be in going into a Republican primary. I don't disagree that if he runs for president, he starts out as a front runner and he has a pretty rock solid base to start out a campaign. Now, you know, my, my impression from a lot of these Republicans, even the, the biggest Trump supporters of the bunch, is there was not an in-depth awareness of like Ron DeSantis. I think you heard that guy say Ron DeSantos. Um, <laughs> so like you always see former president or, you know, someone who's a big brand name starting out as a front runner two years before the election. And then things change when other candidates run and get in, you know, and I think frankly, the most important implication of these results where Trump is not getting these, these endorsed candidates all through is that it will give someone like Ron DeSantis a reason to run against Trump when he may not have otherwise taken the plunge. Like I think now you have people on the right that may see an opportunity to run against Trump. Doesn't mean they're going to win, but you know, I think the most important dynamic in the Republican primary race is who will run against Trump if he gets in? Will they be scared of him as they've been throughout most of his time as a, as a candidate and, a, and as president? Or will you see someone, you know, in Brian Kemp's style, stand up to Trump, not, not back down and not, not appeal to anti-Trumpers, but to run to essentially to the conservative base and run uh, against Trump on, on those grounds? And rah-rah Trump folks may end up reconsidering once they see a campaign that takes place. If, if there is a campaign that takes place with Trump versus a equally conservative, vibrant candidate, and I think DeSantis is the guy that fits the bill the most. Yeah, let's talk about DeSantis, because if there's one guy that people get excited about as an alternative to Trump, it is the very Trumpy Ron DeSantis. And at least for the voters that we've talked to, they don't actually see DeSantis like as a competitor to him yet. Like they see him as the next generation of Trump, Trump 2.0, which again, I would just add is another reason I don't see Trump losing his grip on the party because what they see in DeSantis is like, oh, this is Trump just like younger. And so like they now crave this sort of combative style that DeSantis has. But let's listen to uh, what these voters have to say about Ron DeSantis. I was coming back from the coast a couple of weekends ago and I saw a bumper sticker on the back of a car that said Trump DeSantis 2024. And yeah. I just, I got a big yeah. kick out of that. Yeah. <laughs> I did live in Florida right before Georgia, actually. And I feel like we living there got the feeling that he might be like the next candidate for the Republican Party. I do feel like Trump and he are very close, especially during COVID. I think that relationship got much stronger. Not as brass as Trump is, but he's very strong. And if you notice that a lot of the Republican governors in the states, they they very well during the pandemic. The Democrats, not so much. Mm -hmm. You know, we were in shutdowns longer and, you know, things like that. And they just, you know, they want, they want to be tyrants over their states. These Democrats do. The, the, the Republicans want everybody to be free, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want is freedom. There is nobody who comes up as often as Ron DeSantis, as an alternative, and I say this a lot, but like the difference between Republican and Democratic groups when you talk about 2024 is that the Democrats don't have a ton of names oftentimes. Like we, we had some sound of people suggesting people, but usually what happens is actually you say, who do you want to see run in 2024? And everyone just kind of looks at you. But you get to the Republican side, and I think it's actually kind of a marvel to have so many people in other states know who the Republican governor of Florida is. And it's not just DeSantis. I mean, people have a lot of names. They say Christy Nome, Tucker Carlson. I mean, they're not good names in my opinion, but they got a lot of names and people that they think that they could get excited about, but they're all kind of like in Trump's shadow. And so they like the idea of kind of a Trump-DeSantis combo. Mm -hmm. But I guess the more important question is really, does DeSantis think he has to be Trump's vice president or does DeSantis feel like he's got enough juice that he could walk in and like take a real shot at Trump and overcome him. What do you think? Yeah, I, I don't think DeSantis would be anyone's number two. I, I think at this point, being the governor of Florida and, and, and his polarizing and, and frankly, you know, a pretty well liked figure in Florida. If you look at the the, the public opinion polls, uh, yeah, I, I think it, it, it's stay in Florida and governor or run for president. And 
if I'm in DeSantis's camp and I'm looking at some of these numbers from Georgia and Alabama and, and, and even even some of the Pennsylvania numbers where you did have a very Trumpy electorate, but you also had some silver linings within within that that those primary results, I would be much more encouraged to take the plunge. I, I think DeSantis is number one aware that you know this is his moment. He's going to have to make a decision in this window, and it's not going to last forever. And, and then when you look at, you know, the Trump endorsee is not faring as well as, as expected. That, that also, I think, would be an incentive for someone like DeSantis to get in. The, the one thing that struck me watching the Republicans react about DeSantis, uh, it seemed like about a half to two thirds of them knew who he was. And the people that knew who he was just really liked him. And, and they said the same things about him. They said about Trump, strong fighter, stand up to the left. The man doesn't care what you think, one of the respondents said. So like a lot of the Republicans who know DeSantis think they're getting a lot of what you get in Trump, but he's a younger, more um, engaging figure at this point in time. And I think he would be a very legitimate challenger to Trump um, if he did decide to run against him in a primary. So I agree with this. I think that DeSantis is the one person who could beat Trump, but I also think Trump has this like freeze the field effect with some candidates, right? So Rubio or Cruz or Nikki Haley, Tim Scott, like there's a bunch of people who are like, if Trump runs, I'm not running. And they've already said that they've come out (laughs) and and Ron DeSantis has conspicuously not made that commitment, which I think, you know, it's funny. Somebody in the group was saying, you know, oh, they like each other so much. And it's actually the reports that I've seen is that it's starting to get kind of frigid um, as Trump sees this young upstart uh, who's made in his image starting to challenge him for his supremacy. I, I, I think you're right that this being his moment probably does weigh on him and he's probably going like, to get reelected. He was elected very narrowly the first time around. And I suspect he's going to crush this time. Yeah, I mean, look, it depends on what his margin is, assuming he wins in, in his reelection this November. But it, that was what Christie used to kind of fuel his presidential bid. He won, a, I think he won 60% of the vote in New Jersey. He won women. He won suburbanites. He, he won with every demographic group. And look, I, p- people like view DeSantis as, as like a, f- a creature of the, of the far right. But his popularity in Florida is a lot broader than I think people realize. And I think he's actually very adept at kind of picking fights that actually are broadly popular when, when you dig into the, the public opinion. Most recently, obviously, the, what Democrats call the Don't Say Gay Bill, you know, the, the, some of these curricular issues in schools. I, I think he is actually hitting on an issue, a wedge issue that often can divide the Democratic Party. So, look, if DeSantis wins over 55 percent of the vote and we look at the exit poll data and he's winning Hispanics, you know, he's doing well with women, doing well with the groups that are not as Trump as you would think, that it would also be a big smoke signal, that, that this is someone who may, might not only look as Trumpy as Trump, but also has the electability advantage, or at least the perceived electability advantage. Yeah, although the the, uh, the point I was going to make, actually, and I, I kind of lost it there, was so he freezes some of these people out, Trump does, but then there's a bunch that he doesn't freeze out. So let's say DeSantis runs, like Chris Christie's going to run, Mike Pence is going to run. This is always, to me, Trump's sticking power, and it's just what we learned from the 2016 election, which is that Trump has enough of a devoted base that if you fracture the rest of the field at all, it's very difficult for them to overcome his dedicated base. And so, you know, what do you make of like these other people who are kicking the tires right now and how that would end up sort of shaping up in a field? Well, you're right, Sarah, that I find it striking that the people, the Republicans that are more interested in running for president, almost all hail from either the anti-Trump wing or, or at least the Trump skeptical wing of the party. If that's the case, not only am I, am I skeptical that someone like Larry Hogan or even Chris Christie in 2024 has the support that would be able to you know take on Trump uh, if, if that was the matchup head to head. But even if they did have, you know, 40 percent of the party, hypothetically, they would be slicing it up amongst each other. You know, there's not a whole lot of coordination or or, or teamwork going on among the folks who are in the part of the party that is not enthusiastic about Donald Trump. Yeah, I mean, I just really remember Chris Christie and Marco Rubio down to the wire crushing each other while Trump kind of was galvanizing this plurality over in his burn it all down lane. And it just seems not only plausible, but, you know, likely that you get another decent sized field and Trump has actually grown the part of the party that's pretty committed to him. And it still seems hard to beat Trump, even with somebody like DeSantis, who could head to head 
absolutely take on Trump, but he will not, the math will not back up a head to head challenge. Don't get me wrong. Trump would be the front runner. It would be a formidable candidate. It's not like he would, he would fall apart just uh, overnight. He, he's got a base of support and he's got name ID and he's a former president. That, that is, that is nothing to sneeze at. I mean, I can speak for myself, but you know, it's easy to underestimate Trump after January 6th. We, we thought Trump's support was fading. Kevin McCarthy, Mitch McConnell seemed to, to think the same thing at the time. And, and clearly he has been resilient and tenacious beyond most conventional expectations. So Trump would be the front runner, but I, I think where I differ is the notion that it's impossible to to beat him. I, I think DeSantis would have a, a pretty decent chance, maybe not the favorite if it was DeSantis versus Trump, but I think someone who is younger and a governor and, and is representing the future, that would be the contrast uh, in which that race would be litigated. And it could be a compelling contrast to even some of the more Trumpy voters in the party. Okay, so before we wrap, I just want you to give me your percentage odds that we end up rerunning 2020 with Biden and Trump. I actually would bet against either Trump or Biden being the nominee. And in fact, I'm not sure if Trump runs even in, in the Republican field, but I mean, I'm more I'm more bullish that Biden is not going to be the nominee than Trump is not going to be the nominee. But yeah, I think people are underestimating the chance that we could have a wide open 2024. It, remi- it frankly reminds me a little bit, even though they're very different candidates. I wrote a column in 2015, just sort of amazed that Jeb Bush and, and Hillary Clinton were the front runners for 2016 at the time when people across parties and and in all the polls wanted change. They didn't want to go back to the dynasties of of past years. And I kind of feel a little bit of the same way with Biden and Trump. We all kind of think it would be crazy to have like two about 80 year olds running against each other, grumpy old men part two, that this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I think something's going to happen along the way where I think voters are going to start paying closer attention and they may want to look more towards the future than play the past. Well, I agree that it sounds bananas to think we would rerun 2020. The problem is, is that I no longer have confidence that the things I think sound insane won't actually happen. But I don't even know how excited to be at the at, at the other options yet either. But Josh, it's been great to work this over with you. This is speculating about 2024 is a vice. And I appreciate you joining me to indulge in that vice. I love being on the show with you, Sarah, and I look forward to talking in the future. Thanks, ma'am. Take care. And thanks to all of you for joining us for another episode of The Focus Group. We will be back next week, and we'll talk to you then. and welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and this week we are talking about the January 6th committee hearings. Now, going into the January 6th hearings, everyone seemed to have the same question. Would the hearings matter? Would they make a difference to voters? Would they change anything or have any electoral impact in 2022? And since nothing else has seemed to really matter in these, you know, six crazy years, the jaded pundit class seemed to think that the answer was no, Uh, sort of including me. I mean, of course, I think it matters for posterity, but I do a lot of focus groups, you may have noticed, and January 6th has been uh, what I would call a low salience issue for voters these last 18 months. There's no doubt that voters care more about issues they feel are directly impacting their lives, like gas prices, inflation, COVID, supply chain. If you've been listening to this podcast, you've heard that. And yet... And yet, after five hearings, something does seem to be happening. Is it possible that these hearings are going to matter in a material way beyond just the historical record? To discuss this today, I'm joined by my pal and colleague, the Bulwark's own Amanda Carpenter, who has followed the January 6th committee hearings for us at the Bulwark. And since the beginning, she's become kind of like our resident expert. Amanda, how are you? Hey, I'm great. Super excited to be here. Finally getting the inside look at the focus groups. But man, I want to ask you so many questions because I'm excited to talk about what we learn from these focus groups. But you've seen the trajectory of these people over time. And so I am just hoping to hear from you as much as you can possibly tell us about what you've learned from these people over time as well. 
Oh, well, if you want to interview me, I'm like super cool with that. I have many, many thoughts. <laughs> but before we even get into that, you and I, we just finished watching this fifth hearing. Yeah. And holy smokes. So listen, by the time people hear this, there will have been lots of punditry about it. So I, I only want to belabor it so much. But like, I got to know, tell me what you thought of the hearing we just watched. I mean, even though I followed this incredibly closely, just getting a firsthand look of how Trump deliberately and relentlessly battered officials at the Department of Justice in pursuit of finding anyone who would give a shred of credibility to his wildest conspiracy theories, it was stunning. We knew it was bad. But just listening to Jeffrey Rosen and Donahue talk about this two-hour-plus meeting on the early days of January where they had to stand off against the president, threatening to resign if he made Jeffrey Clark the attorney general who was going to go through and uh, issue a letter to the state of Georgia asking them to hold a special session to appoint alternate slate of electors. It just is wild. And so, you know, this is a little hard to track. I don't know how it's going to filter down. But the idea that there were members of Congress seeking pardons for rejecting the electoral votes in Pennsylvania and Arizona, I have a feeling that's going to stick around for a while. And also, the hearings aren't ending this month. We thought it would be ending next week. The committee says they're taking this into the summer. They're getting more evidence every day. And so as much as you know, maybe some Trump voters want this to go away. It's not. They have been really good, I got to say, at kind of creating the drama. And so they tell us at the beginning of the hearing that at the end of the hearing, they're going to tell us which Republican <laughs> members of Congress, you know, were the ones who went and sought pardons. And it's always the ones you suspect, Amanda. <laughs> I get Mo Brooks, Matt Gates, Andy Biggs, Perry, I forget his first name, from Pennsylvania. He's actually the congressman from my home district. Louis Gohmert, of course. It was a little unclear whether Jim Jordan was seeking a pardon or was just like checking in to see if they were going to go ahead and do the pardons. But got to say, a uh, previous podcast guest, Adam Kinzinger, was excellent today. Masterful. So good. And he made the point, uh, it may seem obvious, but why does one seek blanket pardons? It was like, you've got to pardon us and just, it's got to cover absolutely everything. But you know what? You have to make those basic points. And sometimes that is missing. He said at the end it needed to be said. He also made the point in the beginning that it was strange that Donald Trump was willing to go through three attorneys general in the final days of his presidency, which I sort of knew, but actually wasn't something I'd ever heard distilled like that. But I mean, think about that. In the last three weeks of his presidency, he went through Barr, he was going to go through Rosen, and then he was going to have Clark. I mean, that just shows how desperate not only Trump was, but the fact that he was running the show. I've talked with people at the committee previously and, and kind of mentioned the fact that you guys are doing a really good job talking about how Trump didn't listen to the right advice. But the messaging should be stronger in that he was looking for people who would tell him what he wanted to hear. It wasn't that he just wasn't being advised correctly. He sought out people who would do what he said. And so that led him to seeking counsel from like the random EPA lawyer in Sydney, the Kraken Powell. That's how you end up with people like that. But that's just a finer point on the messaging that I think would help communicate to these voters. Oh, my God. The line where one of the lawyers, I think it was Donahue, said to Jeffrey Clark, we'll call you if there's an oil spill. Otherwise, like, go sit in your office. The thing that Kinzinger said is the only reason you seek a pardon is because you think you committed a crime. But what is amazing, what is amazing is, like, there's all these people who are poo-pooing, you know, Brit Hume or whatever, who are saying – you know, this was such a dumb attempt and, you know, everybody stood up. It took like a threat of mass resignation. I mean, one of the things that was that was Hundreds. that was stunning that came out in this hearing was that the White House had already promoted Clark to acting AG. He was being named in the call logs as acting AG Jeffrey Clark, and the only thing that stopped it was the threat of mass resignations. Mhm. Mm and it was precisely the reason that Jeffrey Clark was going to become AG, Trump was going to make him AG, was to get that letter sent out to the states that Trump lost from the Department of Justice 
saying, go ahead and have a special session, go ahead and declare alternate electors. That was the end game here. And I think that ties into what happened on January 6th. We're going to see more of that developed. But just on the pardon point, because I already see this happening with a lot of reporters, they're acting like it was only four or five members of Congress that sought pardons. Yes, that request was what was relayed by Meadows A. Cassidy Hutchinson. But if you look at the letter that Mo Brooks sent, he was asking for pardons for every Republican member who voted to reject electoral college votes in Pennsylvania and Arizona. That is a much bigger universe of people. That says that he thought there was a possibility or he knew there was something criminal about rejecting those votes. And I think that- Refusing to certify the election. Yes. And so I think that expands the universe uh, of people who have things to answer for. Okay. Uh, We could talk about this forever because there's so much to unpack from here. But- Going into these hearings, I don't know if you were doing the same thing I was, but I was answering a lot of questions from reporters on this sort of, is it going to matter? Are our voters going to watch? Are they going to care? Is it going to change anything? What did you think before this started? And has your opinion changed after watching the hearings? Well, I think like you, I agreed it's something that needed to be done. It was the right thing to do. But I also believe that once you start pushing things into action, you create your own destiny a little bit. And we're seeing that now, right? Because the hearings took place, you are seeing a documentarian come forward and saying, you know what? I have 11 hours of raw footage that doesn't line up with what I've seen aired. You have other people coming forward. And so it kind of creates this momentum where you can do a lot more. We thought the hearings were going to end in June. They will now go into the summer. And so suddenly, because you took those steps in the direction of, one, doing the right thing, but also being willing to see where it would go, you have a much bigger chance of making a difference. But what about with voters? Like, did you think that voters would care? I think it'd be really difficult to get them to care. And just in looking at, like, the conservative influencers, opinion leaders at the Wall Street Journal, for example. Peggy Noonan had a column, I think, last weekend just saying, you know, the hearings do kind of show that Trump is unfit and he can't win again. There was a lot of throat clearing about why Nancy Pelosi is bad. The Democrats are running a partisan investigation. But it kind of came to the conclusion that, boy, don't you think we shouldn't do this again? And I think you're seeing more of that, which if the hearings were not going on, if we all moved on from January 6th, I don't think people would have a reason to rethink that. They wouldn't have a reason to say that. You have other conservatives writing about how Trump ripped a lot of his voters off with that $250 million legal defense fund that didn't exist. And sure, those conservative writer influencers were never maybe wild about Trump, but they have a reason to revisit and write about it again and remind the voters of, you know what, maybe this wasn't so great. So I think this is really right. I mean, there's there's multiple audiences for this, and there's there's sort of the the average voter who's only so tuned in. But the sort of elite and the literati on the right, the way these hearings have been prosecuted in terms of bringing out these heavyweight conservatives. I mean, if you're not in conservative legal circles, you may not know Michael Ludig. Mm-hmm. He called Donald Trump and his party a clear and present danger to democracy. Like, that is the kind of thing that sends reverberations through the sort of the Federalist Society conservative legal community. And I think for a lot of the conservative punditocracy who has, you know, even if you're right, they didn't go all in for Trump. They've carried a lot of water for him. They do a lot of blocking and tackling and, oh, but the Democrats are worse. Like, these hearings are like just a gut punch. And they're awfully quiet on most of the points, if not actually upfront about how damning it is. And so so I think for that audience, it is making a difference and it is reminding people like, oh my God, do we want to do this again? Like, I don't want to carry water for this guy again. So I think that's important. But we've been trying to keep up with the hearings and talk to voters as they're going on because I was dubious that it would matter to average voters. I went through two impeachment hearings where I was doing focus groups. I have never found people to care particularly. Um, but... Uh, so we, so both the groups are Trump voter groups. Uh, their groups are a little different. Um, one is a group that is 2016 Trump, 
2020 Trump and just full, full MAGA. The second group is a little softer in the sense that they're what we're going to call reverse flippers. We're going to do a whole episode about this down the road. So there are people who didn't vote for Trump in 16. Now, they didn't necessarily vote for Hillary Clinton, like one or two people did, but mostly they went third party or they opted out, but then were persuaded by 2020 to vote for Trump. And both groups sounded pretty similar, pretty Trumpy. One of these was the the week after uh, the first hearing. The other one was last week. And so- um, Can I ask one question? Do you know from the reverse flippers why they made the transition to voting for Trump in 2020, just broadly? Oh, yeah. Sure. That was the whole conversation. And it, it was like they thought what he was doing was great. They thought he was doing a really good job. It's interesting. I wanted to explore it because obviously we've spent a lot of time with Trump to Biden voters, talked to a lot of different groups in that category. And so one of it, for a lot of them, especially the people who dished out and went third party, they didn't think he was a real conservative. <laughs> um, but then after seeing him, you know, enact policies that they liked, they were persuaded that he was good. And, and many of them became enthusiastic supporters of his. There was one or two who had like more reservations. But yeah, no, they they were persuaded by they they thought Trump was doing a good job. We know that that was a, a block of people because a lot more people voted for Trump in twenty than did in sixteen. wasn't enough to beat Biden, but a lot more people did, millions, millions more. So I want to play some of the tape from these Trump voters about how they were thinking about the January sixth hearings, and I think I would just set it up by saying. There will be a thing that is consuming Washington. Most recently, this happened with the Kevin McCarthy tapes. A thing that is consuming Washington. And then I will walk into a focus group and I will say, what do you think about the McCarthy tapes? And they'll say, what are you talking about? I have no idea. Like everybody, like no one will have any idea what I'm talking about. And it's always really grounding for me to know that voters oftentimes are just not paying attention to the stuff that you and I are paying attention to. But in this case, almost everybody knew about the hearings, and had even watched some of them. So let's listen. I look at it as this is the last right stack like they had in Germany in the 1930s. They needed that to more secure their politics and their way of life. And now they've got something to distract themselves with and try to villainize other people. Uh, force their beliefs upon them, and I just couldn't watch it. I think I made it about a half hour. I, I thought that things were too dramatized, and I, I just couldn't stand the way they were trying to throw Trump and everybody under the bus. And it's all edited anyway, so I can't be bothered with it. Yeah, it's all made for TV. That's it. The minute they say edited, I don't watch. For me, as soon as I heard they hired the guy from ABC that buried the Epstein thing, had lost me forever. It's called Wag the Dog. Yeah, exactly. It's Wag the Dog again. So I don't, yeah, no, 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 no. During COVID and all the riots that went on, there were myriads of people killed and police were made to be horrible. And they were all proclaiming their democraticness. So... One time where it happened to be a mostly Republican gathering, I understand somebody got killed. I get that. And I'm not minimizing that in any way. But what about the other, how many, what, 50 different people through the different riots and stuff that were killed? None of that was taken to this extreme. None of that was publicized in a manner that it was a horrible, horrible thing. I mean, they were still looking at those people as, yay, way to go. And the one time it happened to be semi-Republican, then all of a sudden it was a horrible thing. I tell you, it would not be a conversation about January 6th in a Trump voter group if there wasn't like a really solid what about on the, uh, on the Black Lives Matter stuff. But they were all aware of it. Like they were mad about it. They didn't like it. But to me, this was actually really significant, the fact that they were kind of tuned in and sort of forming opinions about why it was all BS. But that, to me, is clearing a certain bar because oftentimes it's just not breaking through at all. So I think on the on the breaking through scale, actually something meaningful is happening here. What do you think? Yes, they absolutely know about it. And so right now, you know, I'm taking off my analysis of the January 6 hearings and why, you know, I think it's important we pay attention. Now just going into political mode because if I were trying to think about how to message to these kinds of voters, I look at them 
and say they are very defensive, right? Uh They don't want to hear about it. They want to shut it down. They're aware of it. And they're clearly uncomfortable by what's happening. Why is that? Because they voted for Trump. And by some degree, whether they acknowledge it or not, I think they feel some degree of responsibility for what happened. And so when you have giant congressional hearings about the election, there's like some trigger inside there of responsibility. You know, I've had this in conversations with Trump voters in my family, and it's almost just like I want to push it away. Like, don't talk about it. It's happening. It should be over. It's time to move on. And then what about, what about, what about? Because if you're saying that Trump did this really horrible thing and you voted for Trump, are you kind of bad too? You know, that's where their mind sort of goes. And maybe that is where the conversation goes sometimes. And so for anyone that wants to communicate with these voters and talk about January 6th in a persuasive way, that's a really difficult dance that has to be executed. Yeah. I think that psychological analysis is is pretty pretty bang on. Um, I was a little surprised, you know. Usually, you get like it was actually a Black Lives Matter Antifa false flag. Like, it, I'm not sure it was Trump voters or it's just people trying to make Trump look bad or trying to make Republicans look bad. Because I've done so many focus groups where I ask about January 6th. I mean, just about in the Trump focus groups, I ask about it every time and have for the last you know 18 months or so. But it was interesting to me that it wasn't in there. Mm-hmm. Um, now. You're right to this idea of moving on. That was the thing in the focus groups. Both of them, they all wanted to move on. Didn't want to talk about it anymore. And that's because nobody wants to talk about a thing that was shameful, that they think makes them look bad and potentially even reflects poorly on their own choices. But there is one thing about these groups that was just completely different and that I am willing to make a little bit of a pronouncement on. And it is that... I have done dozens and dozens of Trump voting focus groups since January 6th. It is as predictable as anything that about half the people in the focus group will want Trump to run again in 2024. There are just always people who say he was a fantastic president. We got to do a revenge tour. We need him back. There's nobody who can take on the left like him. In both of these focus groups, for the first time ever, I had two focus groups back to back where not a single person thought Donald Trump should run again. Let's listen to them. Nothing has changed. He is still alienating people every single day. And that was my big problem with him in 2016 is everyone said, oh, give him a break. He's from New York. He comes from construction. And that's just how they talk. Well, I'm sorry. I am the average woman in America and I don't allow anyone to speak to me that way. I don't care what kind of position you're from, where you're from in the country. I talk to people from all over the world and I expect respect. And he did not deliver that. And I think because he continued to use that language that alienated what felt like the majority of women and they're not going to turn out to vote for him. I think the other thing that's been kind of overshadowing is they keep talking about the results of the election. And I feel like even when he's doing his roadshow, he keeps bringing that up like it's, you know, a grudge. You know, I know right now, you know, with Congress, they're doing a hearing on all that, too. But I just feel like we've moved past that. So that's the other thing. It's like can't let the past go. I think in the Republican Party there are other better candidates that should run. And I feel like if Trump running, it will just dilute and just put a bad taste in people's mouth. Now, if he wants to go run independent, like, sure, whatever, go do your thing, because I guess you can. But the Republican Party should move on, turn the page and go focus on a better candidate because there are better candidates out there. So I should mention, those are the reverse flippers, people who didn't vote for Trump in 16, uh, but did vote for him in 2020. Now, when I say that in previous groups, oftentimes there's about half the group that wants Trump to run again, and there's the other half that kind of is like, I don't know, there's other people, you know, need some new blood. This group was very much there, and they, I, I want to play a, a section of sort of the alternatives that they were interested in. I think Rubio could win. I just think 
Trump will campaign and complain about 2020 so much. I think a moderate Republican that's trying to move on will win. And I just think he's alienated enough of suburbia that he can't. I just, I don't think he's electable at this point. Find someone else. We can find somebody else that's better. I agree with all the comments have been made so far. Um, not electable. I think he's upset the country. That's why we have what's going on. He really rattled this country. I tell you, man, the guy really shook things up, man, <laughs> for better or worse. There's some uh, young superstars, I think, uh, waiting to break out uh, out of the Trump shadow so they could claim their time in the spotlight. Ron DeSantis, I, I mean, I, I don't know how electable he is to you guys. I think there's a possibility there uh, if he got his platform together. But uh, there's some other people out there. Absolutely. So here's my theory, and I want you to tell me what you think about this theory. It's not that I think any of these voters are watching the January 6th hearings and that it's persuading them. But I do think it is possible that by raising the salience of January 6th, by people being exhausted with talking about it, and with Trump continuing to bang on about the stolen election, that more and more people are just starting to kind of flag on him. They want to look forward and say, okay, you know, who else could run? And I've heard lots of people make this point, the ones who who are not as uh, keen on him running again, this idea of electability, right? That he won't do well with women. People aren't going to vote for this guy again. Now, I was listening to you on Hacks on Tap, <laughs> and you were making a spirited case <laughs> that, like, this is Trump's. It's Trump's in 2024 if he wants it. So does listening to any of this change your thoughts on that? I would say at this moment in time, it is Trump's nomination to have because no one is directly challenging him, right? So you have to have a choice. That's the conversation for another day. But should someone want to challenge him, I think the January 6th committee's work is making that case a lot easier to make to these voters who are uncomfortable. Uh, I, I think your theory is exactly right. They're not watching the hearings. They don't like it. But it's like they're sitting in a chair and every time the subject comes up, it's like a little electric jolt. Suddenly that chair isn't so comfortable anymore. It's not easy to keep sitting there and pretending like everything is okay around them. For some reason, they want to get up and move on at this point. And I find it really interesting how they're kind of even casting the reason why they're willing to maybe look at someone else, sort of blaming that on someone else. They're saying things like, well, he's too divisive. He can't unite the country because other people are so upset. You know, it's just a really interesting thing that humans do <laughs> to always protect their own ego, almost at, at, at every choice, you know, anytime they're asked. I don't think people realize they're doing it, but because the January 6th committee is making them uncomfortable with their choice of supporting Trump, suddenly they're very eager to start looking at other people. I think that's right. I think the ambient noise of this, and, and I will say, I'm not positive how sticky it is. Like, I have seen this phenomenon before when, when sort of the bad stuff kind of rises to the surface and people get a little uncomfortable, but then it gets more distance and, you know, people drift back to Trump. Like there was, you know, a period of time when he said very fine people on both sides. Like we've seen this a bunch of times where kind of people move away from him and then they just drift back. And so I reserve the right to suggest that that's happening. But I have been, I have been almost uniquely skeptical <laughs> of the idea that, that Donald Trump is losing his grip on the Republican Party. I have been, you know, and lots of people have been pushing that narrative. I had that fight with Josh Krashauer on the episode <laughs> previous. Um, and so I have been totally resistant to that analysis. And the reason is, is because if you go through dozens and dozens of groups and about half say that they want Trump to run again, you're like, okay, well, <laughs> I don't know how you get around that. Like, yeah, some people might run against him, but that's a big chunk of the party, the people that are enthusiastic about him. And obviously I have my whole point about how just thoroughly magified the entire party is, which is why we keep having this discussion, because everybody's like, well, Georgia, Trump is losing his grip on the party. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, that's not what's happening here, guys. But, but I would never say that just because something happened in two focus groups that like, oh, well, this is religion now. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that I've done so many other ones where it's always been consistent 
in a different way to suddenly have in the context of the hearings two where no one wants him to run again and almost sort of emphatically so, mm-hmm. I genuinely think that it is making a difference. I think it matters. Yeah. The question is whether it sticks. Is this the beginning of something Is it something that Democrats or possibly a Republican challenger would be willing to continue to talk to voters about? And I think that's where it gets really tricky. Maybe this is a lesson that candidates like Brian Kemp have already learned, right? Like you don't alienate the Trump base. You just sort of keep pushing the policies and move on. Because very few people are going to say, oh, my gosh, I was so wrong. You've made me see the error of my ways in supporting Trump. I'll never do it again. I'm so sorry. I beg you for forgive. Like, that doesn't happen. People just want to paper over the bad history. Give me a new good looking guy or gal and let's move on to the next. That is how people generally operate, and which is probably why Brian Kemp was able to execute such a commanding win. So now we're going to listen to a couple of last clips here from some of the MAGA 16 and 20 voters, uh, MAGA diehards, about why they don't want to see Trump run again. I think it's time to move on. I like what he did. I, I like what he changed. I just think it's probably spent. And now it's time to find someone else who has similar ideas. And uh, find someone who is more of a businessman and a little less politician. We're so split right now. We don't need to be polarized anymore. You know, this idiot in the White House now, oh, I'm going to bring the country together. We need somebody now that's going to do that. And it's got to come from the right side. Okay, so we followed up on this question and said, who do you most want to see run in 2024? Who do you think the top answer was? I mean, it's got to be Ron DeSantis. I'm in Florida right now. I've been talking to like anybody who will give me an opinion on it. That is my offering. It is indeed Ron DeSantis. And with a bullet, it is Ron DeSantis. Yeah. Uh, and not just in these focus groups, but in the last, I don't know, 10 months of focus groups. He is the number one answer. And I, I got to tell you how unusual it is for a voter in Pennsylvania to know who the governor of Florida <laughs> is. Thank you, Fox News. Uh, Well, you know, Ron DeSantis, similar to Trump, has a low cunning or potentially in Trump's case, it was a low cunning. And in in DeSantis's case, maybe it's a higher cunning. He really understands how to leverage culture wars, how to leverage, you know, the combative style of politics that Trump kind of brought into vogue. And he's doing it in a younger, fresher, newer package. And one of the things these voters say all the time that I think is such a, it's a good point, but one I wouldn't quite have thought of, but you could see from a Republican voter standpoint why they would. They'll say, well, with Trump, you can only get four years. Yep. But with DeSantis or a new candidate, you could get eight. (laughs) They're thinking on this one. (laughs) They (laughs) are. They have have theories. And I really want to talk this through with you. I want to spend some time on it because you guys were talking a little bit on Hacks on Tap. And there was one point that I thought you guys missed. I do think Ron DeSantis is going to run, and I think he's going to challenge Trump. I think anybody who's advising him is going to make the point that a lot of politicians miss their moment. Yep. Uh, Chris Christie missed his moment, and that, like, this is Ron DeSantis's, and he can say, look, I've loved Donald Trump. I am in his image, but you could get me for eight years, and I don't have all the baggage, and I'm here to fight for you. And I think Ron DeSantis is just the sort of younger, fresher version of Trump. And you can see how that would be attractive. However, let me throw this at you. This is the thing I thought you guys didn't talk about on Hacks on Tell me. (laughs) There's a unique reason that Donald Trump has captured the party that is different from any other Republican. And I think it's the thing that keeps Republicans up at night. Wait, what do you think it is? That he likes to chew up and spit out Republicans for fun. And he hasn't done that to Ron DeSantis (laughs) yet. And we'll have to see what that looks like. So that's close, but it's it's not (laughs) not quite it. But here's what it is. It is that Donald Trump, do you remember very briefly, I can't remember when it was, but there was this brief moment when there was like a rumor that Donald Trump was going to start his own party. Oh, yeah. And Ryan's Priebus went up to Trump Tower and begged him to stay. And they signed that letter saying, I will not leave the Republican Party, which actually ended up being like death pact that I guess did in the RNC. So here's what I think is unique about Trump, but it's to your point. 
he does not care about the Republican Party. Not one little bit. Correct. And he would happily burn the whole thing down and give it to a Democrat and walk with his, let's say it's dwindling. Let's say a lot of people are moving on and Ron DeSantis is interesting. But there's still that hardcore 25% or 30% of people who are never going to let Trump go. What stops him from running as an independent if he loses the Republican primary? Nothing. Nothing. And so with that, like if you're the Republicans – and you know that Trump is just crazy enough to do it. It's not like he's some other Republican who's like, oh, well, I lost the primary. I'm going to endorse the person who won. And, you know, I'm going to hope for a cabinet position or I'm going to be an elder statesman or whatever. That, to me, is his Trump card. Well, yeah. And that's also why the calculation for Ron DeSantis is probably more difficult than we think it is to make. Right. Because, yeah, maybe he could primary Trump, even though I have doubts about whether Trump's RNC under the current tenure of Ronna Romney McDaniel would engineer a competitive primary for Trump in the key swing states. Like, I think that is an open question. But let's say Ron DeSantis gets it. What stops Trump from taking it away later? I mean, this is not an easy field for him to win. Yes, I think Ron DeSantis could easily win a general election against Biden, but that's if Trump stays out of it. And as you point out, nothing in Trump's history speaks to the fact that he would willingly step aside, even if beat by Ron DeSantis, and support the Republican nominee. And so why wouldn't Ron wait another four? He's a young man. He could be the governor of Florida for another four years, stay popular, let Trump burn out, and then go on for president later. I agree with you. The timing is now, but it's not as easy as people think. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think that I could look at these January 6th hearings and the sort of waning appetite among voters for Trump's backward-looking stuff. Because I do think people are really mad about Biden, right? And they're like, mm -hmm. I want somebody to talk about Biden. I want them to say he's like mentally compromised and to say Kamala Harris is an idiot. And I want it, that would be fun for me. And I want, you know, Trump to tell jokes about that. I don't want to sit here and listen to him, you know, whine about losing this election, you know, again. Like, he's getting boring to people. Like yeah. he's just and, – and so I could see a world in which I could start to make a real case. Maybe he is – you know, the, people are starting to slide away from him a little bit. These hearings are mattering. He is losing his grip. And then I think, but that crazy son of a bitch, if he wanted to do it, he could destroy any Republican's chance. Like, well, he's alive and still kicking. He could He could really mess with him. And it's always been more important to him to own the Republican Party than it has been to defeat Democrats. Mm -hmm. And I think your point about it's complicated, more complicated than people think, is exactly right. So just really quickly, though, but I do want to say some of the other names that came up in the focus groups that are interesting. So I had sort of poo-pooed the idea that Mike Pompeo was somebody who had gained traction. But for people who are watching a lot of Fox News, Mike Pompeo comes up now. It's still not really Nikki Haley. It's still never Mike Pence. Um, but <laughs> what did they say about Mike Pence this time? Still just, I heard it, but I want uh, you to call it. I heard yeah, milk toast. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> milk toast. Yeah, yeah. They just think he's boring. And the, the thing, the, this has always been my thing for Mike Pence is if you ask the group of the other flippers, the ones who, who voted for Trump but then went to Biden, right, who you would think these are the people that Trump is driving away, you know, Mike Pence would be somebody maybe who appeals to them, but he's not because they think that he stood by Trump and was overly loyal and was a lapdog and so they don't like him. But then the real Trumpy people don't like him either because they think he was insufficiently loyal to Trump. And so like, I just don't see who Mike Pence thinks his constituency is. Yeah, I, I have no clue. I mean, it just seems very bizarre to me. And well, I, I will say, I, I think it's a very inside the beltway, former conservative network that is promoting him and hoping he will reclaim the mantle as the one true conservative. I, I just think it's a very inside the beltway creation of like former heritage staffers. <laughs> I think that's exactly who he appeals to. <laughs> uh, and like, you know, he's got, of course, he's got a donor network and everything else. But man, and I just don't know how he manages the Trump thing. I mean, imagine him on a debate stage with Donald Trump. Donald Trump would own him so hard. 
Like, oh my just, I'm just trying just, to just imagine. humiliate him. Yeah, would I want yeah. to see that or would I not? Because it's so strange how Mike Pence just continues to hide out on this question. Um, where he just says a couple things about January 6th and then runs away. I mean, the, the day, I just have to get off, this off my chance. The day that the January 6th committee did their, like, Pence plot day, where they talked endlessly about Mike Pence, what a hero he was, and how he resisted this effort and just, you know, heap praise upon him. Mike Pence was in Ohio at an oil and gas roundtable with Mike DeWine. It, it blows my mind. It's like here you have this opportunity to really establish your place in history as a man that saved democracy, even though, you know, I personally put a lot of question marks on that. And he doesn't take it. So to me, it's just it's a weirdly lost opportunity for him that I do not understand. You also made a point that I loved on Hacks last night. <laughs> uh, where where you were like, every time Trump speaks, Pence has to like go into hiding because, you know, Trump's still out there blasting him and yeah. and fomenting violence against him. And so like, he has to make himself actually scarce, <laughs> uh, yeah, which I think and freedom. doesn't bode well. <laughs> yeah, it was at the Faith and Freedom Coalition meeting in uh, Nashville last week where Pence was like a headliner last year. I mean, this is his audience. It's all evangelical Christians, you know, people that like to have the prayer breakfast and do the pro-life groups. I mean, this is like Mike Pence central. But instead, Donald Trump is standing there talking about how he was weak, didn't have the courage to do what needed to be done. And oh, by the way, should I decide to become president again? Should I decide? I'm thinking very seriously about pardoning the rioters who tried to kill Mike Pence. It's just wild. And so Mike Pence is then somewhere he had a scheduling conflict. I think he's going to have a lot of those um, for the next, <laughs> you know, through the midterms and the next presidential election. Yeah. I mean, I also, I got to tell you, we saw the beginnings of this with the idea that nobody wants a Bush anymore. Nobody wanted another Clinton. And and even more so, the number one thing that people want is somebody new. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because Mike Pompeo, I'm sort of like, why would anybody like Mike Pompeo? Oh, but, I get it. I get it. Former yeah, Secretary of State, he kind of looks the part. He looks tough. He's a West Point graduate. You know, before I started learning about the weird, like, Madison dinners he was doing to try to raise his profile for probably his future presidential run, I, I thought he was good. You know, I was actually grateful he took a job in the administration because I initially thought, okay, there's somebody who will maintain the guardrails. But then as soon as he got in there, he started entertaining, you know, meetings from conspiracy theorists about, I can't even remember, I think this had to do with Russia and just really enabling those tendencies from Trump. And so I had doubts about him there. But initially, oh, I think he has a very good look for voters from the Midwest. I, I can totally see it. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of personally find him disqualified for how he handled Trump and, and also how he's been on Russia, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, this which has just been uh, atrocious. But I guess in the pantheon of terribleness of people we might see as an alternative to Trump, uh, I guess maybe he's one of the least bad ones. But speaking of terrible people that come up sometimes, huh. it's funny. There's a guy in there from Florida who mentioned Rubio. That might be the first time I've ever heard Rubio's name come up. But you know who comes up actually more and more often is uh, your old boss, Ted Cruz. Oh, that's kind of surprising to me, actually. I mean, Ted, he's always kept his profile around, but I'm surprised that they'd be willing to give him another shot. He did come in second at the last time, so it's not completely crazy. It's why he'll probably run again if anybody can figure out a way to run without challenging Trump. But can we just go back to the focus group for the last oh, yeah, sound sure. bites that you played for a second? Because when they're saying... You know, they're looking at other people. They're upset. You know, they want somebody who can unite people. All I hear is pain, right? They're all sort of pained at the idea of having to do Trump one more time. They won't admit it. But the fact that people didn't want him to run again, as you point out, is a, is a really, really big deal. And so there is political pain associated with Trump that they are expressing even though they're not explicitly telling you so. I agree with this so much. And it, it is important with the focus groups. I think something I've come to sort of believe is that there's a lot you can learn from things that people don't say. So mm -hmm. I'll give you one example that I always think about is um, I had done a bunch of focus groups in Ohio going into the, the Republican primary, and uh, nobody ever liked J.D. Vance much. And then um, you know Trump endorsed him, and we did a focus group in Ohio, 
And all of the people in the focus group were asking them, like, well, does, does Trump's endorsement matter? And they were all saying no. You know, I think for myself and and they were even kind of seeing Trump clearly saying, you know, he's just he's vindictive and he's just doing these endorsements, you know, for people who he thinks is going to win. It's about mm -hmm. him and it's about punishing people. Smart. And yet, <laughs> and yet, they were very J.D. Vance friendly. Yeah. Very J.D. Vance friendly. They all liked him the most. And I thought none of them said anything about it having involving Trump's endorsement. They would have eschewed the idea that Trump's endorsement mattered. But it felt to me very much like uh, Trump's endorsement mattered that it had elevated J.D. Vance and just made him more palatable to this group because they were all for him suddenly. it was um, I, We did a whole episode about it. And so I, I think you're really on to something, and especially when it comes to Trump, where I think it's too much to believe that, yeah, people are going to want to like denounce him or – because they don't. They want somebody in his image. They want some. I think Pompeo is popular in part because he was in Trump's orbit. You know, They want kind of a star from that world. Another name that comes up a lot is Christy Nome. Uh, who, you know, that's like another Trump figure. Do they ever say Elise Stefanik? No. That's interesting because I've been waiting for her to pop up. And I keep, you know, I sort of listen on Fox News because I think she would be a natural potential vice presidential candidate for Trump given her current trajectory. But she doesn't seem to have really meshed in with the Trump crowd, probably because she wasn't an original Trumper. Maybe they've already sussed that out. Yeah, sometimes they can smell the old rhino on you. Um, <laughs> but you no, do it's funny. I, you. Yeah, it's good. I'm glad you asked that question because I, I, she's definitely never come up. And you're right that it seems like she'd be somebody that they start mentioning. God, you know who comes up like more often than than you'd think is um, Candace Owens. Oh, that's interesting. Herman Cain. There really mm -hmm. hasn't been a prominent black Republican. Tim Scott gets mentioned a few times. He I does. hear him bandied about, although I was really surprised when he was on Fox News the other day. He was asked if he had listened to the January 6 hearings. He said no, he didn't have time, but that he still supports Trump. And I thought that was also evidence of like, I don't want to hear about this. It's too painful. I'm not even going to pretend I watched it. Move on. Yeah. I also saw that. It's not the first time uh, Tim Scott has sort of come out to make it very clear he's on board with Trump. I think I think he's somebody who thinks he could be Trump's vice president, well, too. Well, he's not going to uh, be the VP if he won't defend Trump during January 6th. Oh, really? I, I mean, I thought he just did the see no evil, hear no evil thing. Like, I can't watch this. I've got to. I'm fighting inflation. Yeah, that's sure not what Trump wants. to fight inflation. <laughs> you know who is watching the hearing, speaking of which, is Trump. Yeah. And and I got to tell you, I do take some joy out of the fact that he's super mad right now at McCarthy that there's nobody to defend him on yeah. the like during these hearings. But it is sort of uh, yeah, I, I do think that is personally delightful um, because it's it's just worked out so well that uh, McCarthy pulled his picks and now we have Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger there. But it does speak to the broader point that you don't see Republicans defending Trump across the TV networks, like in the good old days of 2016. You know, maybe I just have that burned into my brain, uh, living through CNN through the 2016 and having the Jeffrey Lords and the Kayleigh McEnany's and the Scotty L. Hughes. I mean, you had dozens of people lined up, ready to go at a moment's notice to defend anything Trump said at any time. He doesn't have that anymore. And maybe you could explain that a bit because there's other networks like OAN, Newsmax, but I don't think that's quite it. Be because of the severity of what he did on January 6th, I, I think a lot of networks have rethought their coverage. And there's also just a lack of willingness of those types of people to go out there and do it again. I mean, where are those people? I mean, maybe someone like I'm thinking of Mark Meadows as a Cassidy Hutchinson. Like, you know, seems like a totally normal, like Republican staffer that you would see. You could see her for a typical Bush president going on the airwaves and camping out and being there to answer things. But she's never going to defend January 6th when she's testifying to the January 6th committee about the pardons that Republican members sought. And so I think that dynamic has changed, and it does speak to the fact that Trump doesn't actually have the juice that he used to. Yeah, they'll all support him if he's the nominee. But I uh, agree with you. I think it's actually been pretty interesting how silent Republicans have been yeah. during these hearings, which I think is another testament to how effective they've been, especially, God knows, I am a proponent of messengers over message. 
And they have used incredibly effective messengers, people from Trump's orbit, his own administration, and other just, you know, very credible conservatives. And so I think they have done an unbelievable job. And I would say that to answer the central question of this podcast and the question that I think everyone was asking going around these hearings, I think they matter, Amanda. That's that's my takeaway. I think they're mattering. I concur. And like we said, I'm not sure that it doesn't it's, it was, Trump is still a very complicated figure. I am not ready to say that he has lost his grip on the Republican Party. I think he can still blow things up like a nuclear bomb. But I think they're mattering. I think they're making a difference. And um, kudos to everybody involved. Amanda Carpenter, thank you so much for coming on the Focus Group podcast. I loved having you here. Thanks for going through the hearings with me a little bit right after. And thanks all of you for listening. Uh, We will catch you again next week. Everybody, and welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark. So last September, when we started this very awesome podcast, our first episode was about political unicorns, these Trump to Biden voters, which normal people call swing voters. We affectionately refer to them as flippers here. But today we're going to do a crash course on the inverse group. So those who didn't vote for Donald Trump in 2016, but did in 2020. I don't focus on this group as much because in my other work, these are not the people I am working to persuade, but they are an important group to understand because whether Republicans hold on to this group of voters is one of the important questions for the next few years in American politics. And in the last year, there was just a report out this week from the Associated Press that said that roughly 1.7 million voters have switched parties and they headed to the GOP by about a two to one margin. Additionally, Echelon Insights has been asking Republicans since at least August 2020 whether they consider themselves primarily a supporter of Donald Trump or primarily a supporter of the Republican Party. In June, the Republican Party was just slightly ahead, 49 to 42 percent. And that number has been trending slightly in favor of the Republican Party as we get further from Trump's presidency. But 42 percent is still a really high number of Trump first Republicans. So, To help us explore this group of not Trump to Trump voters, we are going back to this podcast's inaugural guest and one of my favorite political analysts, Amy Walter, publisher and editor-in-chief of the Cook Political Report. Amy, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for the invitation. So Amy, we were talking in the green room and you said you've been listening to the podcast and you just had some follow-up thoughts for me and Amanda's conversation. (laughs) So like, let's just get that out of the way right up front. You know, I am... A humongous fan of the podcast. I love it. Listen every week. I am almost a hundred percent in agreement with most of the stuff that you say and your theories of the case. The one thing that I had a slight disagreement, I can't remember if it was you or Amanda, just on the DeSantis sort of moment and the question of should he wait, should he go, regardless of what Trump does. I'm just a big believer in the theory that as political candidates, you get a very narrow window of time in which you are relevant or where you can meet the political moment. And that time, at least if you're looking at it today, that time is there for Ron DeSantis, both in his name recognition, his branding, his fundraising, He's sort of meeting where Republicans are at this moment, which is he doesn't have the baggage of the Trump era. He's not part of the Washington Trump cabal or whatever, but he has the the Trump spirit, right? He's like his spirit animal. And so you get all the benefits of having the Trump sort of style without having the downside of either being in the Senate or the cabinet or somehow in that universe that was around Trump during his presidency. 
and he has a record, which as a governor, and I think people are going to be looking for governors in the 2024 era, is really critical. Oh, I don't disagree with you. We are simpatico on this. And okay. unless somebody can find me tape where I'm sort of taking the different position, I'm pretty sure that I have been saying this as well, that A, I mean, we all watch Chris Christie miss his moment. Yep. But the other thing is, is just how much people want new. Yes. And you get old pretty fast in the news cycles now, right? Like people get sick of you over time. And I agree. His window is now. And the only thing that you might have heard me arguing, because I think this is true, is like on both sides, the dynamic is very complicated in how you run against the sitting president, if you're a Democrat, but who would be, if he ran for a second term, would be closer to 90 at the end of it. It's just like preposterous if you think yes. about it. And then on Trump's side, we can all agree this is a flawed person to run again. But as I just noted, you know, when you've got 42% of a political party that says they are Trump first as opposed to Republican first, I think the thing is, is that Trump is just still such a wild card. So, okay, did you see this because it caused some waves when it came out, this Associated Press story about the party switching. Right. Um, and, you know, the idea that you've had in the past year a lot more people becoming Republicans than becoming Democrats in terms of registration. Now, I don't think registration is the be all and end all. But did you have a theory of why that is? You know, Sarah, we've also been seeing this show up in the question of party identity, Right. So there's registration and then there's how you affiliate yourself. I don't know if this was Gallup or Pew or somebody earlier in the year showed some pretty big movement toward Republicans in terms of party identification. And that was sort of I don't know if it was papooed necessarily, but it got some attention. And then there was the whole, well, what does this really mean? Well, it's only one poll. Well, is this an outlier? We didn't spend a lot of time on it. But in talking to folks, especially one pollster I talked to who does a lot of polls not for politics, but is asking questions to many, many, many folks, big number of respondents over time, this person said that they were also picking up some movement on party identification. Charles Franklin, who does a polling for the Marquette poll up in Wisconsin, was also tracking this movement in party identification. So I think we're seeing something, and it kind of gets to your point, Sarah. I'm wondering if what we're seeing are two things. One, in the era post-Trump, people who identified themselves as Democrats weren't necessarily Democrats during the Trump era, but they were anti-Trump. Yes. And then Republicans who, quite frankly, were embarrassed or just didn't feel they were connected to Republicans when Trump was in office say now, yeah, no, I'm a Republican. And then some of those folks who are pretty much conservative Democrats, who've been sticking with the party for quite some time, and who now look at a party that they feel is more out of touch than ever with the party that they sort of grew up with or identified with. So I do think we are seeing some movement there. The question is, is this just a reaction to the post-Trump and the sort of frustration with what they're seeing in Washington from Democrats now? Or are we finally like rebalancing what has been a pretty fundamental shift over these last 15, 20 years of the Democratic and Republican coalition? And, you know, some of these things are lagging indicators like party registration, but party identification is not. Yeah. So I had... Just one theory I want to throw out and see what you think, which is COVID, basically. Like COVID and Biden. Because I I agree, like some of it could just be codifying a kind of political realignment that we've been seeing these white working class voters are moving more toward Republican. But like, I also think that one of the big frustrations, and I just think people have kind of missed it, I think it was really apparent in the Virginia election, is how much people got really frustrated that the COVID restrictions went on six months longer than anybody was willing to tolerate. Mm -hmm. Layer on that, the supply chain, inflation, everything working sort of like 30% less well. No, I I think that's a very interesting theory of what it is signifying is, okay, the Democratic Party at its core is just going to go 
too far. It's not just COVID restrictions, but the role that they want government to play, right? And you hear this a lot from these sort of suburban voters like we saw in Virginia, this idea that, look, we thought we were getting with Joe Biden, somebody who was going to play the middle, and instead he's pulling off to the left side of the street here. And that's not where I am. And I'm not there on some of the other cultural issues, whether it's on policing or on the sort of Bernie Sanders squad views of the world. But I also think the big challenge that Democrats have had, certainly for the last five or so years, is that they just haven't presented themselves as a very aspirational party. They've been just completely responsive instead of being leaning into Mm -hmm. something. So most of the campaigns and the focus for the last five years has been like, how do we just make sure that we don't get another Trump? How do we make sure that everything that we do is preventing him or is in response to him versus here's what's going to matter if you elect Democrats? Here's how our lives are going to be better. I think that's what happened and is continuing to happen, especially with more working class Latino voters who don't identify the Democratic Party as a party of economic opportunity and see that the Republican Party is the one that, well, I might not agree with them on everything, but at least I think they're going to help me get a job and increase my standard of living and help me achieve my dreams. This is what I have a hard time, I think, getting some of my Democratic friends to understand, which is that the Republican Party which they have spent just decades, you know, slamming as the party of big business and corporations and country clubs, like they're winning the conversation around as like being the party of the working person, like the working Mm -hmm. class. But uh, but rather than belabor that, because I want to get to some of these voters who, for whatever reason, and we've got a few buckets of people, could not vote for Trump in 2016, did not vote for Trump in 2016. But over the course of his presidency, there was a lot of conversation around who he alienated. But like, he got many, many millions more votes in 2020 than he did in 2016. And it came from both energizing an entirely new group of people who hadn't voted before, as well as convincing people that sort of couldn't take him in 16, that actually he was doing a good job. So let's hear from some of these voters. I'm going to break them into three buckets. The first one, there was a couple people who voted for Hillary Clinton. And actually, let's just go ahead and listen to the Clinton voters first, the Clinton to Trump voters. I think I chose my vote for Clinton because I was looking at the candidates and I felt like she was the most qualified. I think the other part was exciting. You know, I am a moderate. And so I am pro women, you know, stepping into power and empowering women in that sense. So in 2020, I just did not like what I heard from the Democrat candidates, from Harris and Biden, I just felt like it was all talk. I didn't really see like potential any action going forward. I just did not agree with the values that they were presenting at that time. You know, I thought it was exciting about the vice president, you know, being a woman, but that was not enough to get my vote, unfortunately. And I just felt like, you know, economy and things have been going well with Trump. I also liked, you know, what he had against China and with the economy there too, and trying to have more American jobs here and try to like just keep the market afloat. I did have concerns with Trump about potentially having the economy crash like later on because it was a lot of the things I felt like was more of a temporary solution. But I still think, you know, he did try to do something about it. So to me, he was the better candidate. It was more of his personality. He just came off as really just aggressive, just like the jerk businessman. And then 2020, I worked with a bunch of people that were from Delaware that I just, I could not vote for Biden. I just had problems with him. So I was like, I'm voting for the jerk. (laughs) And and I switched. My family's from more Western Pennsylvania, I'd say like the Rust Belt. And I just think like he resonated more with like my historical, where my family's from, and I voted for him. Amy, you watch a lot of focus groups. Have you ever seen or explored much this like Clinton to Trump voter? Like, have you seen many of those? I have not. That is the unicorn of all unicorns. 
because when I think about the folks that switched from 2016 to 2020, I think of it as people who voted third party and then ended up voting for Trump or Biden, but not going from Clinton to Trump. That's pretty remarkable. Yeah, I'm not sure that there were tons and tons of those people. There was only a couple in the group, but you are 100% right. You know, in, in 2016, there was this big chunk of voters on the left and the right who voted third party, enough that it played a major role in the election results. But for many of these voters who who went third party in, in 16, it was actually because they thought Trump wasn't really a Republican. Let's listen to some of them. I didn't like Trump because he was so caustic, just his personality. You didn't like his personality. So we voted with the um, constitutionalist. And then in 2020, we voted for Trump because we liked what he did for the economy and we wanted nothing to do with Biden because we knew he would destroy our economy, which he has done very quickly. I also voted Libertarian in 2016. My reasons for that were I knew historically Trump had always been a Democrat and it bothered me immensely that he was not parading around pretending to be a hardcore Republican. 2020, my vote was very much a broken clock is right twice a day. And I felt like there had been some things that Trump had done that being business minded, I agreed with. And part of it was that I realized that someone in the executive position helps to have been an executive. And I was very turned off by the fact that Biden had been a career politician, that he was preaching more of the same over and over and over. And in 45 years, 47 years, actually, in Congress, he hadn't actually accomplished anything. So I feel like I know a lot of these people in D.C., people whose main concern was that Trump wouldn't be a reliable conservative. But it seems like he won a lot of these people over. First, I think we forget when you look at the very first polling that came out in 2017 about Donald Trump, he had almost all the Republicans on board, but there was still a faction of Republicans who were in a sort of wait to see mode. And and I remember thinking this too, and I don't know if you did, Sarah, but like it was, okay, you won the race. All right, now let's see how you do up on Capitol Hill. Good luck with that, right? Good luck trying to unify this party that's basically four or five different parties. And so there was definitely a wait and see there. The other thing I found really fascinating about this group, Sarah, was that when they first started and I was listening to them, they're talking a lot about the economy. They're talking about Democrats and the tax and spend and and feeling so frustrated about this. And then just hearing the way they were describing themselves and their priorities, I thought, you know, these are like the Mitt Romney kind of Republicans. These are Republicans who they were frustrated with Trump in 2016, didn't really know what to expect from him. And they either set themselves out or I know we have a couple of cases of voting for Hillary, but it felt like that kind of voter, what I would put into the Romney category. But then somehow Mitt Romney came up and there were definitely a number of groans around the room about how he's not sufficiently conservative. So, you know, on the one hand, this felt like that sort of old time Republican, just really focused on fiscal conservatism, don't want to really spend a whole lot of time in the Trump culture war milieu. But yet when you dig a little bit deeper, what you find is actually they don't want to go back to being sort of the old style Romney, Bush, McCain kind of party. They just want a Republican who does not have as much baggage, doesn't have the personal style or sort of caustic style that Donald Trump has. Okay. So I think that there is a lot that I really agree with in here. And I want to I want to just preempt sort of my central thesis about this group a little bit and just mm. say how they sounded to me. And it's the reason I wanted you for this episode, to see if you agreed with me on this. This group actually sounds to me not that different from the flippers the other way. So Mm -hmm. the Trump to Biden voters are, they're all center right. They were people who voted for McCain, voted for Romney. These people also sound exactly as you say, like people who were originally sort of traditional Republicans. The thing that separates the two to me is the degree to which they hate Democrats. Mm. So this group really dislikes Democrats in the way that the other group who does not feel like a Democrat 
they hated Trump worse than the Democrats. Like at the end of the day, it was just like how deep the negative polarization went. And because they're all Republicans in many ways, the kind of old school Republicans, like I was listening to this group thinking, man, I would have put you guys so hard in our persuadable bucket. Like I would have listened to you, I think, and felt like you were potentially gettable. And the reason that they were not is that they just really, really hate the Democrats. And the reason that they don't like Mitt Romney is because they think he sides with the Democrats, right? They were like, ugh, ugh, he's just like not on the team and he's not, you know, sticking with us. I, I don't know. And maybe I'm overreading it, but that's how I felt. I think that's a really great way to think about this, which is if you think about the split in the Republican Party, those groups of voters that did feel like, I don't know that I have a home with Donald Trump, certainly felt that way in 2016, and then we're questioning it again in 2020. The real dividing line is there were the folks who say, look, they might all agree in these two groups, flippers and reverse flippers about, you know, I like the tax cuts. I like the people that were placed on the courts or fill in the blank, other issues, you know, less regulation. But that wasn't enough for me because of who Trump is and what he stands for. I can't go all the way there. This group, they were able to see beyond that for two reasons. One, because they do, they worry much more about what Democrats will do in power, even if they didn't love Donald Trump. But the other thing is they really are much more combative Bad-tip. And so I think they represent that sort of new model. You and I are in complete agreement on this, this idea that, you know, somehow the Republican Party, once Trump is gone, is going to revert back to the 1990s. And we're going to see another George Bush-like character emerge or Mitt Romney or John McCain. It's not happening. And listening to this group of voters helps you understand why, because these are your traditional less government low taxes, on social issues, they weren't really like digging in, bought in on that as much as they were, which team are you on? Are you on my team, the red team, or are you willing to work with that blue team who we know is the enemy? Oh, yes. This is what I mean. And we'll get to some of the social issues, but like kind of moderate on the social issues, actually. Yep. And and so this group to me encompasses the big change that we've seen, which is that Trump changed the party in two very key ways. One, he changed these voters. These voters who thought that they temperamentally were sort of traditional Republicans, like he turned them into people who crave that combative style in a way where like Ron DeSantis is now very appealing to them. Yep. Um, and they want to see somebody who's going to fight for them. And they don't like Mitt Romney anymore. That's one way Trump changed the party. And then the second way Trump changed the party is that he added a whole bunch of new people to it, people who just weren't there before. And so that's the third group. And so let's listen mm. to a couple of voters who represent the millions of people that had not voted before but did vote for Trump in 2020. I didn't know enough about him in 2016 from a political point of view, so therefore I didn't vote for him just because I felt it was just futile. It was just like the way he was being portrayed in the media. But 2020 came around. I mean, I had to support him. You know, I had to get out there. My wife did. And we were very active with our local election officials and state official election campaigns. Just became really aware. I think a lot of people became more aware of how important it is to cast your vote, uh, especially in the 2020 election. I see the same thing happening in the midterms coming up. I think it's going to be a very active voting season for everybody because everyone's really upset and everyone's pissed off. So in 2016, I actually did not vote. Part of the reason is my wife was pregnant and we had a two-year-old, and so my priorities were elsewhere. While that's not an excuse, kind of looking back, shame on me. Going to you know Biden and Trump, at the end of the day, while I didn't necessarily agree with everything Trump did or said, some of his policies were working, not just domestically, but also um, foreign. But then additionally, just from a Biden standpoint, um, I am a big 2 a supporter, and, you know, Biden was very adamant that he's coming for your guns, period, end of story. And he's continued to say that. And just among other things, just from like a Democratic standpoint, especially from a schools, you know, I have two young children. Like I have huge, huge different aspects on how the schooling should be run. And it makes it very challenging for me to ever vote Democrat because of that, because we are just on two way opposite sides. 
So the second guy, like I can't check these people's voting histories. So I don't know if he was like a reliable voter before that and just didn't that year because of his kids. But the first guy, the first guy who went from somebody who was like, eh, I don't care, to like an activist. Exactly. And I remember saying to reporters where they were like, do you think that there's just a lot more votes out there for Trump? And I was like, no, I think he like maxed out on what he can get. Or I just I don't think that there's X number of millions more votes. Boy, was I wrong about that. Like, yeah, Biden got a lot of new voters, too. But we knew lots of people hated Trump and that you could mobilize people against Trump. I think we were all surprised, or at least I was surprised. I won't speak for you. You're much smarter about this stuff than I am. Mm -hmm. But like in the middle of a pandemic and an economic collapse and Trump talking about injecting bleach, how many people still were really psyched about voting for him? That's right. And, you know, look, I've had this conversation too, Sarah, when you, when you look at the numbers, you can look at it two ways. One is, okay, yeah, millions more people voted for Donald Trump, but he went from getting in 2016, what, like 45, close to 46% of the popular vote to 47% of the popular vote. And in every one of those states that he needed to win, that he carried in 2016, but with less than 50% of the vote, he once again failed to break 48, 49%. So yes, he increased his numbers, but there's still a ceiling to the Trump number. But these folks, and this is what both sides are trying to figure out now, what's going to happen to all these people who were newly engaged in the process? Now, I can see why the two voters that you just played are going to stay involved in 2022 because they're seeing right now Democrats in control and all the things that they were upset about in 2020 or things that they worry about just in their daily lives, they see unfolding in front of them with Democrats in charge. The harder group of people to get motivated, and this is why Democrats are counting on something like the Roe v. Wade decision or January 6th commission are the people who showed up to vote in 2018 and 2020 simply because they could not stand Donald Trump and they might not have been motivated to vote before. But how do you keep those people engaged when everything they're seeing since 2020 has been pretty meh, right? But you're right. These are this fascinating group of people that they're newly engaged, but who can keep them engaged? And the other thing was that None of them were interested in seeing Trump run again, not because they think suddenly, oh, well, I made a terrible choice in 2020, but because they want to see someone new. That is not what you hear the other kind of flippers, the ones that went from Trump to Biden. When I've listened into your focus groups and other focus groups, while they may not be enthusiastic about Biden right now. They may be disappointed in him. They may even give him low job approval ratings, but none of them regretted their decision Mm -hmm, to mm -hmm, vote for mm -hmm. Biden over Trump. None of them are like, oh my gosh, you know, if Trump won, things would be a lot better. I messed that up. Yes. A hundred percent. All right. So I want to talk about how these voters thought about the Roe v. Wade ruling. You know, one of the things that the prior to the Roe decision, I would say all the time is that, look, Trump is on the ballot for the people that he attracts, but he's not on the ballot for the people that he repels. And I do wonder if Roe has changed that, not in the sense that it puts Trump on the ballot exactly, but in that it shifts what I thought was kind of a large enthusiasm gap. Um, Now, when we spoke to this group, the final ruling hadn't come out, but the draft opinion had been widely discussed for weeks. Now, In this group, five out of the seven identified as pro-choice. Now, in our recent sort of Trump to Biden flipper group, the episode we did with Rachel Vindman, they were unanimously pro-choice. But five out of seven for a group this Republican is a lot. Let's listen to one guy's take. I agree with most of the Republican platform. I think the only thing I disagree with would be uh, women's reproductive issues and women should have the ability to make their own decisions regarding that. And the Republican platform seems to be in these governors around the country are, you know, banning abortions and then your neighbors can report you if you get one. It sounds like a science fiction movie from 1972. That's one thing I disagree with. And there's probably a couple other things too, if I went down the list, marijuana legalization, I think that should happen. Republicans don't believe in that for some strange reason, for the most part, I see. But overall, yeah, you know, it's kind of like the lesser of two evils, right? I guess. 
Were you surprised by how many sort of pro-choicers there were in this group? Yeah, I think there was a woman, too, who was much more to the left of center than to the right of center on some of these social issues. And I wasn't surprised at all because, as I said, at the very beginning of the conversation with these voters, these are kind of the old school Republicans, the ones that I would have put in the category of sort of country club type Republicans. They're not really that interested in the social issue piece. I know there were a couple people there on Second Amendment, but even then it wasn't so much of like, you know, you're going to take the gun from my cold dead hands as much as, look, I have guns. I just don't want the government telling me what to do. Again, more of a libertarian thing than it was a cultural thing. And to your question about what does Roe do to the election. I do think for Democratic voters who weren't quite bought into the stakes of this election, this raises the stakes for them to get engaged. It's not as high as it was for, oh my gosh, Donald Trump is on the ballot or Donald Trump's in the White House. I think that was the highest level of importance to these voters. Like, I need to show up no matter what, because we can't let Donald Trump have a majority. We can't let Donald Trump stay in office. But this is one of those things that I think does say to those voters who might not be as interested, might not feel like their vote really matters all that much. Okay, here's why you need to turn out. As you know, Sarah, quite well, it's not love that gets people to the polls. It's anger um, (laughs) and hate. And you've got to give them something to be angry about. And the Supreme Court did that for Democrats. Fear and anger, two dominant emotions. Mm -hmm. Uh, Unfortunately, it's a dark view, Mm -hmm. but not untrue. I want to talk about the group's attitude toward the Republican Party, because you've been hitting on something that was incredibly present in this group that, you know, they all consider themselves Republicans, mainly for fiscal reasons. But one of the things that you said that was super true is that they want they want someone to be tough. Like in the groups that are Trump to Biden voters, they sort of prize competence over what this group wants, which is active and tough. Let's listen to some of this conversation. My biggest problem is that they don't seem like the take action type. And I think that's what's frustrating. Again, kind of going back to... I think most people have said it like, what are you doing about it? And like, just actually take action and not waffling on your beliefs either. Like, that's one of the things I struggle with is when like, okay, if you're a Republican and you have a stance on something, why are you waffling now just because you're getting pressure from the other side or something like that? Like that is bothersome for me. I don't feel either party has their ducks in a row. Yes, what we are experiencing right now is awful and terrible, but I don't hear anyone on the Republican side really voicing anything that says, hey, these are my ways to fix this. I don't feel they have a Cracker Jack waiting in the background to say, I'm going to hard charge it. This is my plan to correct it. And even if there is a big red wave coming in November without a solid plan to make it happen, two more years later, when it's the 2024 election, we're going to be right back in the same boat. So I want to see action. I'm tired of the words. Could someone deliver something right or wrong? That was the one thing about Trump that I did like. He may not have had the right answer every time, but he was not embarrassed to try something, whether I agreed with it or not, or rolled my eyes or woke up and thought, what ridiculous things came out of his mouth overnight that we're going to hear reported in the news? At least he was trying something that was different than any of his predecessors had done. I grew up in Florida, so that probably helps a little bit because we've had you know, good Republican leadership to some extent since I grew up. I think their views in terms of their social aspects, a lot of it is tied also to religion. And I do consider myself religious as a Protestant too. But I also feel like right now, in terms of the social views, especially as I feel like, 
even for myself being a Republican, I get targeted by other Republican people from a race perspective, and that hasn't been great. So I think that has kind of hit me a little bit. I also, I think from the, you know, the Democrats, you know, which is why I'm probably more moderate, is I do like some of their social views. I do support some of it too. Even if it's not along the, the religious lines, I feel like that's the main area why I would vote from that perspective if their policies around social views and social aspects, you know, kind of aligns with mine. Okay, so let me just break down a couple things in here. So I, what I was really trying to show is the fact that, like, these guys are kind of ish on the Republican Party for different reasons. But one thing I hear in a lot of focus groups, and you heard it in the first two answers, was just like, Donald Trump has convinced many Republican voters that the Republican Party are a bunch of like namby pamby do nothings and like wafflers. I, everybody's always talking about rhinos. What they liked about Trump was action. And so, no matter how much these Republicans try to imitate Trump, it's so funny to me how many voters, when you ask them, okay, well, what do you think about the Republican Party? Their answer is like, they're a bunch of rhinos who don't do anything and don't fight for anything. I noticed that too. And again, not to keep comparing them to the other kinds of flippers, but you know what I hear from those voters, the ones who went from Trump to Biden, is things like, I want to see more bipartisanship. I want to see people working together to solve problems. I don't want all the fighting. And these voters, the ones who flipped from not voting for Trump to voting for Trump, are like, Heck yeah, I want to see some fighting. That's right. I just want to see you stick by your guns. The very first clip that you played of the guy who's like, I'm tired of them being basically bullied by the other side to change their opinion. Just do it. And you heard it in the second woman who was like, you know, Trump, right or wrong, at least he was going to say something and do something. And so we forget, I'm guilty of this too, that the things that Washington prizes, people like me look at certain members of Congress or candidates and say, well, they've been really successful because they've been able to do these four things or five things since being in office. Well, for voters, that doesn't look like anything, yeah. right? They want to see something that is really significant, number one. And number two, what Trump had was everything had an answer and an easy answer. There was a black and a white, there was a yes or a no versus the reality. Just build a wall, guys. Just build a wall. Right. Like, we know how hard it is. Like, policy is complicated. And there do need to be gray areas. And there does need to be compromise if you're going to get anything done. But Trump did a very good job of convincing voters and really changing the conversation, quite frankly, even within just a broader political environment about what the right way to tackle big questions should be. Yeah. And then the last quotation from this woman, this woman was pretty interesting because to me, yeah. this woman felt like a pr person that if I could just get her in a room, I could, I could persuade her because she, she goes on to say it that she's Asian and felt like she deals with a lot of racism from within the Republican Party. And that obviously wasn't enough to, to persuade her to vote for Democrats because she's sort of a fiscal conservative who thinks that the Democrats, you know, are dumb. <laughs> right. You know, you could see the stress point for her is on race and some of the social issues in the same way you have some of these voters, they're there on the social issues with Democrats, but on the fiscal issues, they're like, I don't know. I kind of like what the Republicans are saying on some of those things, but 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 I can't go there because if I do, then I'm giving into the racism and the gay bashing and all of those things. So you can feel that tension from those two types of voters saying, boy, you know, I'm sticking with my side because ultimately this stuff, whether it's the cultural issue or the fiscal issue, is just so much more important to me. And I, I'm not willing to compromise on that. All right. One last point on this, just as a swing voting group, the Trump to Biden voters to me feel like people who could vote for Democrats again or for Republicans again. I truly see them as swing voters. These voters to me, though, the one difference I would say is these voters feel like they will not vote for Democrats. Like, 
they're pretty out on the Democrats. I'm not sure I can see them swinging back, right? 100%. And I think, in fact, you actually asked that question, like, is there any Democrat, anyone? And the one person, of course, who comes up is Joe Manchin, which not surprising at all. In fact, Joe Manchin got a lot more love on this episode than Mitt Romney did. One, because he's more conservative, but two, one woman, I think I'm remembering this correctly, was saying, you know, at least Joe Manchin is kind of upfront and tells you what he's going to do. And I feel like Mitt Romney is doing it behind the scenes, basically a backstabber versus someone who tells you to Mm -hmm. your face. Yeah, it was funny how much more they liked Joe Manchin. (laughs) It's like when your friends say something like, my Democratic friends would say something like, what if they nominated Liz Cheney? Or remember when it was John Huntsman? I like John Huntsman a lot. Why can't he win? Do you think he could win? And I was like, here's the reason he's not going to win a Republican primary, because you like him. Yeah, right. okay? <laughs> if he appeals to you, he's not winning a Republican primary. And same thing on the other side. Why won't they vote for Joe Manchin? He seems great. Like, oh, really? So a Republican thinks he's awesome. Yeah, that's going to work real well in a Democratic primary. Good luck. Yep. Yep. This is is so right. Poor Mitt Romney, man. He takes such a beating in these focus groups. I I know. And you know, they probably all voted voted for him. him. So funny how many people like can't remember who they voted for. Like, it's just like they have total amnesia about what they did prior to 2020. Like, even if you go back to (laughs) 16, they're like, I don't really remember what I did. All right. So I have like a moment of Zen that I want to play from this group that for you and I to talk about. I am getting a lot of phone calls about this, which is the viability of a Mike Pence presidential run in 2024. I cannot tell you. Mike Pence's people are out there really trying to convince reporters that like Mike Pence has like a big lane. And so I'm always getting calls from reporters being like, what do you hear about Mike Pence and the focus groups? Well, let's listen. Let's listen to this group. I'm from Indiana and I don't like Mike Pence. He's milk toast. He's a nice enough guy, but he is. He's just milk toast. He's a politician, like at heart, like just knows how to play the game. There's nothing exceptional about him. Even when he was the vice president, he was always in the background. And it was another instance of what's he doing exactly? We never really knew. And he maybe that's just part of his personality. I didn't even like him when he was selected. I thought, oh, well, this will be another do nothing vice president. And he delivered on that for me. There's just, he's not exceptional. The Republican Party needs someone exceptional to move this country forward. I cannot tell you. I cannot tell you how much the Republican voters hate Mike Pence. And I got to just tell you, like, if it's a swing voting group, he was like too much, just stood by Trump and nodded. You know, I don't like him. If it's a Trumpy group, they're like, he didn't support the president. He's insufficiently loyal to Trump. What do you think Mike Pence's chances are in 2024? Yeah, I mean, look, I get that there's a world in which Donald Trump either doesn't run or Donald Trump is in so much legal trouble that he decides to take himself out. But I just don't see this lane. I don't. And I hear these same conversations, Sarah. You and I are in the same conversations, probably with a lot of the same people. And this idea of a coalition that's going to come together that is both Trump voting types plus evangelicals and the more cultural conservatives are going to come together and form a big enough block. And is there a world where, especially a Trumpless world in 2024, where you have just an absolute free for all 15 or 20 candidates in the mix and strange things happen? Absolutely. And so I can definitely see that. At the same time, it's a little bit like convincing people that they want to buy a product that they're telling you over and over again, they're not really interested in buying, right? Like, no, no, you really want to have this kind of flavored soda. And people are like, I don't know. I don't think I'd really like that flavor soda. No, 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 no. Trust me. What if you taste it? Well, I have, and I'm not crazy about it. No, but what if... You tasted it and then compared it to 15 other sodas. Okay, but I I don't want this one. The other thing, and and this is where Democrats and Republicans also misread each other or don't understand each other. Democratic primary voters look at past political experience, government experience as a positive. Now, it's not that they're like, oh, yeah, I love a career politician, but they certainly 
think that somebody who runs for president or a high office at that level should have some experience doing governing. That is not the same when it comes to Republicans who want to see somebody who's been on the outside of politics. He's a businessman. He's somebody who has never been a part of the corrupt political system. Outsider. That is a much more appealing mode. So even if Mike Pence were not the vice president, but were, say, coming in as, hey, I'm a reasonably successful governor from a Midwestern state, I don't even think that has that much appeal. First of all, if Mike Pence was a soda, he'd be like broccoli soda. Really, nobody wants to try this kind of soda. And like the woman who's like, I'm from Indiana. I don't like Mike Pence. She literally went on then like a five minute thing about what a good job he did as governor and like exactly. still hated him, still hated him. And so just listen, I just think honestly, I think it brings us back to kind of where we started on the DeSantis point, which is, yeah, they want somebody new. They want somebody from the outside who's a brawler. And like mm. Mike Pence is just... He's not what this party wants anymore. Like they have moved past politicians like Mike Pence. Yeah. And I think people need to sort of just realize how much things have changed. And this group, I think, is a good example of how the new Republican coalition has consolidated and the kind of candidates they want to consolidate around, which are not Mike Pence. Amy Walter, thank you so much for talking all of this through with me. Love being able to talk politics with you. It's one of my favorite things to do. Super Really fun. appreciate you taking the time. Oh my gosh, this was super fun. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, Anytime. I mean, literally, I would just do this with you all the time. If I could make that happen. Let's just do it. All right. Uh, (laughs) And thanks to all of you for listening to another episode of The Focus Group. We'll be back next week and we'll do it all again. Bye-bye.